I'm Tom Rollins, president of The Teaching Company. These lectures are part of the Great Courses on Tape series. The Great Courses on Tape cover a broad array of university-level disciplines. The lectures in each course are either 30 or 45 minutes long. By listening for less than an hour a day, you could finish even the longest course in just weeks. Browse our catalog or website and imagine how much you could learn if you spent just 30 minutes a day for the next year in the best college classrooms in the world. The lecturers are university professors carefully selected by the teaching company and its customers for intellectual distinction and teaching excellence. These lectures are entitled Freedom, the Philosophy of Liberation. The speaker is Professor Dennis Dalton of Barnard College at Columbia University. Professor Dalton received his undergraduate degree from Rutgers University and his master's from the University of Chicago. He received his doctorate from the University of London in political theory. He has taught at Barnard College since 1969, where he now serves as the Anne Whitney Olin Professor of Political Science. Lecture 1, Freedom in the Ancient World. This is a series of lectures about an idea, the idea of freedom. And I've called this first lecture, Freedom in the Ancient World. It's about an idea and the men and the women, the books and the speeches that expound it. Our main purpose is to explain an idea that's familiar to us all, an idea that we all cherish and defend to try to show why the idea of freedom has inspired people for thousands of years in vastly different cultures. When we approach this idea, we do it with some reverence, not only because we as Mer Americans revere freedom, and we've often throughout our history given our lives for it, but also because we believe that ideas themselves have value, that ideas count in defining uh, what we as Americans do and feel. When we use a term, as we often do, like the American way of life, we mean a life that is pursued according to certain values. And at the core of these values are ideas. Ideas such as equality and justice and law and civil rights, constitutionalism and democracy. But among these ideas, I think that none excels that of freedom. Even before the American Revolution, a revolution that was fought, of course, for freedom, people settled this country because they wanted freedom to escape from governments that tried to deprive them of freedom. So when we begin now to discuss freedom, we focus on the idea knowing that ideas matter and none matters more than freedom. I've titled this lecture, as I said, Freedom in the Ancient World, but I'll begin with a personal story. I want to illustrate how and when freedom came to matter most to me. In January 1961, when I was 22 years old, a long time ago, <laughs> I was living in the villages of Nepal, a tiny kingdom, as you know, located just north of India in the lap of the Himalayas. I was there on a cultural exchange program that was run by 4-H clubs and the United States Department of Agriculture. It was a sort of pre-Peace Corps effort by America to send youth to foreign countries. At that moment in January, I was glued to a shortwave radio set trying to hear my new president, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, give his inaugural address. I remember the voice of America describing Washington, D.C. on that day as being snow-covered, freezing cold and windy, the coldest January 20th in some time. It certainly was not like the jungles and the mountains of Nepal at that moment. I imagined then the thrill that must have swept through that crowd as they heard Kennedy begin. But I also imagine then, as I imagine now, that no one, no matter where they happened to be on that day, was more inspired than I by that magnificent speech. Never before or since has any political event moved me as much as this one did. 
I remember how, halfway around the world from Washington, the lump came into my throat when Kennedy declared, to those peoples in the Hudson villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves for whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. Now, that was sublime oratory. It hasn't been approached since in any inaugural that I've heard. But it wasn't that one passage that moved me most at that particular time. What moved me about Kennedy's address was its main theme, and that theme was the idea of freedom. Listen to the way that Kennedy emphasizes again and again throughout his speech his idea of freedom. He begins the speech with this line, we observe today not a victory of party, but a celebration of freedom. And then he continues with lines that have been quoted so often since, let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, and oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. As he continues throughout this speech, we hear free and freedom repeated over and again. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. And then again, let both sides unite to heed in all corners of the earth the command of Isaiah to undo the heavy burdens and let the oppressed go free. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. And then he concludes, My fellow citizens of the world, Ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. If we go through this relatively brief inaugural address and circle the number of times that Kennedy uses freedom or free or liberty in it, it's clear that there is a dominant theme, and that is the idea of freedom. Now, when I reflect back to this speech, I realize that it was because of it that I became fascinated with the concept of freedom, with its meaning for the world, with its significance for us today in America. And so when I returned to the United States, I would write my Ph.D. dissertation on the idea of freedom. Kennedy's speech, more than any other factor, made me see the central importance of that idea. And yet, while well, I think I was right about that, I was certainly wrong about another aspect of my reaction to that speech. And that is that I confess that at the time as I listened to Kennedy, I thought that America had a monopoly on freedom. That this was our possession and we were about to give it to the rest of the world with a new frontier. That it was uniquely American. Well, I've learned since, as I'm sure you understand, too, that this was a misunderstanding, a misunderstanding of mine that needs to be corrected. And I want to reply to that misunderstanding now by arguing that freedom, of course, is neither exclusively American or even exclusively Western, but that it has deep roots in the ancient world, beginning with the conceptualization of the idea in India, the very place, India, Nepal, South Asia, where I was at that moment listening to the inaugural in January 61. So we returned to that place where the idea of freedom emerged a thousand years before the birth of Christ. In ancient India, 
the early Hindu texts, especially the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita is the so-called Bible of Hinduism. It means literally Song of God. Both the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita set forth a concept, an idea of freedom that's defined in two senses. And both of these senses are contained in a single word. The word that the Hindus use is Swaraj, S-W-A-R-A-J. Now, if we break this word down into its two components, Swa and Raj, we find that Raj means rule over, and Swa means one's own. But this concept, this word, Swaraj, can be understood, as I said, in two ways. And I'll argue throughout these lectures that the two ways that the Indian philosophers understood freedom establish the dual sense that freedom is often understood today. And let me explain this. On the one hand, they conceived of Swaraj, or freedom, in the strict political, the physical sense as rule over one's own land or territory. And so you are free if your land or territory is not ruled by another, but by yourself. Swaraj, in that sense, which seems in the face of it to mean control, control over one's own territory, means freedom in the sense that you are free from alien rule. And that was a key way that the early Indians used the term Swaraj, or the idea of freedom. A prince, a Maharaja, possessed Swaraj, or a person possessed Swaraj, if those individuals lived in a land that was free from alien control. But there was another way in which they used this concept of Swaraj, another way in which they understood freedom. Swaraj was also understood in the Upanishads and in the Bhagavad Gita, in a spiritual or a psychological sense, as rule over one's soul or rule over one's self. And so, through self-knowledge, one acquires a certain kind of spiritual liberation. That is, one becomes, through knowing oneself, free in the sense of being free from ignorance of oneself and of the world, free from illusion and free from fear. Now, that kind of psychological freedom or spiritual freedom carried strong connotations. Now, that is, it meant that one was unfree if one was obsessed with money or possessions of things because these create a kind of bondage or addiction. So the Bhagavad Gita says that the truly free person acts without craving or possessiveness and finds inner peace by being, as the Gita says, freed from delusion. The highest level of consciousness, therefore, is when we learn that our individual being is at one with all being, through self-knowledge we understand that our self is at one with all selves, and in this awareness of the unity of all being comes spiritual liberation. Those are the lines from the Upanishads. Finally, the freest person, therefore, the Upanishads tell us, and the Gita, is the person who sees all being in himself and himself in all being. Now, how is this freedom? It's liberation. Liberation from a sense of alienation from others, from divisiveness. And since a sense of alienation and separateness and divisiveness breed fear, then we are liberated from fear. We achieve freedom from a psychological burden of anxiety and fear when we understand our harmony and unity with others. There's a story that's told in the Upanishads that illustrates the way in which the highest kind of freedom is attained. The story goes like this. A person enters a darkened room. He needs to obtain something from that room. But he's fearful because he sees in the corner of the room an object. 
And that object that he sees seems to be a snake. There's a form there, sort of quivering. And he imagines it as a cobra. So he flees the room in fear. But he needs that object in the room. So he goes back to it. And there's more light. And he sees that perhaps it isn't a snake at all. Perhaps it's something else. But he can't be sure. So he decides he'll wait until there's still more light. And he leaves the room to come back again. He comes back and the room is fully lit. And he sees that it wasn't a snake at all. It was a rope hanging there. And he retrieves his object, but he moves about the room, as we may move about the world when we're in tune with ultimate reality, without fear. The dispelling of fear, then, is a result of greater vision, of more light, of a kind of enlightenment that can show us that the object that we thought was a snake, or perhaps a stranger, or an enemy, was not that at all. Rather, that object is simply something of which we need no, have no fear, and we're free. Fear, then, from the Upanishadic point of view, is one of the greatest threats to us, and we are in bondage to it. But what we must do is liberate ourselves with vision and light, understand that there is no reason to be afraid. And in fact, if we will look deeply and fully with the light that we need, we'll see that the rope is only that and not a snake at all. Now, this is a, an important concept, the idea of Swaraj, uh, the idea of, of freedom in the Hindu world, as I said, a thousand years before Christ. And we want to review it now and make sure that we've got it straight because it's more or less the paradigm, the model that I'll be using for much of what follows in which we'll see uh, that a group of theorists who conceive the idea of freedom in the Western world are working within this idea of freedom in a dual sense. That is, freedom in an external sense and freedom in an internal sense. And one complements the other. So let's return to the idea as we have it in India, as set forth in the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita. First of all, Swaraj means, in a strict political sense, control over one's country, freedom from foreign rule. Second, it means, in a spiritual sense, or a moral sense, or we might say in a psychological or an internal sense, not control over one's country, but control over oneself, one's soul. And that comes from self-knowledge, as well as from knowledge of the unity of being all around us. We are all part of life on this planet. We are all part of one another. And this discovery of what the Hindus like to call unity in diversity frees us from the illusions that divide or addict us frees us from the illusion that another individual is an enemy, frees us from the addiction, say, to property that finds, that allows us to find security in accumulation of things. These two meanings of freedom, then, political and spiritual, internal and external, they'll be found in several of the other philosophers of freedom that we'll be considering later in these lectures, but it's clear in the theories of freedom set forth in India, and then, a few centuries later, in ancient Greece. So we turn now from India to ancient Greece to see how the philosophy of freedom was set forth there. In ancient Greece, freedom meant, first of all, political or external freedom, as it did in India. Now, this is clearest in the writings of the Greek historian Thucydides, perhaps the finest of all historians. Certainly, if we group Thucydides with Herodotus, we have two of the most magnificent historians uh, that not only the ancient world, but the history of the world has produced. Thucydides wrote the history of the Peloponnesian War, uh, that is, the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta that occurred in 5th century B.C. He includes in this history a speech, a magnificent oration, by the Athenian 
general and political leader Pericles. Pericles was leader of the Athenians and so successful that we call the 5th century BC in Athens the golden age of Pericles. So prominent was he that for 30 years he managed to control or to influence the assembly, the key ruling body in Athens. And it was Pericles that inspired democracy in Athens. Pericles, who died in the plague in 429 BC at the beginning of the war between Athens and Sparta, led Athens into that war and did not survive long. And one might say that that was one reason why Athens lost the war. It was Pericles, with his unparalleled eloquence, that acclaimed the free and open nature of Athenian political life, as he called it. He said that Athens, in contrast to the oppressive statism of Sparta, is free and tolerant in our public and private lives. And because of this, our city, the apostle of freedom, he called it, is an education to all of Greece. The meaning of freedom in Pericles' oration, then, is the ability to act without any hindrance, just as long as you're obeying the law and not harming others. And that concept of freedom, we might call it the liberal notion of freedom or the external idea of freedom, the political concept of freedom, that concept of freedom is at the key of what he says in this oration and indeed the key to which of what most Greeks thought about freedom. After Thucydides and Pericles came the greatest of the Greek philosophers, Plato. Plato, of course, the author of the profound work, The Republic, written in 375 B.C. By this time, by the time Plato wrote The Republic, Athens had lost the war to Sparta, had executed Socrates, had begun its long decline. Plato believed that this decline could be attributed to its democracy and the way in which democracy defined freedom. So in the Republic, he condemns democracy. He sees the democratic idea of freedom as the fatal flaw that has corrupted the Athenian polity. Based on Plato's own direct experience with Athenian democracy as a young man of a prominent family that had been involved in politics, Plato reflected back on his thoughts at age 18. And I quote from a letter that Plato wrote towards the end of his long life, Plato died at age 80, and towards the end of his life, he reflected back on how he felt about politics at age 18, and he said this, when I was young, I had the same experience that comes to so many. I thought that as soon as I should be my own master, I should enter public life. This intention was favored by certain circumstances in the political situation at Athens. But unfortunately, some of the men in power in Athens brought my dear friend Socrates to trial on an abominable charge, the very last that could be made against Socrates, the charge of corrupting the youth. He was condemned and he was put to death. When I considered this and all the things that it suggested, the men who were directing public affairs, what they had done to my friend, I made a closer study, as I grew older, of law and custom, and the harder it seemed to me to govern a state rightly, and certainly I knew Athens was not being governed that way. The whole fabric in Athens of law and custom was going from bad to worse at an alarming rate. The result was that I, who had at first been full of eagerness for a public career, when I saw all this happening and everything going to pieces, fell at last into utter bewilderment. I did not cease to think in what way this situation might be amended, and in particular the whole organization of the state. But I was all the while waiting for the right opportunity for action. Well, that opportunity never came. Plato remained disillusioned. He, revoked, he wrote the Republic as an ideal to recommend that ideal to the Greek world and to history, because we still read it avidly today, 2,300 years later. But that ideal was never realized. And Plato, although he was a superb educator, never became an activist. 
But what was it about the system of democracy and the idea of democratic freedom in particular in the 5th century B.C. Athens? What was it exactly about this system that antagonized, that antagonized Plato? Well, if we look at the system of democracy in Athens at this time, we see that from about 480 to 380 B.C., Athens had a remarkable cultural achievement in philosophy and literature, in science, and in architecture. In terms of, of dramatists alone, the list is astounding. Sophocles, Euripides, Aeschylus, Aristophanes, dramatists who all composed during this time and produced plays that we still study and sometimes still produce today. One historian has said that Athens during this time represented the highest level of civilization that has ever existed. So what was Plato complaining about? Plato condemned the democratic system per se, the free democracy that Pericles had praised as Athens' finest product. Now what exactly was this democracy like? We may say that compared to our democracy in America, it was both less and more than we have attained. It was less because it was so much smaller. In area, the city-state of Attica, of which Athens was the principal city, was only the geographical size of Rhode Island. And its population was only about 360,000 people. Moreover, they achieved so much less than we did because Athens had slaves. And they relied heavily on slave labor. That is, 100,000 of this population of 360,000 were slaves, over a quarter of the population. So the democracy was ruled by a citizen class of about 160,000 people. And of those 160,000, only 40,000, the males, could exercise political rights. So we had a restricted, limited democracy. Only the men of a certain citizen class could rule. And yet, with all these restrictions, we can still say that in some respects, Athens achieved more than we have in terms of democracy. Now, first of all, it was the, the first democratic system in the world. And it was the only democracy in the ancient world of that time and for some time to come. Unlike us today, of course, we've built on other democracies. Second, and this is a strong point for Athenian democracy, it was a direct democracy as far as the 40,000 male citizens went. That is, the sovereign rule of the state came from an assembly which consisted officially of every adult Athenian male. This was the sole legislative body, meeting once a month, and a quorum of 6,000 citizens was necessary. Any citizen could speak and propose anything, and there were no property or literacy qualifications. All of this meant that there was an extraordinarily high involvement of citizens in political affairs. And there was indeed free as well as direct participation. So Pericles can say in his oration, and this is another line from his speech, in Athens, each individual is interested not only in his own affairs, but in the affairs of the state as well. Even those who are mostly occupied with their own businesses are extremely well informed on general politics. So we do not say that a man who takes no interest in politics is a man who minds his own business. We say that he has no business here at all. This is the uniqueness of our state, Pericles concluded. We enter into free discussions on all matters of politics. Well, once again, if Athens was so great in terms of its democracy, what was Plato's complaint? Much of Athens' political system has to seem admirable from our perspective, apart from its slavery and other restrictions, considering the fact that this was 2,400 years ago, in a world given to despotisms, Athens was in some part an admirably free and democratic political system. Plato's critique begins with what he calls the main symptoms of the rot that he sees at the core of his state. And there were two symptoms from his point of view, primarily. The first was the Peloponnesian War, and the second was the execution of Socrates. The Peloponnesian War, fought between Athens and Sparta,
brought the whole Greek world in and utterly devastated it. It was the longest, the costliest war that Greece ever fought. From Plato's viewpoint, the war was caused by Athens' arrogance, what he re continually returns to the sin of hubris. And when Athens lost it, from his point of view, it got exactly what it deserved. Plato gradually determined that the problem with Athenian democracy then was that it was so democratic. Popular judgment, as we can see in the decisions made about the war, was very often wrong. And why was it wrong? Because the average person is unthinking and unreflective. All wars, Plato said, are made for making money, and people can always be manipulated, as they were in Athens, in a democracy, into supporting war by the economic interests of the state. But it was not only the war. The execution of Socrates in 399 B.C. devastated Plato, as the war had devastated the Greek world. It was another symptom of this fatal flaw in Athenian democracy, because when we look back at the execution, the trial, conviction, and execution of Socrates, we see that Socrates was condemned to a death, his death not by a group of tyrants, a small elite, a military junta. Socrates was condemned to death by his peers, by a jury of over 100 Athenians. Plato was 28 years old when he witnessed this trial. He was helpless to reverse the verdict. He had studied with Socrates for 10 years during an extremely formative period from ages 18 to 28, and he never recovered from this loss of his best friend and teacher. But he registered his criticisms of democracy throughout the Republic as a system of government that was inevitably ruled by a majority of Ignorant and unfeeling people, short-sighted, incapable of rational decisions or vision, and usually manipulated by a small group of demagogues or politicians who claimed to represent them, but were in fact only concerned with wielding their own power. And uh, there is no end to a politician's lust for power. They have an insatiable appetite for control and they become addicted to it. And they justify their position, these demagogues in the assembly, these politicians who in their cheap, petty way rationalize their position by calling it a free and democratic system. It's a system, Plato said, ruled by money. Now, Plato devotes a whole chapter in the Republic to the evils of democracy and what Democrats call democratic freedom. In the democracy, he says, freedom is mere license. That is, people are given permission to do whatever they like with no sense of social responsibility or political obligation. Plato wanted as his ideal state not a democracy, but what he called a meritocracy, where leaders are qualified through a rigorous system of education and would therefore hopefully, rule wisely because intellectual achievement and not financial power or popularity got people into public office. Plato's theory is often expressed in parables, allegories, analogies. So let's look at some examples of these, beginning with his parable of the ship of state, as it's called. And then we'll turn to his analogy between the free person and the free state to go then to the Republic. Plato didn't call this the ship of state parable. It's been called since by scholars and politicians. Abraham Lincoln referred to it, for example, as the ship of state parable. And it's a parable that describes democracy in free Athens. We imagine a ship. Imagine Socrates says this state of affairs on board a ship or a number of ships, the master is bigger and burlier than any of the crew, but a little deaf and short-sighted and no less deficient in seamanship. The sailors are quarreling over the control of the helm. Each thinks he ought to be steering the vessel, though he has never learnt navigation and cannot point to any teacher under whom he has served his apprenticeship. What is more, they assert that navigation is a thing that cannot be taught at all and are ready to tear in pieces anyone who thinks it can. 
Meanwhile, they besieged the master himself, begging him urgently to trust them with the helm. And sometimes, when others have been more successful in gaining his ear, they kill them or throw them overboard. And after somehow stupefying the worthy master with strong drink or an opiate, they take control of the ship. They make free with its stores. They turn the voyage, as might be expect, expected of such a crew, into a drunken carousal. Besides all this, they cry up as a skilled navigator and master of seamanship, anyone clever enough to lend a hand in persuading or forcing the master to send, set them in command. Every other kind of man they condemn as useless. They do not understand that the genuine navigator can only make himself fit to command the ship by studying the seasons of the year, sky, stars, winds, and all that belongs to his craft. And they have no idea that along with the science of navigation, it's possible for him to gain by instruction or practice the skill to keep control of the helm, whether or not some of them like it. If a ship were managed in that way, would not those on board be likely to call the expert in navigation a mere stargazer who spent his time in idle talk and was useless to them? I think you understand, then, what I mean, and do not need to have my parable interpreted in order to see how it illustrates the attitude of existing states towards the true philosopher. Well, even though Plato says that we don't need to interpret his parable, it's interpreted briefly, and that is... Uh, that the master in this parable, who is a little deaf and short-sighted, represents the sovereign people. The master is easily fooled by the crew, the crew representing the politicians and demagogues whom Plato has seen take over. Notice that Plato refers to the sovereign people as the master, because in a democracy, the sovereign people are supposedly the ones in control of the state, but they have a problem. They're short on vision. Their senses are inadequate, particularly their ability to reason. So the crew, the crew given only to a lust for power, they take over the ship and throw the whole voyage into a drunken carousal. That is the archetypal quintessential politician. And from Plato's point of view, the crew then is representative of what would happen on the kind of voyage, the same kind of voyage that Athens took when it lost the war to Sparta in 404 BC. From Plato's point of view, this is the essence of democracy. Number one, the master or the sovereign people, unintelligent. Number two, the crew or the politicians who are given only to a lust for power, to controlling that master. And number three, the force that's not given any weight in this, that's dismissed by Plato as incapable of handling a democracy, the navigator or the philosopher. In a true state, in a model state from Plato's point of view, we must have a philosopher rule, just as in an ideal voyage, a navigator has influence over the course of the ship, its destination, and ultimately its arrival at a safe harbor. From Plato's point of view, this is the problem with freedom in a democracy. It's not freedom at all. It's just license. The master thinks that he has freedom. But in fact, the master is easily deluded by the politician who has real control in terms of manipulating that democracy. And so the state is acclaimed as a free and democratic system until it hits the rocks. And once then that happens... The verdict is clear, just it was, as it was clear in Athens, as it lost, lost that magnificent culture to unreason, to irrationality, to the manipulation of the many by a few. Well, Plato talks about freedom and democracy in that context. He speaks of freedom and democracy in other contexts as well. He draws an analogy between the state and the individual towards the end of the book in, in terms of the just and the unjust individual and the just and the unjust state. And Socrates is speaking now to one of his young followers, Glaucon, 
And in the analogy that Socrates draws, he says this, bearing in mind then the analogy between state and individual, you shall tell me what you think of the condition of each in turn. To begin with the state, is it free under a despot or is it enslaved? It's utterly enslaved. It's degraded to a miserable slavery, Glaucon says, even the best men in it. If the individual then is analogous to the state, we shall find the same order of things in him, a soul laboring under the meanest servitude, the best elements in it being enslaved, while a smaller part, which is also the most frenzied and corrupt, plays the master. Would you call such a condition of the soul, then, freedom or slavery? Slavery, of course. And just as a, slate, as, as a state enslaved to a tyrant cannot do what it really wishes, so neither can a soul under a similar tyranny do what it wishes as a whole. Goaded on against its will by the sting of desire, it will be filled with confusion and remorse. Like the corresponding state, it must always be poverty-stricken, unsatisfied, haunted by fear. Nowhere else will there be so much lamentation, groaning, and anguish as in a country under a despotism and in a soul maddened by the tyranny of passion. Therefore, throughout life, the despotic character has not a friend in the world. He is sometimes master, sometimes slave, but never knows true friendship or freedom. While the freest man is he who is first in goodness and justice, namely the true king who is also king over himself. Well, that's Plato's view, that the free person in a free state will be in a state that is controlled by reason, just as the free person within himself will have a soul that is not dominated by fear and passion but by reason. This is Plato's judgment, then, on democratic Athens, and this is his commendation of the kind of freedom that he wants. Now, finally, there is a third view of freedom, briefly, that came from the ancient world. It came from the ancient world after the Indian and the Greek. It was the Christian. 400 years after Plato, Christ expounded a philosophy of spiritual freedom. In the Gospel, according to St. John, chapter 8, Christ's idea of freedom is expressed in these words. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make ye free. They answered him, We be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto the, you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth forever. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, this concept of freedom set forth by Christ, that is, that the truth shall make you free, was developed further by the great Catholic theologian, St. Augustine, who wrote in the 5th century, the will is truly free when it is not the slave of vices, passions, and sins. That Christian view of freedom, then, means this, that the truth shall make you free. Like Plato and the Indian Hindu philosophers, Christ believed that there were two forms of freedom. The first form of freedom was not connected with the perception of any particular kind of truth. It meant acting in a social and political sense, as the Romans did, for example, conceiving of freedom in the sense that one had power to control others and assert themselves over their own political sovereignty. That was not the kind of freedom that concerned Christ most, because the second kind of freedom depended for Christ, as for the Hindus and for Plato, on the knowledge of a moral or spiritual truth. For Christ, as for the Hindus, this was a religious truth, a truth about God, and by grasping this truth, one could attain the highest freedom, freedom from sin, 
freedom from illusion, freedom from ignorance, freedom from fear. Now, there are, of course, immense differences among these three views of freedom because conceptions of what is the truth differ among the Indians, Plato and Christ. But let's look to the similarities among these three views. First, all three, the view set forth in India, the view set forth at length in Greece, and the view set forth in this one passage by Christ and developed later by theologians like St. Augustine. Those three views all distinguish between a lower and a higher form of freedom. The higher being freedom from fear and ignorance, a freedom that allows one to see a greater truth, greater than just being free to act as one wishes. It is, in fact, a perception of reality that allows us to act as we should, according to a disciplined and responsible knowledge of ourselves. It's a freedom that in the highest sense sees desire for money and property as obstacles to truth. We're free when we have transcended addiction to material possessions and so are liberated to pursue a higher truth. So this is how the ancient world perceived freedom. And although it may seem different from forms of democratic freedom as we practice them today, I think that the essence of the higher form of freedom is probably captured by John Fitzgerald Kennedy in the inaugural speech with which we began when he said, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Plato defined freedom in this way. Freedom is not license. It's acting with responsibility, with self-control, with enlightenment, a way that is consistent with duty and not contrary to it. But as we'll see as we move through these lectures, there is inevitably a tension between the democratic form of freedom and Plato's call to social responsibility. And we'll continue to explore some of the implications of this tension in the next lectures. Lecture 2, The Advent of Freedom in the Modern World. I've called this lecture, The Advent of Freedom in the Modern World, because I'll try to explain the foundations that were laid in the 17th and in the 18th centuries in Europe for our present understanding of freedom. This basis was established in the philosophies of two great theorists. The first, John Locke in 17th century England, and the second, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in 18th century France. Each philosopher built an intricate system of thought, but neither was removed from the great political and economic turmoil and the radical change that was going on around them. Locke was profoundly influenced by the middle class struggle for freedom in England that found expression in the English Revolution of 1688. And Rousseau may be seen, in a sense, as the prophet of the cataclysmic French Revolution of 1789. Locke, more than Rousseau, influenced the American Revolution of 1776. Jefferson praised Locke's philosophy as the wisest, the most perfect system of thought that he had found. So when we speak of Locke and Rousseau, we must note first that their philosophies of freedom are revolutionary 
because they urge major political and social change that will expand the realization of freedom, and not only in their own countries, but throughout the world. In this lecture, I'll be comparing and contrasting what Locke and Rousseau said about freedom, but we shall also try to relate this analysis of Locke and Rousseau to the main theme of our first lecture on freedom in the ancient world. You'll recall that when we examined Indian, Greek, Christian philosophies, we saw that at least two ways of viewing freedom appeared. One was freedom as a political or a physical ability to do as we will, to control our environment, not subject to any alien influence or domination of others. The other kind of freedom was, as we saw, an internal, a psychological realization of spiritual or moral freedom that meant liberation from illusion, from fear, from ignorance, as when the man in the darkened room, you recall, in that Upanishadic parable thought that he saw a cobra, but it was really just a rope. In this kind of freedom, you can be enslaved to your own anxieties, your compulsions, your passions, your fears, and as Christ said then, only the truth sets you free. We'll see that Locke builds on the first form of external freedom, whereas Rousseau builds on the second form of moral freedom. But let us go to Locke first. The key text that we focus on is John Locke's second treatise of government that was published in 1689. More than any of Locke's other books, this is his major statement on freedom. We see here how Locke defines freedom and then how he builds freedom into a system of thought, connecting it with his concepts of a social contract and his idea of private property. This is what we mean by a system of thought when we speak of a philosophy. We mean a kind of constellation of connected concepts. And in this constellation of Locke's system, we may say that the brightest star is the star of freedom. He uses the terms, by the way, liberty and freedom interchangeably. And this is what we'll be doing following uh, his example. Liberty and freedom meaning essentially the same. Locke begins his discussion of freedom in chapter 2 of his second treatise of government. He entitles this chapter of the state of nature, and he envisages a state of nature in which there was complete natural freedom. Then, because of our tendencies of social conflict that Locke says we were unable to manage, government had to be established. And in chapter 4, Locke goes on to distinguish between two forms, then, of liberty or freedom, the natural liberty of man that existed before government and the liberty of man in society. Now, let's read from the text of the Second Treatise of Government and analyze Locke's own language and then see how he builds on this idea of liberty uh, to develop the system that he has and try to analyze the system of philosophy that he's set forth. Now remember, he has already said that in the state of nature, which he envisages as a kind of mythical utopia in which individuals at first had complete natural freedom, that that state of nature gradually became corrupted because individuals were unable to handle their problems, and so government emerged. It was not that the corruption was that deep. When we look, for example, at the English philosopher that came before Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Hobbes envisages a state of nature that is wolf-like and so savage, in which one individual consumes the other, and the phrase that Hobbes uses is, in that state of nature, life is nasty, poor, solitary, brutish, and short. Well, Locke doesn't see the state of nature in that way. In Locke's state of nature, people are, for the most part, quite civil. 
And it seems almost at times like an English tea party in which there is such politeness, manners. And yet corruption enters in because even at best human nature cannot handle the disputes give rise from jealousy and contention of all sorts. So government becomes necessary. So we have the basic distinction then between humans in their natural state when they enjoyed pure natural liberty and then humans in the state of government in which another kind of liberty is justified and legitimized. And this is liberty in society or liberty under law. The words that Locke's, Locke uses are these. The natural liberty of man is to be free from any superior power on earth and not to be under the will or the legislative authority of man, but to have only the law of nature for his rule. That was the liberty in the state of nature. However, the liberty of man in society is to be under legislative power established by consent or contract. That is, not under the dominion of any will or restraint of any law, but what the legislative shall enact as a result of a free contract being achieved among individuals in society, according to the trust put in the legislative. And then Locke, in an immortal phrase, says this about freedom. And so, he says, this freedom from absolute arbitrary power is so necessary to and closely joined with a man's own preservation that he cannot part with this liberty, but by what forfeits his preservation in life itself. For a man cannot by contract or by his own consent enslave himself to anyone nor put himself under the absolute arbitrary power of another to take away his life when he pleases. Locke continues, The end of law, therefore, is not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. For where there is no law, there can be no freedom. For liberty is to be free from restraint and violence from others and therein not to be subject to the arbitrary will of another, but to freely follow his own. Now, those arguments that Locke is setting forth are new arguments. Locke is pronouncing the value of freedom with contract and under law as the principle now of what will be called English liberalism. That principle of freedom becomes so important that in the 19th century, as we'll see, John Stuart Mill will look back to Locke for this influence. So let's be sure that we have it as he has developed it thus far. The first principle, of course, is that of natural liberty, but this liberty is necessarily modified when it becomes civil liberty. And this civil liberty in society is necessary because government is necessary. However, the kind of government that is essential is not government of a tyrant, government that will impose arbitrary, absolute power on one. The kind of government that Locke envisages as right and legitimate is government by law. And this government, Locke says, and this is so crucial for British history at this time because we're coming into the rule of parliament, this government must be government by law, government from the legislative branch, and not government from the monarch or government of the executive. So Locke now moves to a point where he is sanctioning or legitimizing government by law and government from the legislature. A lot in that argument. And then the last point that needs to be mentioned before we go to further development of it is the idea of contract. That is, we have all freely entered into a contract, and this contract legitimizes law. We freely enter into it. We make laws, and these laws set up by ourselves are so rational, so right, that we cannot pass a law that will take our lives or that will place us under, under absolute power. No reasonable person would do that. And from Locke's point of view, then, the contract is absolutely essential for a legitimate polity that will justify the degree that liberty is lost. 
Locke continues with his idea of contract. Again, he goes back to his vision of the state of nature. He said, men being, as has been said by nature, free and independent in the state of nature, no one can be put out of this estate and subject to the political power of another without a contract, without his own consent. And so men agree with other men to join and unite into a community for their own safety and peace, living one amongst another in a secure enjoyment of their property. When any number of men have so consented to make one community or government, they are presently incorporated and make one body politic, and wherein the majority have a right to act and conclude the rest. He has affirmed his ideas here of contract, of freedom, of the way in which individuals enter jointly into an agreement that legitimizes a certain form of government. He's added one crucial element, an element that he will repeat over and again throughout the book, and that is the concept of property. Now, in Locke's context, property in 17th century England could be interpreted as including one's life. And so he will sometimes use a man's property as man's possessions, but a man's life as well. And so property is an all-inclusive term. But for the most part, when Locke uses property, he does mean goods. He means possessions. And he says that our concern as individuals in society must be to ensure property. Now, when he says that, he's arguing for middle-class rule, middle-class rule of a parliament, of landholders who are concerned with the preservation of their rights, their property vis-a-vis -vis the king. And when he is arguing in accord with the great English Revolution of 1688 for this, he's arguing for parliament, the supremacy, the rule of parliament, and, of course, that will become the key element, not only that characterizes English theory in the 18th and 19th century, centuries, but even more than that, that it has had such enormous influence on the American Revolution. When Locke talks about the rule of the legislative branch, he does it in grand terms. Later in the book, he's discussing in a chapter of the extent of the legislative power and he says, the great end of men's entering into society, being the enjoyment of their property in peace and safety, and the great instrument and means of that being the laws established in that society, the first and fundamental law of all commonwealths is the establishing, therefore, of the legislative power. Why is it the establishment of the legislative power? Because these people have an interest. Their interest is in preserving the system. And Locke looks to the kind of stability that can come from the rising middle class. And that stability in the form of a contract will ensure the rule of parliament and the ongoing safety of the realm. Remember, at this time in 1688, England had just been through a hideous civil war. Locke is arguing there must be no more of that. And there was no more of that. And from Locke's point of view, then we look to the parliament, the legislative branch, to ensure stability because they have a vested interest. That interest is in the preservation of their property. This legislative is only then it, the supreme power of the commonwealth. It is sacred. It is unalterable in the hands where the community have once placed it. The legislative is the supreme authority. It cannot assume to itself a power to rule by extemporary arbitrary decrees, but it is bound to dispense justice and decide the rights of the subject by promulgative, promulgated standing laws and known authorized judges. Notice the confidence that he places in Parliament or in the legislature. He says that the legislator is the supreme authority, but... At the same time, this supreme authority will not assume to itself a power to rule by extemporary, arbitrary, absolute decrees, because these are reasonable men. These are British landholders. 
These are people not like Charles, who lost his head, not like Cromwell, who was a bizarre Puritan, irrational type that couldn't be trusted. These are individuals who have an interest, and therefore we can count on them, and they will not try to set up an arbitrary absolute authority. What is freedom? Freedom is having liberty from absolute arbitrary authority, and we can trust Parliament for that. Well, this is an important, obviously, innovation in the whole conceptualization of freedom. Certainly, had, it had not been envisaged in the ancient world. The idea of freedom from absolute power was there, but now we have it connected to a concept of contract, to an idea of freedom under law, rooted in the vested interests of, an ind of individuals who have property and who will preserve the stability and peace of that system. All of this comes with the modern age, and it is extraordinary. These, then, are the basic elements of Locke's philosophy of freedom. First, that in the state of nature, we do enjoy an unrestricted natural liberty. Because we're unable to settle disputes peacefully, we devise, through a social contract, a legitimate form of government. This government ensures rights, the right to preserve, protect, maintain one's property. It ensures freedom, freedom of a more liber limited kind than in the state of nature, but a freedom that is nonetheless precious. Freedom under law, but freedom from the arbitrary will of an absolute government. This sort of just government, according to Locke, gives us and ensures what we need most, and that is political freedom, protection of our rights. And he says in another place, in his letter on toleration, it also ensures religious liberty because we can count on these rational individuals to value diversity as it should be valued. All this can be achieved, he asserts, only when the legislative or the parliamentary form of government is supreme. Any other form of government is likely to become arbitrary or tyrannical in its exercise of power. And so the lines from chapter 4 uh, that I just read are so central to Locke's theory that they bear repetition, and I want to repeat them once again to make certain that we have his definition of freedom straight. What is freedom? Freedom is freedom from absolute arbitrary power, and it is so necessary to closely joined with a man's preservation that he cannot part with it. That is, no individual will will otherwise. No individual will, if given the chance of a free contract, agree to part with this indispensable quality of human existence. So important is the idea of freedom to Locke. Now, this is the main reason, then, that Locke is rightly called a principal philosopher of freedom. No one had said this before. He defended as inviolable freedom from absolute power or arbitrary authority. And he goes on in the book to insist that any form of government must admit this, and if it does not, if it does not respect freedom, it ceases to be legitimate. And we know that when Thomas Jefferson read these words before the American Revolution of 1776, this was the point that appealed to him. The king in England is not legitimate because he imposes on us taxation without representation that is absolute power. And that absolute power, Locke himself, an English philosopher, has told us, is wrong and unjustified. And so the reputation that Locke has as a principal philosophy of li philosopher of liberty is well earned. He held liberty sacred. We must not be subjected, he said, to the whims of an irrational tyrant. The reason why Locke insisted on a parliamentary form of government was that England and other European monarchies had suffered so much from their fair share of tyrants on the throne. Locke wanted limited, not arbitrary, government. And this was most likely to come not through the will of one man,
but with a system of laws applied by a group of individuals in Parliament, each with a respect for property, because as members of the middle class, they had the, their stake in the system. His defense of religious liberty follows the same logic. He believes that people have a right to privacy. And this right to privacy guarantees that any infringement by the state on their sphere of religious preference is wrong. But he wanted to secure free space in society, not only to various religions, but for different classes as well. So he asserted a freedom to accumulate property. And this meant that he regarded economic inequality as justifiable. He says specifically that he does not see how freedom is consistent with equality. Because people will inevitably have different abilities to make money, to accumulate property, and so no government power can or should try to change this. Locke did want equality of all before the law, but he did not want a classless society, and the English Revolution certainly didn't argue for that. He believed that liberty demanded freedom from arbitrary government authority. It did not mean giving government the right to level social privilege or economic interests. Now, this, then, is the logic of Locke, the consistency of his system. Now, Locke has been praised for his compelling logic, for his influence on American democracy, but we need to ask, as we critique Locke, how well does his argument for social inequality hold water. That is, let's look closely at Locke's dismissal of equality and his defense of class privilege. The central question for us is, if there is economic inequality, can some, even the majority, be free when all are not free? Well, Locke says that all are free from arbitrary authority, but he would not advocate that all could have equal economic power to freely acquire property. And that is the issue. This is the source of inequality. When people in Locke's system will necessarily logically have different degrees of economic power and therefore be unequal. Our own democratic tradition, as we know, has persistently linked the values of both freedom and equality. The opening lines of our Declaration of Independence and of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address use the same phrase, that all men are created equal. And there is the tendency to assume from that that freedom and equality complement one another rather than contradict each other, which is true here. Is Locke right that we have to choose between freedom and equality, or can we have them both? As the American democratic tradition seems to assume. Rousseau, coming now to prophesize the French Revolution of 1789 that demanded liberty and equality, argued that we must have both liberty and equality. And we turn now to the theory of Jean-Jacques Rousseau as a reply to Locke, as well as a critique of our own democracy. Rousseau wrote his classic text on the social contract in 1762, 73 years after Locke published his own treatise on government. In this book, Rousseau anticipated the three great watchwords of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, and fraternity. He made clear that liberty or freedom and equality must be twin goals for any government. He says in the social contract, the greatest good of all consists in what should be the purpose of every system of legislation, the two principal objects of liberty and equality. Liberty cannot exist, Rousseau says, without equality. Now, Rousseau certainly was influenced by Locke's love of liberty and Locke's belief that a social contract must provide the basis for any sound government, 
And so Rousseau, too, takes the idea of the contract and develops it. But Rousseau insisted that we must ask whether Locke's kind of freedom, a freedom that he allows for, even encourages inequality, is the right kind of freedom. Whether Locke's rules of contract were the right rules. Rousseau began his book with lines that have become immortal. At the beginning of the social contract, he says, man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. He who believes himself the master of others does not escape being more of a slave than they. And then he proceeds to write a brilliant discourse on the evils of slavery, something that Locke, who was a heavily invested landholder in slavery, uh, would not do. And note what Rousseau is saying when he says this. Man is born free everywhere he's in chains. That is, man is born free, but he is socialized into slavery. And we are all socialized into enslavement, into bondage. Why? He who believes himself the master of others does not escape being more of a slave than they. So it's the very domination that enslaves us. And here we go back, of course, to Plato, to the idea of spiritual freedom, that we are in bondage even when we seem to have control over others and so being able to act freely. We're in bondage to our own passions, our lust for power, our domination of others. That's the source of enslavement. Because, as Plato's description of the despot or the tyrant shows, the tyrant or the despot who seems to have so much control and domination over others is in fact the most enslaved. He is constantly concerned about his own safety. And so he is not free from fear. And freedom from fear, then, is the highest goal. So Rousseau takes up on that. Rousseau, who was influenced by Plato much more than he was influenced by Locke, seizes on this idea of freedom and tries to develop it. Rousseau argues from the outset, therefore, that a society which appears to gain freedom for some at the expense of others will only attain enslavement for all, bondage to greed and to desire to exploit the less privileged and the powerful. The way out of this is to frame a social contract that combines freedom with equality for all. And he introduces his concept of the general will which means a spirit of civic concern, all for one and one for all. Scholars have tried to discern what Rousseau really meant by the concept of the general will, which has such enormous influence on political theory after Rousseau wrote it. And it's hard going through the text to find clear explanations. Certainly Rousseau doesn't explain it clearly himself. But there's one by Charles Sherover, a Rousseau, a Rousseau scholar who wrote an annotated edition of the social contract. And in that comment, Charles Sherover compares the general will and the social contract to the system that we have agreeing on rules, a set of regulations that surround the traffic light. He uses the traffic light as a particular illustration, something that Rousseau himself couldn't have done, but the Sherover, I think, does well. He says, this is Sherover now, Charles Sherover in his comment on Rousseau, the traffic light on the corner serves as a useful symbolic illustration in the way in which these concepts of the general will and the social contract elucidate Rousseau's concept of society. The traffic light does express our general will that traffic should be regulated so that drivers and pedestrians can both use the street with reasonable safety. As each driver stops for the red light and each pedestrian waits for it, there is implicit recognize the whole series of social agreements, the social contract, which makes that inherently impotent and arbitrary light a means of regulating the use of the street. Should a recalcitrant driver or pedestrian ignore the light, he'd be apprehended with general approval. The law applies to all. Should many drivers or pedestrians ignore the light, the regulations governing it become unenforceable. Chaos, a miniature state of nature ensues, and the use of the street by anyone becomes impossible or hazardous. In every use of the street, according to the laws and regulations governing its use, each driver and pedestrian is assenting to the general will. Well, that concept of the contract and the general will being embodied in the symbol of the traffic light, I think, is useful. 
Rousseau says that when we get that kind of consensus permeating throughout the society to apply not just to our public safety, suggested in the traffic light, but rather our moral welfare, our desire to help others, our sense of mutual aid, a spirit of cooperativeness, then we'll have the general will pervading throughout society and socializing us through the system of education that Rousseau sets forth in his great book, A Meal. That kind of education teaches sympathy, compassion, mutual aid, cooperation, rather than competitiveness, avarice, greed, jealousy. Rousseau wants to get individuals early. The Emil is about early childhood training, socialize them into a state of mind where they will have a public conscience, a conscience that will dictate obedience to the general will. He goes on. He believes that this spirit of community and mutual aid is the basis for the blend of freedom and equality that he wants. But he defines freedom very differently than Locke. He takes a cue from Plato by distinguishing between the lower form of freedom and the higher form, as he calls it. The higher form is what Rousseau now calls moral liberty, or sometimes moral freedom. For Rousseau, moral freedom means an understanding of the general will. That is a realization that one cannot be free unless all are free. The freedom of a selfish person is a hollow form of freedom because it lacks a social conscience. And therefore, that person is dominated, often held in bondage by his or her passion, and is not free from fear. Rousseau follows both Plato and the Indian philosophers when he insists that moral freedom means being in control of ourselves and having a knowledge of ourselves, free from the bondage to our worst, most selfish passions. But Rousseau goes further than Plato or the Indian theorists by arguing that this form of moral freedom demands social and economic equality. And he certainly differs from Locke when he insists that moral freedom and obedience to the general will demand renunciation of private property. Rousseau specifically replies to Locke, arguing that freedom and equality in any system of government demands that we limit private property and turn private property into public property. There is no single point in which he is more at odds with Locke than that. He wants equality. Equality among all of real economic power. He asserts that the real enemy of a just society is the private interest of the selfish individual. And that selfish individual is driven by ideas, by interests, which persist in exploiting and dominating others until he or she is compelled to act in the common interest or in accord with the general will. And then at this point, Rousseau gives us what is perhaps his most infamous, notorious formulation of freedom when he says in the social contract, whoever refuses to obey the general will will be forced to do so by the whole society. This means that he will be forced to be free. Now that phrase, forced to be free, has been taken by scholars both for and against Rousseau, but mainly against Rousseau, and seen as Rousseau's contribution to totalitarianism in the 20th century. It certainly can make us blink or shudder or just wonder in bewilderment over what Rousseau can mean when he says, forced to be free. It sure is different from Locke. He means this, that individuals should be forced by law to observe the common good. They must do their share and not exploit others. If we as believers in democracy preach both liberty and equality, then we must deliver by giving equal power to all. If we allow vast concentrations of wealth to occur as they have in our society, then we may preach democracy, but we fail to practice it. Rousseau is demanding that government force people to put common interest above selfish private interests. And that is the question. Now, I myself don't have any vast concentrations of wealth. But I did learn one night some years ago how difficult it can be to obey the general will. And often it seems these concepts 
become most real when they are personalized. Uh, remember the conception of the general will and the comparison to a traffic light that I made. Well, that analogy led me to an insight early one morning some years ago when I awakened about 3 a.m. to find my golden retriever vomiting blood. He was then a, an old dog, a sick dog, suffering, suffering from kidney disease, and he was critically ill, obviously. So I called the person who I regarded as a friend as well as a veterinarian, told him how miserable I was, and he nobly offered to meet me at the animal hospital on the other side of Plainfield, New Jersey, uh, which was about six miles away and seven traffic lights. I put the dog in the back of the car and I raced off in what I saw as a desperate mission of mercy. In those dim morning hours, dazed with sleepiness as I was, crazed with my sense of mission, I imagined Rousseau sitting next to me as I sailed through one traffic light after another. <laughs> but I noticed that he was scowling and so I constructed then an imaginary dialogue in my mind, which has been improved, I admit, over time, I hope. Uh, it's my attempt to uh, emulate Plato's dialogue form. I guess all of this came to me because I recall the metaphor of the traffic light, but it was in looking at my conception of the general will. Uh, that was the inspiration. The dialogue went something like this. I noticed he was scowling. What's wrong, J.J.? You taught me the value of compassion, the virtue of altruism. I'm acting out of compassion for my dog. Don't try rationalizing with me, D.D. You're doing this out of your own selfish interests, from your attachment to an animal that for the moment you're placing over the life of a human by taking a senseless risk. This is a clear case of a selfishly individual will acting against the general will. J.J., I'm trying to save a life. Is that good or not? Certainly not, if in doing so you're endangering the lives of others by flouting the social contract and violating the general will. What if a family is coming home from the shore at this moment and at the next intersection you kill them all? Is that valuing, li valuing life? Your instincts are wrong, D.D. Your instincts should be social and not personal. What do you think the general will is? The general will, J.J., is a moral ideal, and I'm doing this for moral reasons out of a moral impulse. Wrong. You're doing it out of a sense of possessiveness, the same instincts that drive people to hold on to property. This dog, J.J., is not property. This dog is life then weigh this dog's life against the lives of those you're endangering right now. The whole point of my philosophy is that you must have the same concern for them, for the public, as for your own family. An equal concern for all. Be reasonable, J.J. How can I possibly feel the same for someone I've never met as for my own family? Because we're all part of one another. Your motives aren't about helping your dog. They're about satisfying your own ego. Admit it. This is a big ego trip for you. My dog must be saved by me alone. Why don't you perform the surgery as well? J.J., could we just focus on the interest of the dog? If they had ambulances for dogs, as they do for people, then I wouldn't be driving him to the hospital myself. Ambulances, D.D., are an expression of the general will in action. They are specifically legitimized to go through red lights in the public interest. That's written into the social contract. But, D.D., you're not an ambulance. You're a public menace. J.J., I've never felt more right in doing anything than what I'm doing right now for my dog. Well, D.D., you've got the my part right, the selfish interest. But the really sad thing about this is that you don't realize it's exactly when you're most convinced about the righteousness of a moral action that you should be most critical of it. You've got a potentially fatal case of hubris. You see yourself as driving heroically to save your dog, but in fact, you're being driven like a beast by your own desperate impulse that blinds you to danger. You think that you're acting freely, but you're anything but free. You're so compulsive that you can imagine you're above the law. Get some rational control over yourself. That's what freedom means, not taking license with the innocent lives of people around the corner. Well, my first instinct after I got the dog, 
to the hospital was to be glad that Rousseau had been dead for 200 years so that after I got some sleep, he wouldn't bother me anymore. But in fact, Rousseau was right in that case. My action lacked any social conscience. If a cop had stopped me at that point, he would have, been, he would have forced me to be free in the sense of freedom mean, meaning acting in accord with a general will or a legitimate set of rules which observes instinctively, intuitively, the rights of other people in the society, above all, their right to security and to safety. Now, Rousseau has has defined his own solution for the ills of modern society. And that definition is set forth in another work, in Political Economy, in which he talks about his desire to create an ideal community, a community in which individuals will instinctively act according to a public sense, and so they won't have to be forced to be free, they'll be socialized into freedom. And he says at this point, every man is virtuous when his particular will is in all things conformable to the general will, and we voluntarily will what is willed by those whom we love. If men were aware of their own existence merely as a part of the state, they might at length come to identify themselves in some degree with this great whole, to feel themselves members of their community, and to love it with an exquisite feeling which no isolated person has, save for himself. Now this phrase is one of the best, it seems to me, that Rousseau has set forth, and it does, it seems to me, exonerate him from the charge of totalitarianism, which is so often leveled against him. And that is, every man is virtuous when his particular will is in all things conformable to the general will, and, as it seems to me is the phrase that counts, we voluntarily will what is willed by those whom we love. To voluntarily will what is willed by those whom we love is, from Rousseau's point of view, a way of entering into a communal situation in which we will have infinite empathy and respect for those individuals who may will opposite, in a way opposite than ours. Now, Rousseau says in the social contract that if we are to get this degree of empathy, if we are to nourish this sort of social conscience, if we are to achieve this degree of education through socialization of individuals, then we'll have the highest form of liberty with equality. Because an individual who voluntarily wills what is willed by those whom he loves will not want to dominate or to enter into a relationship which is unequal. And yet that individual will, by the same token, be free. Locke spoke of freedom in one sense, a kind of freedom that was limited, a sort of freedom that was, we called it, external and political. It relied on a change of the system, a change of the system to such a degree that the old monarchies would be replaced by a new parliament. That change of system would be revolutionary, but it would not usher in freedom with equality, which was the dream of the American Revolution. Rousseau says, look at that degree of change, change of system, and realize that it's not adequate, that what we want is a change of self. We want to replace the old systems, to be sure, but more than that, we want to change human nature. And in his social contract, he says that the change required to change human nature is to transform each individual into part of a larger entity from which this individual receives his life and being and freedom. It means to alter our very constitution in order to strengthen it, to substitute a social and moral existence for the physical and independent existence we've all received from nature. In a word, he says, we want to transform natural liberty into moral freedom, because moral freedom alone makes man truly the master of himself. Back to Plato, back to Indian philosophy, but with this difference, freedom must come with social and political equality. The hope is for the beloved community 
for a way in which we will think and act in accord with others. The word is public conscience. Lecture 3, Hegel's Philosophy of Freedom, God, and the State. We've now reached the point in time in this third lecture on freedom of 19th century Europe. And at this time and place, there occurred an extraordinary burst of political theory, especially in thinking about freedom. Perhaps this flowering of thought was stirred by the rise of a powerful middle class concerned about freedom of commerce, perhaps by the American and French revolutions in the late 18th century. Perhaps it was stirred by the stimulation of philosophers like Locke and Rousseau. But whatever the reason, the 19th century marks the high water mark in its philosophizing about freedom in history thus far. And the two major philosophers, George Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel and John Stuart Mill, expound two sharply contrasting views of freedom that are diametrically opposed, as opposed as they are influential. This lecture will be devoted entirely to George Hegel, the next one to John Stuart Mill. But the two should be seen as a pair of contrasts, as we viewed Locke and Rousseau in the second lecture as contrasts. Now, I've titled this lecture, Hegel's Philosophy of Freedom, God, and the State, because these three concepts are so closely knit in his philosophy, each depending on the other, just as Locke's idea of freedom was necessarily dependent on his concepts of social contract and uh, property. But Hegel did not build on the ideas of Locke. Mill did that, as we'll see next time. Hegel built on the philosophies of Plato, Christianity, and Rousseau. When I say this, that Hegel was influenced more by one group of thinkers than another, I mean to suggest that more than just a fact of intellectual history. I want to state the main theme of these lectures so far, and this is that there are two distinct ways of thinking about freedom, and that these two ways could be seen as early as 1000 BC in the Indian Upanishads, in the concept of Swaraj, or freedom, as I tried to explain in our very first lecture, but that by the 19th century, the century we're in 
now as we treat Hegel and then later Mill, these two ways of thinking about freedom take dramatically opposed forms in the philosophies of Hegel and Mill. The crystallization of these two views of freedom is a major philosophical event of the 19th century. It forms what we may call two rival schools of thought. One school of thought about freedom, derived from Plato and Christianity, synthesized by Hegel, continued by Karl Marx, conceived of freedom as liberation from ignorance or illusion by achieving some form of knowledge or higher consciousness, as it's best expressed by Christ's dictum, the truth shall set you free. The other opposed view of freedom, also present in ancient thought, but synthesized especially by Locke and Mill to British theorists, said simply that we're free when we're not controlled by some form of arbitrary authority. Whether that arbitrary authority is a tyrannical state or what Mill called the tyranny of the majority, a phrase that we'll be analyzing in the next lecture. These two schools of thought clash especially over how freedom relates to authority, whereas Hegel welcomes the authority of the ideal state because the state can liberate the individual and, as it were, force him to be free, Locke and Mill are suspicious of authority to the extreme, and they want a limited parliamentary system of government that is freedom under law and laws established carefully through contract. So as we turn now to Hegel, we must keep in mind the importance of his theories of God and state to his idea of freedom and how all in turn relate to his notion of authority as a means of liberation. Hegel was born in Stuttgart in 1770, which was then in Prussia, now in Germany. He studied as a young man in a theological university. And though he chose not to become a theologian, he chose instead to become a professor of philosophy and achieved a very prestigious post at the University of Berlin in philosophy, chair of philosophy in the early 19th century. Although he chose then academe rather than the church, he nevertheless remained intensely involved in religious speculation. And we'll see this in a moment when we stress the connection of his idea of God to his concept of freedom. Hegel sets forth his theory of freedom in his major work, The Philosophy of History. And he significantly opens this treatise with a strong statement of his view of God. Well, we quote Hegel. The world is not abandoned to accident and chance. It is controlled by providence. A divine providence presides over the events of the entire world. A wisdom endowed with infinite power, which realizes its own aim, that is, the final absolute purpose of the world, which is freedom. If God's wisdom is manifest in animals, in plants, and individual lives, then why not in world history? God is all-powerful and so exercises his wisdom on a grand scale. He governs the world and the actual working of his government, the carrying out of his plan, is the history of the world. Philosophy strives to comprehend God's grand design for only that which has been carried out according to God's plan is true. Now, philosophers and theologians before Hegel had, of course, conceived of God as an omnipotent, a benevolent, often, force that controlled human affairs, that determined all life, an infinite power. That goes back to early Christianity and, of course, before. Hegel applies, though, in the context of his Christian vision, this view of God to his philosophy of history, asserting that world history must be viewed as a grand drama with God as the sole author. When we get to his theory of freedom, 
We'll see that Hegel does not regard people as being able to write the script for this drama themselves. It is God alone who writes the script. We are free only insofar as we become conscious of God's plan and then cooperate with it by freely performing our roles in history. If we play these roles well, then we're free agents insofar as we're acting according to his plan because truth has set us free. If we do not, then we're enslaved to an illusion. And the illusion is that we are the creators of history. An illusion that will be overcome only if we come to know God. Knowing God is to become aware of our own natures. Because we have a divine essence. We have a soul within, a spark of the divine that is for us to realize. Most of us are alienated from that essence. We are unaware of its purpose or its power. Hegel develops the concept newly, in an original way, of alienation as it had not been developed before. Now, that is, Christianity and other religions early on had said that the soul was divided from the body. And the body-mind or body-soul division certainly can be found before Christianity. Hegel builds on that idea. But the concept of alienation here is special. And uh, while it begins in terms of an individual alienated within, as we'll see, it takes a political turn Later on, he develops it in his political philosophy to one state alienated from another state. The concept of alienation is this, that there is essence and there is existence. Essence is divine. Existence is matter. And ultimately, in spiritual eternal terms, it is illusion. Our task is to realize our essence. And that is a special task assigned to us as human beings, because only in humanity does this divine essence preside. Only in humanity is there an opportunity to realize it. Alienation occurs when we fail to realize the God within, when we turn away from the essence and are consumed only with existence. Existence is physical, it will die. Essence is eternal. It cannot perish because it's part of God himself. Now, Hegel develops a concept of human nature that sees human nature following logically from his concept of God. He explains it in his philosophy of history. And note once again that he does call his major text the philosophy of history because as we'll see, God's plan is the working out in history of a particular design. He speaks about human nature in these terms. We have in our human nature two parts, those of matter and those of spirit, those of existence and of essence. The realm of spirit is the kingdom of God within us, and it must be realized as such. The realm of spirit is all comprehensive, and we are creatures within which the spirit works. Our purpose in the course of history is to seize the advantage before us, at which spirit and matter unite, for they meet only in us, in human nature. Now we want to note how Hegel assigns then to human nature this a special, this special destiny. We're unique in the universe because only in us, in our physical being, has God chosen in his infinite wisdom to work. Our destiny is not simply to nod our heads in recognition of this phenomenon, as one nods, say, at the preaching of a Sunday sermon, but rather to realize the uncanny opportunity that we have as God's creatures. It's at this point that Hegel speaks explicitly of freedom, identifying it as a godlike quality for us to know and us to appreciate. He says this, if the opposite of spirit is matter, then the essence and substance of spirit is freedom. Freedom is the sole truth of spirit. And as we must discover the meaning of spirit, so must we also know the truth of freedom. For I am free when I am conscious of my divine self, 
by overcoming self-alienation. Scholars have tried to sort out that passage, believe me, for decades and volumes have been spent on trying to tell precisely what Hegel meant by the concept of freedom. Well, we can begin. He certainly didn't mean what Locke meant by the idea of freedom. He means spiritual freedom, moral freedom, but clearly he means more than that, too. Note the passage. Let's go over the passage and uh, try to sort it out. We've said that the opposite of spirit is matter. That is, there's essence and existence. But then he says, the essence and the substance of spirit is freedom. Freedom is the sole truth of spirit. And we must discover the meaning of spirit so we'll know the truth of freedom. And then finally, I am free when I am conscious of my divine self by overcoming self-alienation. What does he mean? Well, he means to start that start with that freedom is a state of consciousness within us, a capacity that enables us to know God. It's a kind of window of opportunity that if we'll use it, will sweep away the ignorance and illusions that we have and allow us to understand the real purpose of humanity, which is to comprehend God's plan and glorify his wisdom. So we should understand his idea of freedom as spiritual freedom, as a liberation of the spirit within us that enables us to know God, to discover our soul. And he speaks of our need then to overcome alienation or estrangement from our divine self and gain an awareness of God. He says that freedom is a higher, a spiritual consciousness, a free spirit. And it comes as a gradual process in which we gain greater enlightenment. In his own words, he says, freedom is not natural and innate. It must be acquired and won. It is possible only through an arduous process of the discipline of knowledge and willpower, obedience to law and observance of morality. Again, pause and and comment on that. Freedom is obedience in the sense that once we gain awareness of God's plan, we will, truth having set us free, obey God's will. We will realize as limited creatures in history, we are not God. We can know God, but we cannot be God. As relatively limited in terms of our action. We'll realize that our task in history is not to create history, but to execute history. Because we haven't written the script. We execute history as players will execute history in a grand drama, as players will execute their parts. And that grand drama has a purpose. Is it conceivable, Hegel says, as he reviews the march of civilization, the way in which a consciousness of freedom has grown since the early times, is it conceivable that all of this has come about as a result of an accident? That is, that the way in which individuals, say, in China during the Han Dynasty, viewed freedom in such a limited sense, where only at best the emperor could claim some freedom. Now we move up through Greece. We've seen how in Greece they have developed a civic sense of freedom. And Plato has enlarged upon it and showed us how, considering the task before us, freedom can be enlarged and understood through enlightenment. And after that burst of knowledge and enlightenment in Greece, now we get an emerging state of freedom and consciousness of freedom in modern Europe. That whole drama from Asia to ancient Europe to modern Europe speaks of a plan a kind of consciousness that's emerged as a result of humans being more and more able to execute what God intended. And what he intended was that we should become more and more aware of this plan, and that would be freedom. The concepts here of history, are, the concepts of history and of alienation are important. We've talked about history in terms of the way in which world history spells this drama out, 
from the birth of the concept of freedom perhaps in Asia to the growing realization of it in Greece and then uh, the increased awareness of it in modern Europe. But it's also, Hegel says, a way in which individuals have worked through this problem of alienation. Uh, that is, they initially were not aware of it at all. And more and more there's consciousness of the division between essence and existence, of the alienation between the mind and the body or the divine self and the existence of the body. That kind of alienation, from Hegel's point of view, is being more and more overcome throughout history. We more and more realize that we are at one with God and not estranged from him. And that has come about especially through Christianity. Hegel says that the highest kind of freedom, the freedom in which truly we will become aware of the divine, can occur only in a Christian society. Christianity has given us this kind of awareness. And from his point of view, Christianity has prepared us more and more for an understanding of where we are philosophically. It was Christ who said, the truth shall set, shall set ye free. And when he said that, he was heralding a whole way of thinking and of acting that became would become more and more important. And Hegel seizes on this and says, it only awaits, it needs the development of philosophy. And philosophy will give to that early Christian insight what's necessary. What's necessary is, is a way of thinking uh, that will achieve uh, a union of God, a full union of God, and no longer being alienated from him. Now, Hegel distinguished, as Plato and Rousseau did, between two types of freedom. But he made the distinction much more clearly and sharply than they had. Hegel said that there is an inferior type of freedom, a definitely inferior type of freedom that he calls simply negative freedom. And he identifies this negative freedom with caprice and whim. He says it's characterized by the license of selfish desires. This is clearly a put down of the Lockean or the liberal notion of freedom, which Hegel derides as no more than license. The other kind of freedom, which is the true, real, authentic form of freedom, is the one that Hegel praises. And this we attain only when the truth sets us free, when we become aware of the essence or spirit within us that's God, when we exercise the God-given capacity of our free spirit and consciousness to know our real selves. Hegel calls this freedom positive rather than negative, and it must be acquired and won, he says, through struggle, struggle to overcome the alienation that we may feel from our higher selves. Now, at the beginning of, of our comments on Hegel, I said that three concepts would be the focus of our lecture, and that is the concepts of freedom, of God, and the state. And so far we haven't mentioned Hegel's idea of the state. The theory of the state or nation is central to Hegel's thought because he believes that the state has been chosen by God to play a leading role in his drama. But the concept of the state did not come right away to Hegel. Hegel began as a philosopher not of the state but of the individual. And in his, in his earlier work, published in 1806, called The Phenomenology of Being. In that early work, he saw the conflict between essence and existence as occurring within the individual. The individual's attempt was to overcome alienation, to know God, and to execute his, mainly his, women are not often mentioned, his role in history. That attempt on the part of Hegel to focus on individual self-realization is all important in his earlier work. As he develops his philosophy, he becomes more and more political. And he takes the division that occurs in every individual between essence and existence. He takes the alienation that each of us feels between our divine state and our material state. He takes that and he transfers it into the world scale 
of a conflict between states. And so the conflict within each individual is now taken up as a conflict between two states, often at war with one another, one carrying the divine spirit and the other not. Hegel's concept then of the state is all important. He's clear that all states will not have the role of major player to perform. Only those that God has chosen and God has deemed worthy, and we cannot know why he has selected some states and not others. We can, by studying history, tell which states have had a divine sanction, because God selects to fulfill his design those states that can and have exercised most power, and God is not concerned with losers. He chooses states that will further his cause. And so those states that have grown to great power, imperial power, marshaling great empires, are those states that truly represent the way in which God means, plans, his design in history. Who, what, is the carrier of the divine spirit? Well, Hegel was concerned only initially, as I said, with individuals. Now he becomes, as he becomes a professor of history at philosophy at the University of Berlin, he becomes more and more concerned with politics and uh, with states, in particular now the German state. And he finds, when he looks at history, that the march of history has been carried on more and more by states. And the nature of the contest is one between one state that will build an empire to a certain degree, come into conflict with another state, a clash will occur, and the divine spirit will be furthered in history as a result of the outcome. And so when Hegel speaks of conflict and struggle, he sanctions these, not just as necessary, but as desirable in the course of world history. When he speaks of conflict, he speaks of overcoming alienation. And the way in which we overcome alienation is as members of a particular state, which hopefully for us carries the divine spirit, we become members of that state and strive with and through that state to overcome the alienation that exists throughout the world. It's at this point, then, that the personal becomes the political. Heretofore, Hegel's philosophy may have had limited interest in his early works. Now it takes on, especially in Germany, throughout Europe, major interest when he speaks of certain states carrying a divine spirit. He becomes now a philosopher of nationalism. And no single concept in the 19th century marshals more political power around it, not even the concept of freedom, than the concept of nationalism. And as we know, that concept of nationalism is carried through into the 20th century, in which even today, it is the major political phenomenon of our time. God selects, then, certain states to fulfill his design. So when Hegel views history, he now examines states that have become great empires. In China, Greece, Rome, the ancient world was controlled by vast political powers. The historian bef historians before Hegel may have looked at this and seen it as being of some interest. Now, we see it as part of a design, and that design is a growing consciousness of freedom in the world. God wanted it this way. God laid the foundations for the progressive realization of his plan and for the onward march of freedom. And so this is what Hegel says about the state. The state is the divine idea as it exists on earth. The state is the agent of world history. The state is the source of the genuine moral life and the highest expression of morality. It is the positive reality and the satisfaction of freedom. The state does not exist for its citizens. On the contrary, the state is the end, and they are its means. They are parts of the state, like members of an organic body. 
As such, the state is the realization of the highest freedom, of positive freedom, and serves an absolute final purpose, God's purpose on earth. All the value that the individual has, all his spiritual reality, he has only through the state, because the state is the very condition for the realization of his freedom. And he realizes this freedom on the stage of world history only if he is in a state selected by God through conflict, overcoming alienation. Well, there's a lot in that, in that passage, charged with nationalism. The state, the divine idea as it exists on earth. The state now, not a single individual, but the state becomes the carrier of God's purpose. The state, the agent of history. History moves ahead only through nation states. And we want to note this because it is so important in Western political philosophy as opposed to Eastern political philosophy. And that is the way in which at this point in Western political philosophy, struggle and conflict is brought to the fore. Hegel, as a philosopher, represents a mainstream now of thinking about politics, which indicates that only through conflict and struggle can progress occur. We might take this for granted today, that is, the necessity of competition for progress. But it was not taken for granted before the 19th century so much. And in the East, in Asian thought, in Chinese and Indian thought, it was certainly not assumed. That is, the assumption there was that progress occurred insofar as we achieved harmony with nature, harmony among ourselves. Whereas for Hegel, only struggle and conflict can assure the overcoming of alienation. So we overcome alienation and division through conflict. And as the self is torn in a state of alienation between essence and existence, so now the world becomes torn between conflicting empires or conflicting states. And this is necessary and desirable. This is the stuff of history. Now he says further, note, the source of the genuine moral life and the highest expression of morality is only in the state. It's the positive reality and satisfaction of freedom. He's linking here the state with God, but the state with the expression of the highest moral life. That is, we obey the state, not because we're afraid of the state, but because we know that the state sets forth a set of norms and laws that if it is the right state, remember we're always inserting that important qualification and proviso, if it happens to be the state chosen by God to advance the course of world history and overcome alienation, if it's the right state, then it represents the highest moral life. And we find morality in, then, the system of laws that that state sets forth. And then it's the positive reality and satisfaction of freedom. The positive reality and satisfaction of freedom can occur then only in the state. Individual freedom outside the state that God has selected to further the course of world history, that is not possible. We achieve freedom then not as single individuals, but as members of an organic body. And as he continues in this passage, the state doesn't exist for its citizens. The state is the end. They are its means. They are parts of the state like members of an organic body. The concept of the state as an organic body began in Plato's Republic. Plato in the Republic says that we must create a state that is so harmonious, so unified, that just as in a single individual, that individual will feel pain at the loss of one of his members. So we must create a state that's so unified that each individual in the state will feel loss or grieve over each of its members as extremely as we would feel loss over one of our, our leg or our arm. That suggestion of the state as an organic body is carried on through political philosophy until we get to Hegel. And notice the implications of it for Hegel. The state is the organic body. That is, we are knitted together in the state to such a degree that just as the arm doesn't enter into 
a state of conflict with the heart over which is superior. Uh, the body organizes in terms of a hierarchy with certain organs being superior to other organs in terms of our own existence. So in this state, there will be a hierarchy. And in this state, one part of the state will obey another part of the state instinctively and intuitively. And that is freedom. It's freedom to know one's place in the state, to be assured that one's ultimate realization of God can occur only within this, that the state is the end and the people, the citizens, are only the means to its fulfillment. Hegel's theory of the state, then, shows that he was a political philosopher, above all, who emphasized the primary role of politics in the struggle for spiritual truth. But it was not just any politics or any state, as he said, that would enhance or further the per pursuit of God and truth. Most of the world's states or nations at any given point are not chosen by God and so will play no part in his plan. They're consigned to the dustbin of history. They're the victims of larger, more powerful states because they cannot carry on the struggle. Even among the most powerful states, God cannot be on the side of both states in a major conflict between them. We may tell which one he has chosen by who wins, by which one survives, prevails uh, to advance his purpose, but there must be conflict. In the early part of human history, God chose states in Asia, China, and India to form huge oriental empires that glorified his plan. Then the divine spirit leapt to Greece, where the Athenian Empire performed its brief but spectacular role on the stage, including Alexander the Great's conquest of India, uh, before giving way to the magnificent power of the Roman Empire. And Hegel discusses each one of these entities in terms of the part that they have to play and saying that the Germanic peoples now have a decisive role to play in history. In each case, the test of greatness, then, of whether God has chosen lies with the political power, the will and the capacity to prevail. The march of freedom demands winners, not losers. And we overcome our alienation from the spirit within us only within a state that can sustain conflict. And one of the most remarkable parts of Hegel's philosophy of history, I think, is its account of what Hegel calls the hero in history, the great leader, the world historical individual, as he calls him. Hegel believes that God selects not only states to serve his purpose, but great leaders of states, not individuals apart from the state, but leaders who become one with their states and advance the cause of the state and turn the state indeed into a powerful empire. It's noteworthy that the heroes whom Hegel discusses are both political leaders and military geniuses. Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, and Napoleon are his world historical individuals. They're able to seize political power and to exploit it to the fullest. And they're able to seize it often, most often, through military conflict. And we want to note how the concepts of alienation and conflict begin on a personal level, then they move to the state level, then they take the form of the person, the hero within the state, who has great military meaning and force. Let's listen to Hegel's own words about the hero in history. I think this is uh, the best part of the philosophy of history when he describes his world historical individuals. Historical men, world historical individuals, are those who grasp a higher universal, make it their own purpose, and realize this purpose in accordance with the higher law of the spirit. Caesar was such a man. He was motivated not only by his own private interest, but acted instinctively to bring to pass that which the times required. It's the same with all great historical individuals. Their own particular purposes contain the substantial will of the world spirit. They must be called heroes, as I call them, insofar as they have derived their purpose and vocation not from the calm, regular course of things sanctioned by the existing order, but from a secret source whose content is still hidden and has not yet broken through into existence. 
The source of their actions is the inner spirit, still hidden beneath the surface, but already knocking against the outer world as against the shell, in order finally to burst forth and break it into pieces. Such individuals, heroes in history, have no consciousness of the idea as such. They're practical and political men. But at the same time, they're thinkers with insight into what is needed and timely. They see the very truth of their age and their world. Spirit is the innermost soul of all individuals, but spirit exists in a state of unconsciousness, which the great men arouse to consciousness. For this reason, their fellow men fly to them, follow their soul leaders. They stream to their banner, for they feel the irresistible power of their own spirit embodied in their heroes. I think that's a priceless passage that explains much of our theory of charismatic leadership that we've set forth in the 20th century. These great men seem only to follow their passion and their arbitrary wills, but what they really pursue is the universal. The deeds of the great men who are the individuals of world history thus appear justified not only in their intrinsic unconscious significance, but from the point of view of world history and freedom. It's irrelevant and inappropriate from that point of view to raise moral claims against world historical heroes. They stand outside of morality. The litany of the private virtues of modesty, humility, love, and charity must not be raised against them. So you see we have the suggestion of Nietzsche's Superman, that is, the individual who can rise above morality. These individuals, unlike the common citizen who will realize freedom through following law, these individuals are ahead of their time. And like Caesar and Napoleon and Alexander, they forecast great empires. A world historical individual is not so sober as to adjust his ambition to circumstances, nor is he very considerate. He is devoted, come what may, to one purpose, Therefore, such men may treat other great and even sacred interests inconsiderately, a conduct which indeed subjects them to moral reprehension. But so mighty a figure must trample down many an innocent flower, crush to pieces many things in its path. These world historical individuals were fortunate in being the agents of a purpose which constitutes a step in the progress of the universal spirit and its realization of freedom. But as individuals distinguished from their substantial aim, they were not what is commonly called happy, nor did they want to be. They wanted to achieve their aim, and they achieved it by their toil and labor. They succeeded in finding their satisfaction and bringing about their purpose, the universal purpose. With such a grand aim, they had the boldness to challenge all the opinions of men. Thus they attained no common enjoyment for themselves. Their whole life was labor and trouble. Their whole being was in their passion. Once their objectives attained, they fall off like empty hulls from the colonel. They die early like Alexander. They are murdered like Caesar. They are transported to St. Helena like Napoleon. Well, this is the agent of world history. The individual, the hero who can lead his state to a realization of freedom. The world historical individual or hero in history leads the charge then in the fight for freedom. He's God's servant in the cause of divine destiny. He brings his state to a climax and his people to a state of sublime realization. Hegel's theory is expressed most succinctly in the lines about the hero that, as I said, I like most, Spirit is the innermost soul of all individuals, but it exists in a state of unconsciousness. The great men arouse this spirit to consciousness, so their fellow men stream to their banner because they feel the irresistible power of their own spirit embodied in them. That's the function of the hero. And note the emphasis now upon the realization of the spirit through the individual hero in history. It's in all of us, but the hero shows us the way toward the realization of the power within each. And note how this description of political leadership summarizes Hegel's views about freedom, God, and the state. The hero leads us to freedom by inspiring within us the realization of our spirit. 
We are awakened because of his power, but we are awakened to the power within ourselves. This is God's will and God's power. And these leaders would be powerless were it not for the state, which they use as an agent of his will and his design, which must be the attainment of freedom. The focus in Hegel's philosophy is consistently on freedom, and he concludes the philosophy of history with his grand affirmation of the theme of freedom. Freedom is itself, he says, its own object of attainment and the sole purpose of spirit. It's the ultimate purpose through which all history is continually aimed. To this end, all the sacrifices have been offered on the vast altar of the earth throughout the long lapse of ages. Freedom alone is the purpose which realizes and fulfills itself, the only enduring pole in the change of events and conditions, the only truly efficient principle that pervades the whole. This final aim is God's purpose with the world, but God is the absolutely perfect being and can therefore will nothing but himself, his own will. The nature of his own will, his own nature, is what then we call here the idea of freedom. So Hegel explicitly called his theory the idea of freedom. And he contributed through this idea what was not there earlier in the theories of Plato and Christianity or Locke or Rousseau. He did this by connecting the idea of freedom with at least two really new concepts. The first is his idea of freedom being an unfolding of God's purpose in history. That's new. The idea that we will become more and more liberated and conscious of our own destiny through the state as part of God's purpose in history, that is Hegel's contribution. Rousseau had distinguished between moral or spiritual freedom, but Hegel is the first to link this to history, to God. So the story of our existence on this planet becomes a history of freedom, an increasingly greater realization of freedom, which is at one with God's plan for humanity. His second contribution is, of course, that of nationalism. No theorist gave more substance and inspiration to the theory and practice of nationalism as Hegel did. He placed the state or the nation at the front, front of the stage of world history as the agent of God's will. The nation's state was where all the action was committed. That is, the in, that is an indispensable instrument of human progress and freedom for Hegel. And without it, there can be no freedom. So God selects the state that will carry out his plan, and the leader of the state becomes the hero that will achieve it. The theory then gives a divine sanction to political power as well as to military power when these infuse a state and a leader who represents the cause of freedom. Lecture 4, John Stuart Mill's Philosophy of Freedom. John Stuart Mill, an English theorist born in 1806, 36 years after Hegel, is identified with the idea of freedom more than perhaps any philosopher that we might consider because of his classic work, on liberty. 
On Liberty was published in 1859, and it managed to define the meaning of freedom with extraordinary clarity and precision. The book is a powerful, a lasting statement. It's logically developed. It's forcefully argued. The conception of freedom that Mill offers in On Liberty is so different from that of Hegel that it's hard to believe that they're writing about the same idea of freedom. Whereas Hegel, as we saw, conceives of God and the state as integral parts of his philosophy of freedom, Mill separates his idea of freedom from both God and the state because he believes that too much of either religion or the state can thwart individual liberty rather than enhance it. Yet, as we'll see, it is not religion or the state that worries Mill most. It's rather the way that society infringes on individual liberty and creates, as Mill uses the term, a tyranny of the majority. Now, this was a problem that Hegel never considered. It was the threat from Mill's point of view of conformity, of a kind of social censorship that oppresses creativity and individuality. That is the threat to human freedom that Mill is most concerned, with which Mill is most concerned. The enemy to liberty in Mill's time was a Victorian code of morality that stifled both men and women in their attempts at free expression of thought or behavior. And uh, Mill's passion when he considers this enemy to freedom is so great that we must, before we turn to On Liberty, I think try to understand the depth of John Stuart Mill's purpose by asking first, why was the book written? Mill describes in his autobiography his extraordinary childhood, an upbringing that was determined by his father, James Mill, a person who seemed convinced that he had discovered the truth in the theory of the British philosopher Jeremy Bentham. And uh, while this might not have been so bad in itself, uh, he then determined to create out of his young son a perfect disciple of Jeremy Bentham with the mission of carrying Bentham's message to the whole world. Mill describes the process that ensued, a process of harsh indoctrination that was an appalling success. That is, Mill did become a prodigy, able to expound the philosophy of Jeremy Bentham, but as a terror, at a terrible cost to his own emotional being. Mill relates this in his autobiography, that is, the experience of a childhood and being raised by a father who was determined to create out of him a disciple. And Mill says, I began to learn Greek when I was three years old, but I learned no Latin until my eighth year. At that time, I read, under my father's tuition, a number of Greek prose authors, among whom I remember the whole of Herodotus, the first six dialogues of Plato, from the Euthyphron to the Theotetus inclusive, the last dialogue totally impossible for me to understand. But my father, in all his teaching, demanded of me not only the utmost that I could do, but much that I could by no possibility have ever done. What he was himself willing to undergo for the sake of my instruction may be judged from the fact that I went through the whole process of preparing my Greek lessons in the same room and at the same table at which he was writing. And as in those days Greek and English lexicons were not, I was forced to have recourse to him for the meaning of every word that I didn't know. This incessant interruption he, one of the most impatient of men, submitted to in the cause of my education. From about the age of 12, I entered into another and more advanced stage in my course of instruction. This commenced with logic. My father made me read whole or parts of several of the Latin treatises on the scholastic logic, giving each day to him in our walks a minute account of what I had read and answering his numerous and his searching questions. 
From his own intercourse with me, I could derive none but a very humble opinion of myself, and the standard of comparison he always held up to me was not what other people did, but what a man could and ought to do. If I thought anything about myself, it was that I was rather backward in my studies, since I always found myself so in comparison with what my father expected from me. He wound up by saying that whatever I knew more than others could not be ascribed to any merit in me, but to the very unusual advantage which had fallen to my lot of having a father who was able to teach me and willing to give the necessary trouble in time, that it was no matter of praise to me if I knew more than those who had not had a similar advantage, but the deepest disgrace to me if I did not. Well, that's the story of the early education, and it is as Mill described it, believe it or not, and that is his father, James Mill, a, an historian writer in his own right, insisted that he would have total control over his son's education, and John Stuart Mill never attended a school. He received his entire instruction from his father, and he emerged in his teens as one of the leaders of in British intellectual circles publishing articles at age 15 and 16 uh, that one would identify with a learned erudite person at age 30 or 40. An extraordinary success. But uh, we perhaps don't need Freud to tell us this uh, at a tremendous cost to his, as I said, psychological well-being. So he describes... Uh, the emotional breakdown that ensues. From uh, <clears throat> when I first read Bentham, I, what, I had what might truly be called one object in life, to be a reformer of the world. My conception of my own happiness was entirely identified with this object. But the time came when I awakened from this as from a dream. It was in the autumn of 1826. I was in a wretched state of nerves, unsusceptible to any enjoyment. In this frame of mind, it occurred to me to put the question directly to myself. Suppose that all your objects in life were realized, that all the changes in institutions and opinions which you are looking forward to could be completely affected at this very instant. Would this be a great joy and happiness to you? An irrepressible self-consciousness directly answered, no. <laughs> At this, my heart sank within me. The whole foundation on which my life was constructed fell apart. All my happiness was to have been found in the continual pursuit of this end. The end had ceased to charm, and how could there ever again be any interest in the means? I seemed to have nothing left to live for. I sought no comfort by speaking to others of what I felt. If I had loved anyone sufficiently to make confiding my griefs a necessity... I should not have been in the condition I was. My father, to whom it would have been natural to me to have had recourse in any practical difficulties, was the last person to whom, in a case such as this, I looked for help. Everything convinced me that he had no knowledge of any mental state as I was suffering from, and that even if he could be made to understand that he was not the physician who could heal it, my education, who was wholly his work, had been conducted without any regard to the possibility of its ending in this result. And I saw no use in giving him the pain of thinking that his plans had failed, when the failure was probably irre irremediable, and at all events beyond the power of his remedies. Of other friends I had at that time none to whom I had any hope of making my condition intelligible. It was, however, abundantly intelligible to myself, and the more I dwelt upon it, the more hopeless it appeared. And Mill describes how the gloom and the depression becomes greater, and he is unable to shake it. At age 20, 21, 22, he moves through his studies then as a robot, unable to contend with the mental state, the depression that swept over him. And then he manages to snap out of it. And it's a result of a particular friendship that he forms. And he describes it. It was at the period of my mental progress, which I have just described, that I finally formed the friendship, which, which was to have the honor and chief blessing of my existence. 
as well as the source of a great part of all that I have attempted to do or hope to effect hereafter for human improvement. My first introduction to the lady who, after a friendship of 20 years, consented to be my wife was in 1930, uh, sorry, in 1830, when I was in my 25th and she in her 23rd year, although it was years after my introduction to Mrs. Harriet Taylor, before my acquaintance with her became at all intimate or confidential, I very soon felt her to be the most admirable person I had ever known. Now, Mill does not mention here that when he first met Harriet Taylor in July of 1830, she had been married to her husband, John Taylor, for four years and had by him two children, ages three and six months. Uh, she had her third and last child in 1831. Shortly after their first meeting, they began an intimate and a lasting friendship. Harriet Taylor's husband died in 1849, and two years later they were married. From Mill's perspective, his relationship with Harriet Taylor not only inspired many of the ideas in On Liberty, but also in his original work, The Subjection of Women. In personal terms, her friendship rescued him from the depression that he described in his autobiography. But their relationship had mixed results. The openness of their relationship, although tolerated by her husband for almost 20 years, brought down on them the wrath of Victorian society. The strict moral codes of their time became oppressive for them, and it's this that Mill refers to when he condemns the tyranny of the majority in On Liberty. As a result of this experience, Mill rejected the uniformity and the conformity preached by any strict code of social conduct, whether taught by a church or by a Benthamite. He became instead a champion of diversity and of versatility and above all of an individual's freedom of choice. So in his autobiography, when he explains the main purpose of writing on liberty, he relates that the book attempted to show, he says, the importance to man and society of a large variety in types of character and of giving full freedom to human nature to expand itself in innumerable and conflicting directions, lest society should impose on mankind an oppressive yoke of uniformity in opinion and practice. When we turn to the inscription of On Liberty, it's no surprise that Mill dedicates it to Harriet Taylor in the most effusive terms as the inspiration of all that's the best in his writings, a person of, he says, unrivaled wisdom. So let's look at how Mill develops his theory of freedom in On Liberty. And after tracing that argument, see how it applies to our own thinking about freedom today in America, keeping in mind all the time that this was the main purpose behind his book, to champion the idea of diversity in society, to oppose moral codes of morality, codes of morality that would, in the strict way that he so abhorred, deprive an individual of their own spheres of his or her own sphere of privacy. In the opening sentence of On Liberty, Mill announces that the subject of the book is civil and social liberty, or he says, the nature and limits of the power which can be legitimately exercised by society over the individual. And this is indeed the main theme that Mill consistently follows throughout the book. Almost like a physician, he sees and diagnoses a problem and then prescribes a remedy for it. He begins by describing the social problem of his era and then prescribes a way of treating it. That is, the problem is the attempt by society to make individuals conform to a code of behavior, no matter how irrational or silly that code may be, and the solution is to preserve and then enlarge the realm of individual freedom. Mill sets up the logic of the problem and its solution in the introduction 
to On Liberty. He says, The tyranny of the majority means that when society, as opposed to just the state, is itself the tyrant, when it issues mandates in things with which it ought not to meddle, then it practices a social tyranny more formidable than political oppression because it leaves fewer means of escape penetrating much more deeply into the details of life and enslaving the soul itself. Protection, therefore, against the tyranny of the magistrate is not enough. There needs protection against the tyranny of the prevailing opinion and feeling, against the tendency of society to impose by other means than civil liberties, its own ideas and practices as rules of conduct on those who dissent from them, to fetter the development and, if possible, prevent the formation of any individuality not in harmony with its own ways, and compels all characters to fashion themselves upon the model of its own. There's a limit to the legitimate interference of collective opinion with individual independence, and to find that limit and maintain it against encroachment is as indispensable to a condition of a good condition of human affairs as protection against political despotism. Now, that opening statement, a powerful one, the indictment of the tyranny of the majority, and again, we want to examine it as closely as we can. When he talks about the tyranny of the majority, as opposed to just the state, he's signaling his own view of freedom. Previously, English theorists like Locke had stressed the need for political freedom. Mill is now insisting that the sphere of political freedom must be expanded to include social freedom, that is, the right of the individual to resist codes of moral behavior or the will of society to set up as an idol uh, the ideal of conformity. When he says that when society is itself the tyrant, by issuing mandates, controlling human behavior, and practicing a social tyranny, enslaving the soul itself, he is setting forth a, an indictment that's severe, but a true one. I remember when I was lecturing on this several years ago, and a student in my class said afterwards that he had appreciated what I was saying, but not fully until an experience that he had soon after the lecture. He said that he was gay, but had had trouble coming out of the closet, as we say, and confiding even to his closest friends his homosexuality. He was walking in Greenwich Village with a friend, close friend, and they passed a group of gays coming towards them, and the friend turned to him and said, I hate these queers. I wish that AIDS would get all of them. And Danny said that his guts just went into a, a wrench, and unable to break the silence that he knew he should, he kept walking and hated himself for it. He said that he kept thinking of those lines from Mills on Liberty about the tyranny of the majority and the way in which it enslaves the soul itself, setting forth a kind of behavior that is so difficult to break, so difficult to challenge. And it was at that moment, he said, that Mill became real to him. Now, Mill says that we have to set up a protection against this kind of invasiveness. And think of the contrast here between Mill and Hegel. Mill is entering a whole realm of freedom now that is so different from what Hegel had spoken of. Uh, Mill says that the protection must be made on the basis of a principle. And that principle must establish a limit to the legitimate interference of collective opinion with individual independence. So the purpose of the book now, after having indicated the problem, is to turn to the solution. And the solution is to determine that principle that will establish the limit. 
It is that uh, that Mill now um, decides that he must do. By finding, by maintaining a limit on social interference, Mill means that he wants to to establish a principle that will maintain the sanctity of individual free expression. Later in the introduction, he asserts this principle, and it is, all, it is that the only justification which any society has for restricting social freedom, or for restricting individual freedom, is if the individual clearly threatens harm to society. Now, what does this mean? It means that society is not justified in enforcing a code of morality or social behavior because they feel that the individual will harm himself or herself, as, for example, say, drinking alcohol or smoking cigarettes, or to prohibit deviant sexual behavior that does not harm others, or religious belief or offensive speech or dress, again, so long as it does not actually inflict harm on others. Now, this principle must apply to the protection of individual liberty in the broadest sense, and Mill lists all the particular freedoms that he wants ensured. That is, freedom of thought, freedom of feeling, freedom of opinion, freedom of conscience on all subjects, and the freedom to publish these ideas. Freedom of the most eccentric tastes, preferences, Freedom to plan our own lives as we deem desirable, even though this may seem foolish or self-destructive to others. Freedom of assembly, of petition, all the other civil liberties that are listed in our own Bill of Rights. Because freedom means, Mill says, in his own words, to pursue our own good in our own way, so long as we do not deprive others of their freedom or harm their efforts. Now, Mill repeatedly says that the only justification for restricting liberty or punishing a person for wrong behavior is if it causes harm to society. But what exactly does Mill mean by doing harm? What sort of conduct, we can ask Mill, must be deemed harmful? Mill says that, again to quote from Liberty, no person ought to be punished simply for being drunk because that in itself is not doing social harm. But a soldier or a policeman should be punished for being drunk on duty. Or we might say uh, alcoholism itself shouldn't be punished. But driving a car while under the influence of alcohol certainly should be. Uh, sometimes the lines are extraordinarily difficult to draw between behavior that is harmful and behavior that is just a nuisance, not substantially harmful to society. And I recall several years ago, before I moved into Manhattan and commuted regularly to uh, New Jersey and then back to where I teach at Barnard in New York, spent a lot of time on the bus commuting back and forth. And one time when I was preparing my mill lecture on the bus, reading On Liberty, I noticed something that uh, helped me understand, perhaps, how I could get the idea across better to my students. I noticed that I was, as I was sitting on the bus, uh, that uh, the man next to me was picking his nose and relishing it. And as I sort of watched in fascination uh, this, I began to think, well, what would Mill say about that? And then just as I, just as I was uh, wrapped in that thought, a woman sitting across the aisle lit up a cigarette. And uh, the, uh, she was smoking merrily away, even though no smoking signs all over on the bus. And uh, I thought to myself, well, what would Mill think of that? So I came to the conclusion that I could speak to the woman and ask her to put out the cigarette, because with all of the evidence that we have about side stream smoke, et cetera, uh, also because it was against the law to smoke on the bus, it was legitimate for me to, on million grounds, to suggest that she was perhaps doing harm to society by smoking. 
if she had been smoking by herself out of range, side stream smoke, etc., then it would have been more difficult for me to make that claim, although, of course, those of us who are opposed to cigarette smoking can make the claim that it raises our insurance rates, all society, etc. But in this case, we're speaking only of how far her smoking on that bus tended to jeopardize my health, and I felt that I could speak to her. I felt that I couldn't speak to the guy next to me picking his nose. Because no matter how much watching a person pick his nose vigorously might make one ill and bring on physical harm in that sense, it's too much to try to enforce that degree of social behavior. And we have friends coming from the far corners of the country uh, to New York City, and we take them on tours of Greenwich Village, our favorite place in Manhattan. And there are friends who object vigorously to the green hair or the blue hair of people walking around St. Mark's. That kind of objection, which they insist makes them ill, they're so revulsed by that kind of behavior among our young people, that, again, impossible to enforce. We cannot sweep through Greenwich Village and insist that all people have their hair worn in a certain way or a certain color. Where are the lines, then, as we try to draw them between what is harmful and not harmful? Part of it is what is enforceable and not enforceable. But Mill's point is this that we must try to build evidence before we restrict someone's behavior, that that behavior is actually inflicting physical harm on others. Whether or not the definition should encompass mental harm, psychological harm, that we'll be coming to in a moment when we consider the application of Mill's principles to Supreme Court decisions in the United States and cases that come up there. But for the present, we're concerned with this. And that is, in our everyday personal behavior, what do we say about the freedom of another individual as we move through life? This is not Hegelian. This is very practical. This is a question of how we behave sitting next to an individual on a bus or walking through the villages, uh, walking through the streets of Greenwich Village. We may have one sexual preference or another. This is very personal. And Mill meant it to be personal because he had suffered as a person so much at the hands of a kind of morality, a restrictive behavior that, from his point of view, undermined the very bases of liberty in a free society. I think that when we look at Mill's argument, we must be impressed with the systematic nature of what he's trying to set forth. He's concerned, as we must be concerned, over the core issue of freedom, as freedom is related to moral values. And the core issue for Mill as a philosopher is especially the free expression of ideas and opinions. Most of On Liberty is concerned with how to protect and enlarge this kind of freedom, that is, freedom of opinion, freedom of ideas. And Mill states his case, I think, eloquently on this point. In one of the more renowned passages in On Liberty, he says this, if all mankind minus one were of one opinion, and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person then he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. I must say, if only Hegel would have written with that clarity, we could applaud, uh, perhaps, uh, his philosophy more than we do. Not to downplay Hegel's influence, particularly in terms of nationalism and the freedom of the nation-state, but Mill is speaking here a language, maybe it's the bright and glorious language of English philosophy, and, but nevertheless, it's a language that we can grasp, understand. And he's speaking here of the sanctity of individual free expression. And he makes now an absolute and unyielding case in terms of his, his argument for freedom of opinion and freedom of ideas. Were an opinion, he continues in the same passage, a personal possession of no value except to the owner, 
If to be obstructed in the enjoyment of it were simply a private injury, it would make some difference whether the injury was inflicted only on a few persons or on many. But the peculiar evil of silencing the expression of an opinion is that it's robbing the human race, posterity as well as the existing generation, those who dissent from the opinion still more than those who hold it. If the opinion is right, they are deprived of the opportunity of exchanging error for truth. If wrong, they lose what is almost as great a benefit, the clearer perception and livelier impression of truth produced by its collision with error. And we'll be coming back to several of these points as we move along, particularly Mill's concept of truth emerging as a result of conflict between truth and error. But note the way in which in this passage he values ideas. As he says, if an idea were merely a personal possession or property of no value, then that would be one thing to suppress it. But it's not. An idea is a value for all of society. An idea can, from Mill's point of view, oppose the worst excesses or falsehoods or whatever and overturn them in time. And when he enunciates that belief in the power of ideas, I think he speaks to the heart of our own culture, the point that I was making at the very outset, and that is the idea of freedom is, for Mill, a vigorous concept that is alive and that will spread if we will only give it the chance. So Mill takes off from this point to make an extended defense of free expression and especially uh, the right to dissent. The argument that he makes is a careful one and it deserves close attention. Mill says that we may imagine three cases where the question of suppressing a dissenting opinion might arise. First, if the dissenting opinion is true, as for example the opinions of Socrates or Copernicus or Galileo when they were first advanced, and in this case, Mill says, it's obviously wrong to suppress a true opinion, so there can be no justification for that. The second case is much more difficult to decide, and this is when the dissenting opinion is false as, for example, in a community that enjoys social, tolerate, social tolerance, bigots emerge to preach anti-Semitism. Mill's position here is what we shall see in a moment was reiterated in America by the Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, and this is, the position is, that falsehood must be exposed to public view and subjected to debate because suppression can only feed it and the truer opinion then becomes dead dogma, unchallenged and ignored. And then there's the third case, which Mill says is the most frequent one. Remember the three cases. One is the dissenting opinion is clearly true, and the dissenting opinion is false. The third case is uh, more common, and that is when there are several conflicting opinions and no one is entirely true or false. The truth is distributed among them. Or as Mill writes, one part of the truth sets while another rises. In this case, Mill says, it's essential to maintain free expression because a society learns to tell truth from error by continually being subjected to a clash of ideas, not one monotone of public opinion. Mill states his view of truth clearly when he says that truth is so much a question of the reconciling and the combining of opposites that its determination has to be made by the rough process of a struggle between combatants fighting under hostile banners. This statement is a suggestion of one way that he is like Hegel and that is he does in characteristic Western form, he does sanction conflict and from conflict we will move into a state of progress. The conflict, of course, has to be politicized. 
He is not for violent conflict. In any case, as Hegel was for violent conflict, that is a clash between states, the conflict is among ideas. And Mill says the truth can only emerge if there is a genuine conflict. And note the strength with which he states this. And that is, truth is so much a question of reconciling and combining of opposites, determination has to be made by the rough process of a struggle between combatants fighting under hostile banners. So that kind of contest is essential in order for truth to emerge. Now, Mill's view of truth is unlike Hegel's view of truth. I characterize Hegel's view of truth as truth possessed, to use a phrase that applies to a number of political theorists. Mill's view of truth I characterize as truth pursued rather than truth possessed. And that is, we are in a process, a liberal process, of struggling for greater and greater truth. Mill himself obviously wouldn't have claimed to possess any truth at that particular time, any final and ultimate truth, because truth must evolve. And it must re re evolve, note, as a result of this rough process. There must be, then, parties on one hand arguing with parties on the other in the way if you've watched British Parliament, parliamentary proceedings, uh, there so often is. Truth possessed, then, versus truth pursued, it's striking how political theory can be divided into groups, on the one hand, that argue the truth possessed when they speak about truth, and Hegel is the quintessential expression here, as truth being God and having known it, and then the other group, uh, headed, headed especially by the liberals, uh, begun with Locke, but now in archetypal form expressed by Mill in the beginning of the 19th century. This is English liberalism at its best. The liberals look for truth in the process. Some may complain that there is never an end. That is, that they look only to the means and never the end. Uh, but Mill defends that arguing that the best that we can do is to maintain a healthy process in which there is an exchange, a true exchange of ideas. So Mill's theory of liberty is that free expression of ideas and opinions must be preserved as a kind of sacred task in all cases. And so this is an absolute defense of free thought as long as it does not inflict harm on others. He asserts a belief in the value of ideas for any society, but ideas that remain in continuing conflict in a state of competition. That is what he likes to call a free marketplace of ideas. So that's the essence of On Liberty. And he makes this case, citing historical examples, arguing for the defense of freedom in this way, a case, it seems to me, that is directly opposed, not only to Hegel, certainly is, but also to Rousseau. We have Mill never insisting on equality, by the way, as Rousseau did, but always insisting that the growth of equality may threat, threaten or thwart the growth of liberty. So he's not concerned about creating, as Locke was not concerned, a class-less society. That's not his task. He's not in any way a socialist and not subscribing to the goal of egalitarianism that Rousseau did. So there will be as sharp a contrast between Mill and Hegel as there was between Mill and Marx. Marx being another truth-possessed figure who believes that the truth shall set us free, but Marx knowing what the truth was and willing to free or emancipate people on the basis of their acquisition of that truth. From Mill's point of view, he is not setting forth the truth the final truth, as Marx and Hegel did. He is setting forth only the process. Now, keeping in mind that as the essential argument in liberty, let's turn to uh, the defense of civil liberties in the United States, because uh, that, it seems to me, is a clear expression of what Mill was about. And let's look at a couple of uh, landmark Supreme Court decisions, especially to that set forth by Oliver Wendell Holmes. Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, a million to the core, was a Supreme Court justice, as you know, in the United States from 1902 to 1932. And in one of his opinions, 
in Skink versus the United States. He expressed a, a judgment that was relevant to our study of Mill. Skink was a member of the Socialist Party. He was convicted of distributing subversive literature to men awaiting induction to the United States Armed Forces for World War I. Holmes and the court viewed this in a majority decision as a threat to the nation during wartime, ruling that, quote, the character of every act depends on the circumstances in which it is done. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. That's giving us one of the famous images from Supreme Court judgments, and that is your right to free speech is not protected if in a crowded theater you suddenly get the idea, hey, I'll cry fire and see what happens and stir up some activity. That is not permissible. The question in every case Holmes says, is whether the words used are used in such circumstances and are of such a nature as to create a clear and present danger. When a nation is at war, many things that might be said in times of peace are such a hindrance to its effort that their utterance will not be endured so long as men fight and no court could regard them as protected by any constitutional right. But only eight months later, in another case, Abrams versus the United States, Holmes wrote in, this, in a dissenting opinion now, a powerful defense of free speech. Abrams was a Russian anarchist convicted of distributing leaflets that condemned the U.S. for sending troops into Russia following the Bolshevik Revolution. Holmes could not view this as a clear and present danger to the United States. Of course, the war is over now. He wrote, when men have realized that time has upset many fighting faiths, they may come to believe even more than they believe the very foundations of their own conduct, that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade in ideas, that the best test of truth is the power of thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that truth is the only ground upon which their wishes can be safely carried out. That, at any rate, is the theory of our Constitution. We should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death, unless they are so imminently thre a threat to immediate interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. Ten years later, in another court decision, Holmes once again defended free speech, saying if there is any principle of the Constitution that more imperatively calls for attachment than any other, it is the principle of free thought, not free thought for who agree with us, but freedom of thought for the thought that we hate. Freedom of thought for the thought that we hate. Holmes summarizes Mill's position then clearly. Now, the question from Holmes's point of view is whether or not there is a clear and present danger to the safety, to the security of the nation or society. If that can be established, fine. Then free speech may be restricted. But if it cannot, then we defend freedom of thought for the thought that we hate. Now, one famous uh, case of this occurred in the Skokie uh, instance where uh, in Skokie, Illinois, Frank Collin, head of the U.S. Nazi Party, asked to hold a rally. Um, every attempt was made to suppress him, and Collin took his case to court. In that case, several Jewish groups of Skokie claimed that a Nazi demonstration constituted menticide or infliction of mental harm. The decision never got to the Supreme Court, but the Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit of Illinois ruled for Collin on the basis of First Amendment freedom and said this, above all else, the First Amendment means that government has no power to restrict expression because of its message, its ideas, its subject matter, or its content. To assure self-fulfillment for each individual, our people are guaranteed the right to express any thought free from government censorship. Under the First Amendment, there is no such thing as a false idea. On the competition of other ideas, every person must be his own watchman for truth because the forefathers did not trust any government to separate for us the true 
from the false. That comes in the process. Well, I think this is how Mill's idea of freedom applies to the United States, as interpreted by our highest courts, or especially by Holmes. Mill's defense of liberty insisted on a marketplace of free exchange of ideas. In order to maintain the freedom of this exchange, we must allow for competition among all elements, those that we like and those that we dislike. True ideas, if we can call them that, exist to be challenged. Hateful ideas exist to keep the conflict alive, or else we'll all fall into an intellectual stupor. And as we slumber, the worst ideas may take over because we have not been inoculated to protect ourselves from the virus. The virus of, say, Nazism by exposure in smaller doses. And so we defend freedom for the thought that we hate. Lecture 5, Emma Goldman and the Anarchist Idea of Freedom. I've chosen Emma Goldman to represent the Anarchist Idea of Freedom in this fifth lecture on Emma Goldman and Anarchism because I feel she's by far the most articulate anarchist of this century. She's an extraordinary theorist as well as an activist who gave new meaning to the philosophy of freedom in this century by applying principles of anarchism to the liberation of women as well as to men. Now, as we move into this second half of the lecture series on freedom, we've reached the 20th century. And all four of the people that we'll discuss in this latter part of the series are of this century. Uh, they're also all activists as well as important thinkers in pursuit of freedom. None of the first four activists that we, none of the first four theorists rather that we treated, Locke, Rousseau, Hegel, and Mill, uh, none was an activist. Uh, they were scholars, they were writers, content to present their theories without leading political movements to put them into practice. But the four figures that we turn to now, that is, Goldman and Gandhi, King and Malcolm X, these are all firebrands of a sort. They're intent on going to the barricades, to go there to lead either a violent or a nonviolent struggle for freedom. There's another way that these four are uh, unlike the first four that we discussed. This latter group are all either women or people of color. They understand freedom from the perspective of oppressed groups, groups persecuted because of gender or race. They're much more impatient than the first set. They want freedom and they want it now. And they claim to speak for oppressed humanity. Emma Goldman is the first woman, the first American, the first anarchist that we've discussed so far, and she brings us into the 20th century by introducing some of the major concerns of our era. We may say that the 19th century gave us three distinct philosophies of freedom that came to influence the 20th century. The first expounded especially by Hegel, was that of nationalism. It focused on the role of the state as an agent of freedom, and it became an important ideological source of nationalist movements in the 20th century, whether those movements were communist or fascist. 
It saw the state as a key force of revolutionary change. Indeed, the state became an indispensable force of revolutionary change for these unprecedented mass movements. <clears throat> the second philosophy of freedom, which was expressed eloquently by John Stuart Mill, became that of liberalism. Its defining feature was and is today a defense of civil liberties against the encroachment of both state and society. The freedom of individual expression of ideas and opinions is held as sacred from this point of view, and it is most opposed to the philosophy of nationalism when the state threatens to deprive the individual of his or her liberties and civil rights. The third philosophy of freedom that began in the 19th century and then developed further in the 20th is that of anarchism. And this is expressed best in America by Emma Goldman. Anarchism is totally opposed to any form of state authority. And so it rejects the claim of nationalism emphatically that the state may be an agent of freedom. But anarchism also rejects liberalism because anarchists believe that liberals just don't go far enough in the struggle for freedom. From the anarchist point of view, liberals like Mill trust the law too much. They rely far too much on constitutional guarantees for civil rights. Anarchists then reject the entire system of government, presently at least, as authoritarian and hierarchical. They demand instead either a violent or a nonviolent revolution to overturn the whole establishment, and especially the class structure, to organize a free society based on equality without hierarchy. The main principle of anarchism then is resistance to authority because authority as it's structured today, deprives us of free thought and expression. Now, these were Emma Goldman's beliefs. And in a few minutes, I want to examine her philosophy of anarchism more closely. But first, it's important to understand where Emma Goldman was coming from in her determination to resist authority. And this requires that we look at her own account in her autobiography of her childhood because it's there in her book entitled Living My Life that she describes how she was born in Russia in 1869 and how before the family emigrated to Rochester, New York, when she was 17, she received the harshest treatment as a child from her father, a treatment that instilled in her a desire to rebel. I'll read from her autobiography at some length because her childhood experience is so crucial for the later formation of her anarchist theory. She begins in describing her early years. My ghastly childhood stood before me, my hunger for affection, which mother was unable to satisfy, and father's harshness towards the children, his violent outbreaks, his beating my sisters and me. Two frightful experiences were particularly fresh in my mind. Once father lashed me with a strap so that my young brother Herman, awakened by my cries, came running up and bit father on the leg. The lashing stopped. Helena, my older sister, took me to her room, bathed my bruised back, brought me milk, held me to her heart, tears mingling with mine, while father outside was raging, I'll kill her, I'll kill that brat, I'll teach her to obey. Another time, my people, who were too poor to afford decent schooling for Herman and myself, sent me to another school. The city's rabbi, a distant relative had promised to arrange the matter, but he insisted on monthly reports of our behavior and progress at school. I hated this reporting as a humiliation that outraged me, but I had to carry the report back home each time. One day I was given a low mark for bad behavior. I went home trembling in fear. I could not face father. 
I showed my paper to mother. She began to cry, said that I would be their ruin, that I was an ungrateful and willful child, and that she would have to let father see the paper. But she would plead with him for me, although I didn't deserve it. I walked away from her with a heavy heart. At our bay window, I looked out over the fields in the distance. Children were playing there. They seemed to belong to another world. There had never been much play in my life. A strange thought came to me. How wonderful it would be if I were stricken with some consuming disease. It would surely soften Father's heart. I had never known him soft, save on Sukkoth, the autumnal holiday of rejoicing. Father didn't drink much, except on Sukkoth. Then he would grow jolly, gather the children about him, promise us new dresses and toys. It was the one bright spot in our lives, and we always looked eagerly forward to it. It happened, though, only once a year. As long as I could think back, I remembered him saying that he had not wanted me. He had wanted a boy. Perhaps if I should become very ill then, near death, he would become kind and never beat me again or let me stand in the corner for hours or make me walk back and forth with a glass of water in my hand. If you spill a single drop, you'll get whipped, he'd threaten. The whip and the little stool were always at hand. They symbolized my shame and my tragedy. After many attempts and considerable punishment, I had learned to carry the glass without spilling the water. The process, though, unnerved me and made me ill for hours. My father was handsome. He was dashing. He was full of vitality. I loved him even while I was terrified of him. I wanted him to love me, but I never knew how to reach his heart. When we contrast this with the autobiography of John Stuart Mill and the treatment that he received from his father, fathers don't do well in many of these autobiographies, I'm afraid. Uh, but this is extreme, and these lines always bring a lump to my throat. I never knew how to reach his heart. This is Emma Goldman's splendid autobiography, Living My Life. She goes on, his hardness served, though, only to make me more contrary. Why was he so hard? I was wondering as I looked at this moment out of the bay window, lost in recollections. Suddenly I felt a terrific pain in my head as if I had been struck with an iron bar. It was father's fist that had smashed the round comb I wore to hold my unruly air. He pounded me and pulled me about raging. You're a disgrace. You'll always be so. You can't be my child. You don't look like me. You don't look like your mother. You don't act like us. Sister Helena wrestled with him for my life. This is a, a constant theme in the autobiography, the way she is rescued by women. We'll see how she's rescued by Joanna Gree in a moment, a, an anarchist thinker. But Sister Helen is an absolutely indispensable source in this family for relief, for tenderness. And it's Sister Helena now who comes to her rescue. Helena tried to tear me away from father's grip, and the blows intended for me fell upon her. At last, father became tired, grew dizzy, and fell headlong to the floor. Helena shouted to mother that father had fainted, so she hurried me along to her room and locked the door. And so that was how all my love and longing for my father, my handsome father, turned to hatred. After that, I avoided him and never talked to him except in answer. I did what I was told mechanically. The gulf between us widened with the years. My home had become a prison. We want to emphasize that many children, male and female, are treated this way. But this is the first woman that we've treated in this series. And uh, this father is seen now as a source of male authority. And that kind of authority from Emma Goldman's point of view will be, for the rest of her life, illegitimate. She continues, I had learned since then that my tragic childhood had been no exception that there were thousands of women, of children born unwanted, 
marred and maimed by poverty, and still more by ignorant misunderstanding. No child of mine should ever be added to those unfortunate victims. I would find an outlet for my mother need then in the love of all children. And she tells a splendid story of how she determined to become a midwife so that she would be at least involved in some way in bringing new life into the world. And she said at that point, I want to deliver a thousand children. And as each one arrives, I want to whisper into her tender little ear, Rebel! Rebel! <laughs> and then she relates in her autobiography of how at age 18, she attended a political speech in Rochester by an anarchist named Joanna Gree. Joanna Gree delivered a rousing defense of a group of anarchists in Chicago who had been unjustly condemned to death for a crime that they hadn't committed. The event, probably heard of in American history, the Haymarket Riot of 1886. Joanna Gree's speech would mark a turning point in Emma Goldman's life, converting her to the cause of anarchism. She relates the impact on her of this speech at that time. At the end of Agree's speech, I knew what I had surmised all along. The Chicago men that had been convicted, condemned, were in fact innocent. They were to be hanged for their ideal. But what was their ideal? The papers called these men anarchists, bomb throwers. What was anarchism? It was all very puzzling, but I had no time for further contemplation. The people were follow, filing out of the lecture hall, and I got up to leave. Gree, the chairman, and a group of friends were still on the platform. As I turned towards them, I saw Joanna Gree motioning to me. I was startled. My heart beat violently. My feet felt leaden. When I approached her, she took me by the hand and said, I never saw a face that reflected such a tumult of emotion as yours. You must be feeling the impending tragedy intensely. Do you happen to know the men? In a trembling voice, I replied to her, Unfortunately not, but I do feel the case with every fiber of my being, and when I heard you speak, it seemed as if I did know them. She put her hand on my shoulder. I have a feeling that you will know them better as you learn their ideal of anarchism and that you'll make their cause your own. I walked home as if in a dream. Sister Helen was already asleep, but I had to share my experience with her. I woke her up and recited to her the whole story, giving almost a verbatim account of the speech. I must have been very dramatic because Helen exclaimed, the next thing I'll hear about my little sister is that she, too, is a dangerous anarchist. Well, Emma Goldman became a dangerous anarchist, an anarchist regarded by the government as terrifying. She moved to Greenwich Village, of course, the heart always of anarchism. She joined with other anarchists there to promote causes such as better work conditions for women seamstresses, which were desperately needed at that time. She soon became one of the most inspiring orators of her time. In 1893, she was imprisoned for a speech that tried to incite the unemployed of New York City to riot. Again, in 1901, she was imprisoned for her radical politics. Finally, in 1917, for opposing American involvement in World War I. As one of her biographers, Alex Shulman, says, Emma Goldman delighted in heresy, practicing free love to Puritans, atheism to Christians and Jews alike, revolution to conservatives, and pacifism to soldiers. She once said, the more opposition I encountered, the more I felt as though I was in my element. There's one story that I like that's related about Emma Goldman's influence as an orator. It's about an army private, William Buwalda, 
He was for shaking Emma Goldman's hand following a lecture she delivered on patriotism in San Francisco in 1908, arrested, court-martialed, dishonorably discharged, and sentenced to five years of hard labor in Alcatraz. The general who presided at William Bewalda's trial named his crime, quote, shaking hands with that dangerous anarchist woman. Bewalda, a soldier for 15 years, once decorated for faithful service, had known nothing about anarchism at the time, but had attended Goldman's lecture out of sheer curiosity. Ten months after his sentence, he was pardoned by President Theodore Roosevelt. Upon his release from prison, he sent his medal back to the army with a letter explaining that he had no further use for such garbage. Give it to someone who will appreciate it more than I do. And then he joined the anarchist movement. <laughs> you know, this is a, a tribute to Emma Goldman's extraordinary influence as an orator and in newspaper report after report. Whether Emma Goldman is speaking in Washington Square, giving forth the theories of anarchism and the practice of rebellion, or whether she is touring the country in the Midwest or in the West Coast, she is amazing as an orator. We look to her as much as to any individual then as a certain as a person who can inspire an audience. And we only wish that we had films of her performance. Now the theory of anarchism that Emma Goldman eventually developed and tried to practice until her death may be summarized, I think, in well, three main principles, and let's discuss each one of these. It's often said that anarchism is an indefinable political philosophy, and sometimes it's not studied seriously precisely because of that, but this is wrong. Anarchism, it's true, preaches diversity to such an extent that there are so many different kinds of anarchists uh, that it is difficult to find common ground among them all. But in fact, there are at least three principles that they all agree on, and I think that these distinguish the anarchists, as we'll see from other schools of thought, not only in broad terms, but in specific terms about their thinking of freedom. Now, first, there is the principle of human nature. It's sometimes said to discredit anarchists that they are naive, gullible, because the ideal society that they set forth depends so heavily on the benevolence of human nature and that humans are simply not that way. They're aggressive and unfriendly creatures bent on hostility and competition. Now, the anarchist's point of view when they look at human nature is that, sure, look around us. Individuals may be creatures bent on hostility and aggression. However, that behavior is socialized. It's not genetic. There is not despite Freud's claim to the contrary, there is not an aggressive element within us uh, that is inherent and irremediable, fixed in human nature. The point that the anarchists make about human nature then is that it's plastic, it's flexible. What we have with human nature is a initially blank tablet and we try to socialize that tablet in terms of shaping it one way or another. And for the most part, in a competitive capitalist society, for example, individuals are given to competition and aggression. So human nature, first point is, is not a fixed static quantity. It is, determ it is not determined by innate aggressive drives that do us to war and eternal conflict. Human nature is dynamic, it's capable of change, it can learn and grow. Now, this view of human nature is the basis of Emma Goldman's optimism. She believed that in decades and centuries to come, we can learn to be cooperative and caring, to develop a sharing and a loving attitude toward others. She insisted that it depended upon early childhood upbringing. And uh, she devotes so much of her own autobiography to her own early childhood upbringing because she felt that she was a product of that. So when she writes about human nature, she says, what about then our anarchist belief of human nature? 
Can human nature be changed? That is the question. With human nature caged as it is today in such a narrow space, whipped daily into submission, how can we speak of its potential? But let it be free. Freedom can teach us the dynamic forces of human nature and all of its wonderful potentialities. And so the second of the three principles that we go to when we talk about anarchism is inevitably and necessarily the principle of freedom. Emma Goldman's favorite theme in her writing is freedom. She attacked oppression in all of its forms. She wrote this about her ideal of freedom. Our true liberation individual and collective, lies in our emancipation from authority and from our belief in authority. Political absolutism has been abolished because men have realized in the course of time that absolute power is evil and destructive. But the same thing is true of all power, whether it be the power of privilege, of money, of the priest, of the politician, or even of so-called democracy. In its effects on individuality, it matters little what the particular character of coercion is, whether it be as black as fascism, as yellow as Nazism, or as pretentiously red as, Bol as Bolshevism. It's a power that corrupts and degrades both master and slave. And it makes no difference whether the power is wielded by an autocrat, by parliament, or by Soviets. More pernicious than the power of a dictator is the power of a class. The most terrible of all is the tyranny of a majority. Now there, of course, Emma Goldman has read John Stuart Mill, influenced by Mill to a certain degree, and repeats his phrase because she is convinced that that kind of tyranny can be the worst of all. We are reaching out, she continues, for the wider scope of human relations which liberty alone can give. And now she comes to her precise definition of freedom. For true liberty is not a mere scrap of paper called a constitution. True liberty is more than that defined as a legal right or freedom under law. It is not an abstraction derived from the non-reality known as the state. It is not the negative thing of being free from something because with such freedom you may starve to death. Emma Goldman liked to repeat the anarchist adage that came to her from the 19th century when an anarchist said that the rich and poor alike have the freedom to sleep in the streets at night. It's just that the rich don't take advantage of that freedom. <laughs> so with such freedom, that is with John Stuart Mill's freedom, you may starve to death because as we saw, Mill was not concerned about equality. The anarchists bring to the fore Rousseau's key doctrine about the necessary relationship between freedom and equality. So then she continues, real freedom, true freedom then, is not negative but positive. Now note here how she uses, she's well read obviously in political theory, and she deliberately uses the Hegelian terms, negative and positive. Now recall for Hegel, when he distinguished between these two terms, negative freedom was, from his point of view, whim and caprice. And he puts down Locke's and the kind of freedom that Mill is to adopt after him. That kind of freedom is negative because it's simply a freedom uh, that is equated with license. It gives you the permission to do as you wish. And from Hegel's point of view, that's no freedom at all. Now, Emma Goldman specifically says that freedom is not negative freedom. And she, she again then is putting down Mill's kind of freedom. Negative freedom is not enough for her. It is positive. 
but how different her concept of freedom is from Hegel's concept of freedom. Positive freedom means the liberty to actually do something. It's the liberty to be. In short, above all, it is the liberty to have the power to take advantage of an actual and active opportunity. So we make this important connection that Rousseau had made between liberty and equality. But even more than that, we have now the concept of power, that is that all individuals must have equal power, not the hierarchical system of power that she deplores, but an equal power to do, to take advantage, to take the opportunities that they need. So what is she saying? She's saying that, once again, the liberal concept of freedom is not enough. We must have more than that. We must guarantee both liberty and equality. That sort of liberty is not a gift. It is the natural right of man, of every human being, and it cannot be given. It cannot be conferred by any law or any government. The need of it, the longing for it, is inherent in every individual. Disobedience to every form of coercion, then, is the instinctive expression of it. Rebellion and revolution more or less conscious, must be our attempt to achieve it. What do we have? We have now at this point, then, three definitions of freedom among the three people that we've dealt with, Hegel, Mill, and Goldman. And let's stop and give each definition as precisely as possible, as clearly as possible, because we're at a point now as we move into the 20th century where these three definitions of freedom become extraordinarily important for influencing or inspiring mass movements. Now, the first definition of freedom is Hegel's definition of freedom. Now, that is the nationalist definition of freedom. Freedom, according to Hegel, as we've seen, is to know the truth. And for Hegel, the truth is capitalized as it was for Marx, that is, truth possessed rather than truth pursued. There's no question in Marx's mind, Marx was overwhelmingly influenced by Hegel, even though he threw off the nationalism part. Marx took Hegel's concept of freedom, and there's no question in Marx's mind, too, that the truth shall make you free, and that he had a precise definition of the truth. And what is that truth? The truth is consciousness of God's design in history, an awareness of God's plan. For Marx, it became an awareness of the communist view of history. This, Hegel said, and this is the important part that was to influence both communism and fascism. Hegel's influence in the 20th century is just overwhelming because he was influencing the left as well as the right with his doctrine of fascism. This is gained only through the state because the state is the agent of God and the highest expression of spiritual freedom and moral authority. And that's Hegel's definition of freedom. And throughout the, world, throughout the world, that the huge mass movements that occurred in China and the Soviet Union especially, we must conclude that Hegel's definition of freedom has been the most influential in terms of influencing hundreds of millions of people. And I'm thinking especially of the Chinese Communist Revolution. Now, in terms of Mill, there are second definition of freedom. Freedom for Mill is, and we can state this very quickly because it is so eminently clear, thank goodness, freedom is, as we saw, just an individual's ability to think, to act, or behave as one wishes without obstruction. It's justifiably limited, as we saw, only if that behavior harms another person. And uh, that's it. And now we go to Goldman's definition. Goldman takes this position. And remember, when she takes a position, she takes that position vehemently. Emma Goldman is never halfway in any consideration of other political theorists. So when she talks about Hegel, she said Hegel is not only wrong, he's just not talking about freedom. He's only justifying, from his point of view, from his class point of view, the subjection of the individual to state authority. And that's nothing but another form of slavery. 
So she dismisses Hegel completely, even though Hegel thinks he's talking about freedom. He uses the word over again in his writings. He writes chapter after chapter in the philosophy of history that concerns freedom. He thinks he is. From Goldman's point of view, it's a big mistake. It's all a hoax. It's a bogus way to approach the concept of freedom. She says that Mill is at least on the right track, but he goes wrong, and very badly wrong, in one respect, and that is in not demanding both freedom and equality. Because no one is free unless all are free. So freedom for Emma Goldman insists on economic power for men and women, men and women, to realize opportunities for a full life. Now, it would be obviously unfair to John Stuart Mill to say that he didn't consider women. We think, thanks to Harriet Taylor, according to John Stuart Mill at least, that he wrote The Subjection of Women, which was a brilliant piece in defense of women's rights, written early on in the 19th century. And uh, there's a tribute to John Stuart Mill that he did that. But from Emma Goldman's point of view, we need to smash the class structures so that we will get true equality. Goldman wanted human liberation, and not just the liberation of women. But she spoke, she wrote passionately about the plight of women in particular, and she focused on the issue of birth control as particularly relevant for women's liberation. Is it conceivable that in Washington Square in the early 1900s when Emma Goldman was preaching and speaking for birth control that she was thrown into prison for that crime for describing quite explicitly the way to practice birth control seen as obscene and suffered in prison? Inconceivable it seems to me from one who loves Washington Square uh, that this could have happened, but this was the situation then. So, Candace Falk, in her exemplary biography of Emma Goldman, F-A-L-K, Falk explains her position on birth control and its relation to women's emancipation. In 1916, she says, Emma Goldman continued to wage the battle for birth control in her own way, assuring readers of Mother Earth. Mother Earth was a splendid journal that Emma Goldman wrote, edited. Emma Goldman said in Mother Earth, I may be arrested, I may be tried and thrown into jail, but I will not be silent. I never will acquiesce or submit to male authority, nor will I make peace with a system which degrades women to a mere incubator and which fattens on our innocent victims, children who become exploited workers. I now and here declare war upon this system, and I shall not rest until the path has been cleared for a free motherhood and a healthy, joyous, and happy childhood for each one of us in this society. We feel her speaking from the depths of her own unhappy childhood, but more than that she's addressing the vast problem of so many unhappy childhoods. So given the choice between a fine of $100 or 15 days in the Queens County Jail, Emma Goldman, of course, as always, opted for jail. For advocating, as Falk says, that women, quote, need not always keep their mouths shut and their wombs open, she went to prison. She always preferred, she said, the symbolic act of defiance. And besides, she wrote to a woman friend, her jail term gave her a convenient opportunity to diet. <laughs> now, in 1919, after Goldman was released from one of her prison episodes, the American government decided that she was just too much. She was too dangerous for this country. And so the government deported her to the Soviet Union, the right place for her, as the judge said. <laughs> and note, it's unthinkable that John Stuart Mill could have ever been deported anywhere. He was a member of parliament. Uh, Emma Goldman was a true rebel, and she was recognized as such. 
The Russian Revolution had occurred, of course, only two years earlier from this, in 1917, and Goldman anticipated that she would see in Lenin's revolutionary program agreement with many of her own ideals. The opposite happened. She quickly became thoroughly disillusioned with what she saw as Lenin's dictatorship, and by 1921, she fled Russia for Europe. After those two years observing firsthand the Bolshevik Revolution from 1919, when she arrived until 1921, she wrote a book called My Disillusionment in Russia, which was published in 1924. And the indictment that she made of Bolshevism uh, then in that book turned out to be extraordinarily percep perceptive and prescient because it foretold the doom of communism in Russia in 1924. Now, of course, there were a number of people claiming that communism was doomed, but this is an anarchist claiming uh, this. And for her friends on the left, she was not especially popular for making this claim. Her basic charge in the book is that Lenin and the Bolsheviks had, in the name of Marxism, pretended to be acting as liberators of the Russian people, whereas in fact they enslaved them to a party elite and despotic doctrine. Lenin cared nothing about freedom, she said. He wanted only domination, control. At the end of the book, she concentrated on one particular criticism, her view that the Bolsheviks were prepared to use any means at all in order to attain their revolutionary end of so-called communism. And this became a central theme in her later work because she felt that this was the fatal flaw in the whole revolution, that is the relationship between means and ends. And she liked the story uh, that an anarchist told about his interview with Lenin. Um, the story went that the anarchist went in to see Lenin and said, uh, Comrade Lenin, we're all, of course, revolutionaries here, but you're just going too far. Even anarchists are being imprisoned. And this was before Lenin literally massacred uh, hundreds of anarchists in Kronstadt in 1921. Um, Lenin, though, according to the story, replied impatiently to this anarchist, don't you realize, comrade, that one must break eggs in order to make an omelet? And then, of course, the anarchist answered with an immortal reply, uh, yes, I see your broken eggs everywhere, but comrade Lenin, where is the omelet? And, of course, the omelet never happened, and that was the problem. We waited all those years in the Soviet Union for the omelet to appear, and we saw only mountains of broken eggs. And that's all that the revolution ever came to. And this was Emma Goldman's way of focusing on the relationship between means and ends. Uh, that is, is it justifiable when the omelet is only, only promised to crack all of those eggs? So the importance of using the right means to achieve a specific end was stated in Emma Goldman's work in such an original, a prophetic way that it became the central element in her philosophy. And so I want to conclude with it here as the, the third and the last principle of her anarchism, that is the relationship of means to ends. We've got then the concept of human nature, the emphasis on liberty or freedom, and then finally, the relationship between means and ends. Now, Emma Goldman is not the only one to introduce this concept in the 20th century. It is important, as we'll see, in the thought of both Gandhi and Martin Luther King. But Emma Goldman's formulation is in response to Bolshevism, and this is unique. Goldman knew that Frederick Engels had expressed the Marxist view of the means-ends relationship when he wrote that, and this is the Marxist view, quote, any means that leads to the aim of communism suits me as a revolutionary, whether it is the most violent or the most peaceable. I think we can take Engels' words there to be Marx's own words. And this was Lenin's view, indisputably. Goldman believed that this justification of any means to attain an end corrupted the whole idea of revolution. And she wrote about its practice, quote, A perversion of ethical values soon crystallized 
in Russia into the all-dominant slogan of the Bolshevik party, the end justifies all means. And this is in the text capitalized and emblazoned and all the rest because she feels that this is what we must attend to. In the wake of this slogan, the end justifies the means, followed lying, deceit, hypocrisy, treachery, murder, open and secret. There is no greater fallacy than the belief that aims and purposes are one thing, while methods and tactics are another, and Lenin committed that fallacy. All human experience teaches that means cannot be separated from the ultimate end. The means employed become, through individual habit and social practice, part and parcel of the final purpose. They influence it. They modify it. Presently, the aims and the means become virtually identical. No revolution can ever succeed as a factor of liberation unless the means used to further it be identical in spirit and tendency with the purposes, the ends to be achieved. Its first ethical precept is the identity of means used and aims sought. The ultimate end of all revolutionary social change is to establish the sanctity of human life, the dignity of humanity the right of every person to liberty and well-being, and the means must be consistent with this end. Today is the parent of tomorrow. The present casts its shadow far into the future. That is the law of life, individual and social. That was Emma Goldman's verdict on the Bolshevik Revolution and why she saw in the early 20s it was a disaster. If others on the left had seen it as early as the 1920s, we would have been saved a lot of rhetoric. Emma Goldman died in Toronto, exiled forever from the United States, in 1940. She had one wish, and that was to be buried in Waldheim Cemetery in Chicago with the other Haymarket martyrs, as she called them. And there she lies today, next to them. She had been exiled, she died alone, and today she is hardly regarded as an American hero. But no American in the 1920s forecast better the basic reasons for the ultimate collapse of communism. No American stated more humanely the ideas of anarchism and stated them with such extraordinary inspiration. No American demanded then more eloquently that this country practice the freedom that it preached by instituting a system of equality. Equality for all its people, men and women alike.
Lecture 6, Mahatma Gandhi, Personal and Political Freedom. These last three lectures in our series on freedom all consider people of color. Now, that is Mahatma Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., and Malcolm X, in that order, all view themselves as involved in both a personal and a political struggle against racial persecution and injustice. They're all men of this century who become leaders of movements to liberate the oppressed, and in this way they are unlike those that we've discussed thus far. Uh, as we've said, the earlier figures, with the exception of Emma Goldman, were philosophers and not activists. And although Goldman was an activist, she was never the leader of a movement. Gandhi, who we turn to now, calling this lecture Mahatma Gandhi, Personal and Political Freedom, Gandhi was not only one of the most original thinkers of our era, he was the leader of the Indian struggle for independence, for freedom, from British colonialism. Uh, this was the largest mass movement for national independence in history, and Gandhi's idea of freedom had a more direct impact on hundreds of millions of people than any other philosopher. In the very first lecture, at the beginning of this series, we introduced the ancient Indian concept of freedom, the Indian word for freedom being Swaraj. And we said then that the word had a dual meaning. The Indian word for freedom, Swaraj, on the one hand could mean freedom as national independence. On the other hand, it could mean the, what the Indians called spiritual freedom, or a liberation from ignorance, from illusion, from fear. And we want to recall that classic story in the Upanishads of the man entering the darkened room, gradually perceiving with more light what the object in the corner was, and at the end being freed from fear. Now Gandhi takes this idea of Swaraj from ancient India. The title of his first book, written in 1909, is Hind Swaraj. He interprets it for modern India in a dual sense. That is, on the one hand, freedom for Gandhi meant India's national independence from centuries of British rule. On the other hand, Swaraj meant a spiritual freedom, or a psychological and mental liberation from ignorance, and especially from fear. Gandhi wrote this about his idea of freedom. To quote Gandhi, the outward or political freedom that we shall attain will be in exact proportion to the inward or spiritual freedom that we may have grown to as a result of our personal search. If this is the correct view of freedom, as I believe it is, then our chief energy must be concentrated on achieving revolution from within or freedom from fear. Now this idea of freedom from fear was a key component of Gandhi's theory and of his appeal as leader of the Indian movement for independence. Its meaning, its nature, was described very well by one of Gandhi's close associates in the freedom movement, Jawaharlal Nehru. Nehru was 20 years younger than Gandhi, and after Gandhi's death, he became the first prime minister of India, serving from 1948 until Nehru's death in 1964. He knew, he understood Gandhi well, perhaps better than anybody else, and in his book, The Discovery of India, he conveys Gandhi's achievement remarkably well. First, in this book, Nehru relates the appalling state of India before Gandhi became leader of the independence movement in 1919. And Nehru describes a country of nearly 400 millions reduced to a state of terrible poverty and tragic humiliation under the weight of British imperialism. A system of exploitation and rule, Nehru says, that had continued since the 18th century. After conveying the utter hopelessness of the people, Nehru then comes to the point of Gandhi's entry. The passage is so eloquent, so accurate, that I want to quote from Nehru at length. This is Nehru in the discovery of India. 
And then Gandhi came. He was like a powerful current of fresh air that made us stretch ourselves and take deep breaths, like a beam of light that pierced the darkness and removed the scales from our eyes, like a whirlwind that upset many things, and most of all the working of people's minds. He didn't descend from the top. He seemed to emerge from the millions of India, speaking their language and incessantly drawing attention to them and their appalling condition. Get off the backs of these peasants and workers, he told us, all of you who live by their exploitation. Get rid of the system that produces this poverty and misery. Political freedom took new shape and acquired a new content. The essence of Gandhi's teaching was fearlessness and truth and action allied to these, always keeping the welfare of the masses in view. The great gift for an individual or a nation, so we had been told in our ancient books, was abaya, that is, fearlessness. Not merely bodily courage, but the absence of fear from the mind. Janaka and Yajnavalka had said at the dawn of history that it was the function of the leaders of a people to make them fearless. But the dominant impulse in India under British rule was that of fear, pervasive oppressing, strangling fear, fear of the British Army, the police, the widespread secret service, fear of the official class, fear of laws meant to suppress and of prison, fear of the landlord's agent, fear of the money lender, fear of unemployment and starvation which were all on the threshold. It was against this all-pervading fear that Gandhi's quiet and determined voice was raised, be not afraid. Now, was it so simple as all that? Not quite. And yet fear builds its phantoms, which are more fearsome than reality itself. And reality, when calmly analyzed and its consequences willingly accepted, loses then much of its terror. So suddenly, as it were, that black pall of fear was lifted from the people's shoulders. Not wholly, of course, but to an amazing degree. As fear is close companion to falsehood, so truth follows fearlessness. A sea change was visible as the need for falsehood and furtive behavior lessened as we opposed the British. It was a psychological change, almost as if some expert in psychoanalytical methods had probed deep into the patient's past, found out the origins of his complexes, exposed them to his view, and thus rid him of that burden. There was that psychological reaction also, a feeling of shame at our long submission to an alien rule that had degraded and humiliated us, and a desire to submit no longer whatever the consequences might be. In Nehru's estimate, therefore, Gandhi's achievement was to liberate India from fear of violence and oppression which the domination of British rule had fomented. Gandhi had infused Indians in their struggle then with a new sense of self-esteem and self-respect. Here was a movement at last that humanized people rather than dehumanized them. Now how did Gandhi achieve this as a leader? If we apply his concept of freedom to his own example, then his political achievement came from his personal or inward quest for liberation. That is, he was able to show others a path to freedom from fear because he had, as a result of his internal or psychological self-searching, gained insight into how fear may be overcome. In order to understand this interpretation of political freedom emerging from personal liberation, we need to examine Gandhi's life, his quest for personal freedom, and the way in which his life experience may be interpreted as a series of stages stages of psychological development, each stage giving him increased awareness of his situation as an Indian in a country that was dominated by foreign rule. In this sense, we can see Gandhi's life as a journey towards self-realization, a realization of freedom from fear and freedom for self-esteem. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi was born on October 2nd, 1869 in Porbandar, Gujarat, the western part of India. His life and his thought, I think, may be examined in the context of phases, stages of development, or what we may call following Eric Erickson's work on Gandhi, his classic work on Gandhi called Gandhi's Truth, Erickson talks about a series of identities. 
and we speak first of Gandhi's primary identity. His primary identity is his central core of values formed early in life as a result of influence from his region of birth, from his caste, and from his family. In terms of his region of birth, Porbandar Gujarat was a real backwater. It was not one of the great urban centers of India, like Madras and Calcutta and Bombay and Delhi. It was far out there and relatively untouched by British influence, although British influence in India at this point was everywhere in 1869. So when Gandhi is raised in Porbandar Gujarat, he's raised with a strong family influence, and the influence from the religions of Hinduism and Jainism, especially from Hinduism, were strong. That family influence came especially from his mother, he says in his autobiography in the opening pages that his mother and not his father served as the model for his early development. He is shockingly, I think, in the first pages of his autobiography, disrespectful of his father, calling him an impatient individual given to angry outbursts, where his mother was a model of self-sacrifice, taking vows in order to purify herself, a devout Hinduism, that pra pra a devout Hindu who practiced what she preached. Gandhi was also a member of the Vaishya caste. In the caste hierarchy in India, there are very broadly the Brahmins on top, and then the Kshatriyas, or the political and warrior caste, and then the Vaishya, or the business caste. Gandhi is relatively low down in terms of his birth, and I think that is important in terms of his placement vis-a-vis -vis the vast millions of Indian people. He understood peasants well, and he spoke their language because he was not of the upper castes. In all of these respects, his primary identity then formed as a result of being born where he was, being a member of the Vaishya caste, and being influenced so much by his mother rather than his father. These influences were important, but Gandhi in his autobiography says that there is still another factor that needs to be mentioned, and that is that he was from his point of view, but his own words, an extremely fearful child. He was plagued with fears of ghosts and of snakes. He's married early on at age 13 in a childhood marriage that he later, he and his wife deplored. That is the whole institution of child marriages in India. But at age 13, he looked to his wife as a person of superior courage. She wasn't afraid of ghosts. She wasn't afraid of the dark. But he was haunted by these fears until adolescence. It was overcoming these fears, these very personal fears, afraid of the dark, uh, that constituted for Gandhi an important element in his own achievement of freedom. Now, if the personal identity is the first that we look to, uh, and in terms of a primary identity, the influences at this early phase. Then the next identity that we talk about is what we call his emulative identity. And by emulative, we mean his desire to imitate or to emulate the British. British imperialism, as we said, had been around in India for some time. They had ruled India directly since 1858, following the great Indian mutiny. From 1858 until the British left in 1947, they imposed an extraordinary sovereignty over that country of 400 million people. Imagine an island on the other side of the world, 60 million people, ruling a vast subcontinent of India at this time, of almost 400 million people. And it included, British India included not just India, as we know it today, and included India and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Burma and Sri Lanka. This whole area, this entire subcontinent of South Asia, called British India. What an achievement that the British should have dominated this region of the world for so long. Gandhi attended a school near his home in Rajkot called Alfred High School. And in that school, there was a British headmaster. Uh, the lessons of that school were in English. And the purpose of the school was to instill British behavior. English classes, English master. His basic attitudes of admiration and anxiety toward the British were formed early on then in this high school period. And it was during that time that he developed his infatuation for the British and his desire to leave India to take a law degree in England. 
So from 1881 until 1886, he is in high school, and then in 1888, he leaves for London to take his degree in law, and uh, his emulative attitude is consequent. Thomas Babington Macaulay, an influential English historian and legislator, declared that the goal of British rule in India must be, quote, to train a class of Indians who will be Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, in opinion, in morals, in intellect, and of course, in manners. Gandhi, in his youth, pursued Macaulay's policy unquestioningly in his attempt to imitate British behavior and character. In one memorable chapter of his autobiography that he entitled, quote, Playing the English Gentleman, Gandhi appears as a law student in London, desperately trying to imitate British behavior down to the last manner and gesture. For almost 20 years, as a student in London and then as a successful lawyer in South Africa, Gandhi measured himself and others by English standards. He remained not merely a loyal and obedient citizen of the empire, he remained an ardent devotee during these years of British rule, cooperating in every possible way with the imperial government in South Africa, even to the extent of serving in the military. He believed, as the British had taught, that not only their politics, but their morals were exemplary. Now, if Gandhi's life had ended in 1906, at the age of 37, when the emulative identity ended, or if it had continued on this same course of emulation, uh, as a successful career in law, as a lawyer, then it's very unlikely that we'd be talking about Gandhi at all now, because he would probably have made a lot of money, as many Indians did in law, but he surely would never have become the Mahatma. Instead, at this point, in 1906, his, mo his life moved through a series of dramatic changes, moments of truth, we'll call them, and we'll discuss only three of them in the time that we have. In 1906, his response to the Zulu Rebellion in South Africa, which brought his first act of civil disobedience and the writing of his first book, Hind Swaraj. And then the second moment of truth, his response to the Amritsar Massacre in 1919. And then third, his Calcutta Fast in 1947, which occurred only five months before his death and represents perhaps, I think, his finest hour. Now the main point as we move uh, to our first moment of truth in 1906 is that Gandhi's reactions to British imperialism were extreme. Uh, that is, from extreme Anglophilia to extreme Anglophobia. And as he moves from the identity phase of emulation to what we'll call the identity phase of exclusiveness or negation of British rule. He moves then from extreme adoration and emulation of the values of British civilization to extreme exclusion and rejection of British civilization. So after Gandhi had gone to South Africa to practice law among the Indian minority there, many of the Indians were indentured laborers, but some of them were rather wealthy merchants trying to make their way in South Africa, and they needed a lawyer. Gandhi first went to South Africa in 1893 not to protest grievances of Indians in South Africa, as he would later, but rather to make some money. And he felt that South Africa was a, a honest way to do it as an aspiring young lawyer. And so he goes to South Africa and practices law uh, from 1893 until, 18, until 1906. And during that time, he's a model of emulation. Uh, that is, when he does get to form uh, some protest movement in South Africa for the Indians, it's still very much as a liberal 
Uh, he forms his own political party before 1906 in South Africa, the Natal Indian Congress. And then he forms his own news, gets his own newspaper going. He believes that to the extent that the Indians are discriminated against in South Africa, he can address these grievances by going to the courts and arguing in a kind of million way for South, for South African Indian rights. Uh, so he is until 1906, working within the system, believing in the law, taking his cue from British constitutionalism that if rights are to be achieved for Indians in South Africa, this can be done without civil disobedience by working within the system. In 1906, matters change and the move from the emulative to the exclusive. In 1906, British rule in South Africa was resisted by the Zulus. Gandhi was then, as we said, 37 years old. He was practicing law in Johannesburg. And he was so eager to support the British against the Zulus that he not only joined the war effort, but he formed an Indian unit of the medical corps. The result, though, was not what he had anticipated. He expected that the British would prevail, but he didn't expect that he would witness a series of massacres or watch with horror expressions on the faces of British soldiers as they flogged and tortured the Zulus. 3,000 Zulus were killed in this war. And Gandhi insistently later on says this was not a war, but a massacre. But it was not just the killing that shattered Gandhi's consciousness. It was the twisted expression, as he relates it in his autobiography. The undisguised brutality on the English face of violence as they used and abused the Zulus. That's what repulsed him so much because he had been struggling so avidly to become one of them, like them. So he stepped back in horror. But along with that came understanding. The sort of insight that Gandhi gained at this critical moment in his development is interpreted well, I think, by Eric Erickson in the book that I mentioned before, Gandhi's Truth. The experience Erickson observes of witnessing the outrages perpetrated on black bodies by white he-men aroused in Gandhi both a deeper identification with the maltreated and a stronger aversion against all male sadism including such sexual sadism as he had probably felt from childhood on to be part of all exploitation of women by men. I think this is a profound insight, Erickson. The insights gained by Gandhi, though, from the Zulu massacre mark a critical turning point in his life. The first time, but not the last, that an act of mass violence would force him to discover a side of himself that he found intolerable and so rejected. The killing and the torment of the Zulus revealed to him not only the tormentor's real identity, but the dynamics of domination. That is, the connections, as Erickson observes, among various types of exploitation. Imperialist exploitation, to be sure, but also racist and sexist. Gandhi saw how this was rooted in the rule and character of British dominion in South Africa, and a month after the Zulu massacre, he began civil disobedience against the government. A campaign that anticipated in the next decade his nonviolent resistance to the British government in India. So after 1906, Gandhi turns against the British. And when he does, it is with a vengeance, because his masters have so thoroughly betrayed him. Indeed, his reversal is so extreme that he now moves to a kind of separatism that's as exclusivist in type as the English imperialists practice themselves. The strident statement of Gandhi's new exclusivism as he takes up the struggle of civil disobedience in South Africa occurs in his first work, which was published in 1909, and as I said, is titled Hind Swaraj, or Indian Freedom. It sets forth the sharpest polarities between Indian and Western civilizations. Whereas before 1906, Gandhi had urged imitation of the British. Now, in 1909, he declares, quote, If India copies England, she will be ruined. One, else, one effort is required, and that is to drive out Western civilization. All else will follow. 
Gandhi proceeds then to exclude everything Western, from law to medicine, from railways to parliamentary democracy. Everything threatens to corrupt India in his view now because the tendency of Indian civilization is to elevate the moral being, that of Western civilization is to propagate immorality. The latter, he says, is godless. The former is based on a belief in God. Indian civilization is far superior to the British because the British are capable only of brute force while India alone knows the secret of soul force. And then, in italics, India has absolutely nothing to learn from anybody else. Now, that is the height of his exclusivism, his separatism. And when we turn to Malcolm X next time, we'll be making the direct comparison between the stages of development in Malcolm's autobiography with the stages of development that are emerging in Gandhi's autobiography. And uh, these stages follow. Malcolm's separatism is as vehement as Gandhi, with one exception, and that is that Malcolm, during his separatist time, tolerated violence, whereas Gandhi never did. There was violence of the spirit everywhere in Hind Swaraj, but not physical violence. Now, Gandhi returned to India from South Africa after having spent 21 years in South Africa, a large part of that time from 1906 to 1914, waging a struggle of civil disobedience against the South African government, an extraordinarily successful struggle because Indians were willing to go to jail in the tens of thousands. When he returned in India in 1915, it was with a method then, after all of this time in South Africa. He had learned to become an astute politician who knew the popular appeal of an exclusivist ideology, and he taught it. Within four years, he seized control of the Indian National Congress so that by 1919, the independence movement was growing fast under Gandhi's leadership. The renowned poet of India, Rabindranath Tagore, warned Gandhi that the Indian nationalism had taken that Indian nationalism had taken an ugly turn, that its harsh, anti-Western, xenophobic tone had all but drowned out the inclusivist spirit that Tagore valued most. But Tagore's heating. He was, after all, only a poet and not a politician. These heatings went. These warnings went unheeded. Then, in 1919, came the Amritsar Massacre. This was an event, as one British historian has said, that changed the face of world history. Like the slaughter of the Zulus in 1906, the Amritsar Massacre was a single episode of mass violence that revealed the underlying brutality of British rule. Yet the effect of Amritsar on Gandhi was the opposite of the Zulu conflict. Instead of turning him towards exclusiveness, it moved him out of exclusivity and separatism. Now to appreciate the impact of Amritsar and this key moment of truth in Gandhi's life as he moves from exclusivism to inclusivism, from a vehement separatism to a humanist inclusiveness, to appreciate the impact of Amritsar, we must picture the scene. In March 1919, Gandhi had called on the 390 million people of India to wage a campaign of nonviolent non-cooperation. The response was a mass strike throughout the country along the lines that had been practiced in South Africa successfully. And it effectively challenged the British government in India and its authority. Gandhi demanded nonviolence, but in one region of India, the Punjab, violence broke out and there was rioting, especially in the city of Amritsar. On April 10th, two British officials were killed by a mob, and a British schoolmistress, Agatha Sherwood, was assaulted. This alarmed the government, so it sent into Amritsar the best that it had, General Reginald Dyer, a veteran military leader with a distinguished war record. His task was to restore order through martial law, and when he took command, he prohibited all public meetings and assemblies. What followed was what you may have seen in Richard Attenborough's splendid film on Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, that is the, Amritsar, the event, the Amritsar Massacre. April 13th, 1919, was a Sunday, 
It was a big religious holiday in Amritsar. Indians gathered instinctively, peacefully to celebrate it in the large public square, a walled-in enclosure about the size of a football field. 10,000 Indians crowded into this square on that afternoon. As soon as General Dyer found out about this, he interpreted it as a deliberate defiance of his martial law orders. So he marched 50 of his crack riflemen into the square without giving any warning, fired directly into the crowd, killing by official count 379 Indians. Later, General Dyer would explain his action by saying, quote, I thought that I should shoot well and shoot strong, so that I or anybody else should never have to shoot again. But Dyer did more than just shoot on that occasion. He wanted to set an unforgettable example. So he declared that those who lay wounded in the square, some 1,500 Indians, must not be attended to for 72 hours after. Finally, he passed what he called the crawling order. The crawling order proclaimed that all Indians who happened henceforth to approach that lane in Amritsar, where Agatha Sherwood had been attacked, these Indians must get down and, quote, according to his crawling order, wriggle on their bellies like worms to show their repentance for the assault, else they would be flogged to death. The response in India to the massacre was predictable. The government tried to cover up, first exonerating Dyer, then retiring him only after the public outcry became too much. Indians screamed for revenge, and with the British outnumbered in the country, by about 4,000 to 1, they could have got it. That is, the British at no time ever had more than 100,000 Britons there, ruling almost 400 million people. The terrorist movement in India, which was inspired by the Irish in the 1890s, had the most experienced leadership and the most sophisticated organization of any terrorist effort in the world at that time. Its gifted theorists contributed a systematic ideology of exclusivism, exclusivism and separatism to the Indian struggle for independence. And now Dyer's monstrous action gave the Indian terrorists fresh momentum, and they moved to take over the nationalist movement. At this critical juncture, Gandhi moved, too, for an escalation of the conflict, but through nonviolence rather than violence. What allowed Gandhi, rather than the terrorists, to prevail at this point was the new message behind his campaign, a message that marked his breakthrough from exclusivity into inclusivism. Gandhi told India this, an eye for an eye and the whole world goes blind. Before this tragedy, he said, we could oppose the British because they victimized us now we can see that we are not the only victims of their own system. They are also victims. They have dehumanized themselves. This domination of others that Dyer carried to an extreme afflicts the persecutors with the persecuted, and they have become trapped in their own web of racism. We must not allow ourselves to be trapped too. And we will if we are reduced to hating them. This is a message that, as we'll see, Martin Luther King Jr. literally takes up when he cites Booker Washington in his speech before the Montgomery bus boycott. Above all, do not allow them to drag us so low that we hate them. Gandhi said, if we fight dire with dire's methods, we become dire. If we treat the British as mad dogs and try to hunt them down, denying them their humanity, we end up losing our own. These are the costs, then, of exclusivism. And he begins to use the word exclusivism now for the first time in a pejorative sense. He says we must leave it behind. This is our testing time when we have been provoked beyond endurance, when the spiral of violence seems unstoppable, and we will stop it. This is the time that it can be broken. 
And so his plan is to non-cooperate with violence. Not, he says, because we are afraid, but because we have the courage to use restraint and the strength to use non-violence. And so, as the world watched and expected that one bloody massacre would surely be followed by another bloody massacre, Indians defied those expectations. They showed the world a movement that it had no cause to expect because it was so unprecedented, a movement driven not by hate, but by a sense of humanity. Britons joined this movement, too, and the test of Gandhi's inclusivism was that he would not just bring Britons into the movement, but put them in a position of authority. Charles Andrews, for example, the Anglican minister well, who left the church at one point in protest, became Gandhi's closest friend. Madeleine Slade, a daughter of a upper-class British admiral, joined the movement and became extraordinarily important as a member of Gandhi's ashram. Reginald Reynolds, a British Quaker, carried Gandhi's letter of protest during the salt march to Lord Irwin and delivered to the Viceroy, the shocked Viceroy, the word that Britons, upper-class Britons, were also involved in this movement. Many sympathized in England with Gandhi, for they found in Gandhi's inclusivist appeal a common cause of justice, an open hand of trust. It was a British historian, Arnold Toynbee, who said after India gained her independence that Gandhi had achieved as much for England as for India, because by extending that open hand of trust at this critical time, he helped both countries escape a system of violence and domination that had indeed, we can see in retrospect, victimized both. So when the government finally grasped that open hand as it did, Britain and India, in a real sense, Toynbee said, liberated one another. Now Gandhi's successful use of nonviolence to free India from British imperialism constitutes the main reason why a study of his method may offer some hope for finding, I think, a moral equivalent to war and a way to freedom that is not, does not involve violence. Yet such a study would reveal as many failures as successes, showing that nonviolent action is at best a painstaking agent of political change that's constantly in need of creative reinforcement. If the method of mass civil disobedience and non-cooperation proved effective against the British, it was much less successful when used to involve, resolve religious conflict in India between Hindus and Muslims. In the last years of his life, Gandhi threw his entire effort into meeting this religious conflict. Yet he failed to prevent the vast civil war that engulfed India from 1946 to 1948, a war that took hundreds of thousands of Hindu and Muslim lives, ending only with the assassination of Gandhi by a Hindu fanatic in January 1948. Even so, while Gandhi ultimately lost his life in the war, he won some key battles along the way. And none was more remarkable than this third moment of truth to which we turn, and that is the Calcutta Fast of 1947. This is the quintessential illustration of his inclusivity. Now, once again, to appreciate the workings of nonviolence, we must picture the scene. Calcutta, in 1946, a large city with a Hindu majority, but a powerful minority of Muslims. There, on August 14th, India's civil war began with pitched battles between the two religious communities, sparked by tensions surrounding the struggle for independence. Over 4,000 people in Calcutta in those 48 hours were butchered in a frenzy of street killing, unprecedented in its scale or intensity, as Hindus killed Muslims, Muslims killed Hindus, at a pace that had never been experienced in India before at any time. After that terrible beginning in Calcutta in August 46, fear and fury surged through the city and for one year Calcutta was divided into two armed camps that came together only to inflict daily violence on one another. Neither police nor military could contain the killing. 
And into this cauldron Gandhi came in August 1947 with one purpose, to bring peace to Calcutta. The conflict that he faced was quite unlike that posed by the British. The Muslims were Gandhi's own people, as he judged them, and he was trying to keep them in India rather than to make them leave, as were the British. Yet in another respect, the problem was the same. Just as Gandhi had revealed the system of imperialism at Amritsar to be a burden to both the British and the Indians, so was the continuing religious violence and affliction that all Indians wished to end in order to achieve freedom from fear. Neither imperial domination nor warfare served the needs of most people in this state of continuing insecurity, and Gandhi's method tried to offer an alternative. With that aim, he moved into the home of a Muslim friend in Calcutta, a Muslim friend in Calcutta, and he began a fast for religious unity. He announced that his fast would cease when quiet came to Calcutta. Now, from the beginning, his effort was to present a clear demonstration of inclusiveness. He lived in a Muslim home, countering the exclusivist attitudes of his own Hindu community, he held prayer meetings regularly, where he would read from the Muslim Quran along with other religious texts, and then take counsel with his Muslim friends. At first, at the beginning of the fast, the violence continued. But then, as his condition worsened and the threat to his life increased, he was then 78 years old, the people of Calcutta responded. Students, to their immense credit, began demonstrations at the University of Calcutta this time in order to cross over the barriers set up by rival communities rather than to enforce them. Although some students were injured, the barricades began to come down. Then business groups, trade unions, the press and the media took up the call for Hindu-Muslim unity as we see this marvelous seed change in the city's temperament occur. At first, cautiously, but then increasingly demanding that the violence stop. Citizens of Calcutta understood that they must do this. They must persuade Gandhi to end his fast. Now, the most dramatic moment of the fast came, I think, and this is recorded in Attenborough's film, when a gunda broke into Gandhi's room one evening and ran to where he lay fasting. Gundas were thugs who had grown during this year of violence into huge gangs of seasoned killers. Gandhi had often been told that it was no use fasting against the gundas. The man appeared crazed, and when he rushed in, those around Gandhi tried to restrain him, thinking that he meant harm. I've, in my interviews with people who were there at this time, heard this scene described to me so many times that I imagine in moments that I was there, but I wasn't. The gunda threw a piece of bread on Gandhi's lap and demanded that he eat it to end the fast. Gandhi saw his distress and he simply asked, Brother, what's wrong? And the man replied, the Muslims. The Muslims got my little boy. So I found one of theirs. I threw him against the wall. I smashed his head. Only God knows. But I know that I'll go to hell. And the man broke down sobbing. And Gandhi held him. And the two of them together, that scene, crying together for all the children that had been killed in Calcutta and that horrendous civil war and violent, of violence during that two-year period. And Gandhi uttered the words that might have been spoken to the city of Calcutta as well. He said, Brother, I know a way out of hell. Find a child like your own. Adopt him and raise him as your own. But make certain that he is a Muslim. And you must raise him as a Muslim. Well, this was the message of inclusiveness that redeemed Calcutta. While other parts of northern India went up in flames of religious fanaticism, Calcutta remained at peace. And a great British historian, writing on the transfer of power, as it's called, from, India, from Britain to India, uh, E.W.R. Lumbi, a person who is, I knew him, a model of rationality, 
studied the Indian Civil War closely and uh, called Gandhi's Calcutta Fast undoubtedly the greatest miracle of modern times. Well, what can we learn from Gandhi, from his life, from his teachings then, from these three moments, these identities, these moments of truth that I've selected? I think one lesson above all else, that we in the world have become hooked on violence, and it's time to break the addiction. On the one hand, we view violence with horror when it threatens or it touches our loved ones and ourselves. But on the other hand, we depend on it to solve our problems or to get our kicks, as in the Gulf War when we saw no other solution and then stayed glued to CNN for the best entertainment. Gandhi repeatedly characterized violence as the most potent of all drugs, and he predicted that if we survive and learn in the future, centuries hence we'll look back on this century as the, most, as the one most under the influence of violence. Drugs like this enslave us as surely as crack and cigarettes. They make us compulsive. They cut off our choices. They make us fearful of how we can possibly survive without them. We don't need this kind of bondage to fear. Gandhi's nonviolence is a creative, forceful exploration of active alternatives to violence. He called it inclusiveness, and it was an attitude of mind that he attained only after a lifetime of experiments and trials. It may not work every time, that's true, but we know that violence doesn't work every time or most times. Nonviolence is worth trying in families, in schools, in city streets, in our government, even on our TV and movie screens. Gandhi was the first to argue, give peace a chance. And now we see, at a point of time and in a region that has been torn by violence, courageous peace, peace negotiators in Israel trying to do precisely that as we speak. Because they know, as we know, that this is the way to liberation and fear. And I was of liberation from fear. I was heartened, as you saw too perhaps, by the New York Times headline Wednesday, September 1st of this year. In Israel, the Israeli people are divided but are willing to give peace a chance. There are brave people who realize at this moment in their negotiations that they must take a radical step forward to solve this violence that's occurred in the Middle East now for decades. As they do that, they realize that it is in their own interest to achieve this, to achieve freedom from fear and from the kind of daily insecurity. I visited Israel, perhaps you have as well, that people have suffered through for so long. This is a selfish interest as well as an unselfish one. And nonviolence is an appeal to our best interests, our higher interests, but to all our interests to relieve us from the kind of fear that we have suffered with for so long. Give peace a chance. Lecture 7, Malcolm X's Quest for Liberation. This seventh lecture in our series on the idea of freedom is called Malcolm X's Quest for Liberation. And as we move now to Malcolm X, and then in the final lecture in the series <clears throat> to Martin Luther King Jr., I'll continue to use, for purposes of comparison, much of what I just said in the previous lecture about Mahatma Gandhi. This is because I think that Gandhi's life, his experience, his philosophy, and especially his pursuit of freedom, 
serve as a kind of paradigm or conceptual framework within which we can understand better the experiences of people of color. Few who among these people of color try to resist racism as they did become leaders of their people in their, in their efforts. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King certainly became leaders in this regard and there are striking similarities between them and Gandhi because the three of them mobilized their peoples to resist racism as effectively as any leaders in this century. Similarities are often more apparent between Gandhi and King than Gandhi and Malcolm X because King became an advocate in America of Gandhian nonviolence. But I'd like in this lecture on Malcolm to show how he and Gandhi were alike in their similar struggles for Swaraj, uh, that is, for an inner freedom that comes out of a quest for self-discovery, a quest inspired initially by a common fear, fear of personal inadequacy wrought by racism. So when Malcolm's life is compared with Gandhi's, we see how racism has a cross-cultural character, influencing individuals as different as Gandhi and Malcolm in cultures as different as America and India. Because the effects of injustice and humiliation do know no boundaries. They victimize people of color the world around. And yet, unlike most victims of such abuse, Gandhi and Malcolm X found ways to liberate themselves. And the stories of their quest for self-transformation, told so well in their respective autobiographies, is the essence of the archetypal quest, the quintessential journey of the hero, a journey that may begin in fear and insecurity, but can end in the discovery of a truth, the sort of truth that can set us free. The whole concept of a quest for personal liberation is rooted in ancient Eastern and Western philosophies. In India, as we saw in the very first lecture, the journey of the self for spiritual enlightenment was a basic theme of both Hinduism and Buddhism. And in ancient Greece, the axiom that the goal of life is to know thyself was interpreted by Socrates to mean that our lives should be devoted to continuing self-examination so that the idea of a journey or a pilgrimage to truth is synonymous with what we call the Socratic quest. If the lives of Buddha and of Socrates personify a quest for inner freedom in the ancient world, then Gandhi and Malcolm represent this, I think, for our modern era. I met Malcolm in February 1965, only 10 days before he was assassinated. I was then a graduate student at the University of London, and Malcolm came through England on his last trip abroad. I heard him give a lecture at the London School of Economics, and then I talked with him briefly after. Before this, I had only seen him on TV or read his speeches in the press. Now, watching him up close and listening to him, I found him the most powerful speaker that I had ever encountered. His presence was so intense that it conveyed a surprising dynamism and energy. And the audience, the majority of us white, felt this energy in a way that I doubt any of us had ever felt from a lecture from one of our professors. It was as clear to me then as it is now that this kind of effect on an audience, this time an audience of students, could come only from a speaker who was absolutely authentic, impeccably sincere. And yet also it came from an orator extremely skilled at holding a group's attention. As I look at the notes that I've saved on that lecture back in 65, it surprises me how many jokes Malcolm worked into it. 
and how he had developed a style uh, that alternated between sharp, painful insights on the one hand and sardonic humor on the other. His effectiveness as a speaker, I think, came partly from his unique ability to build up a real tension with a series of rapier-like stabs at white racism and then explode the tension with humor, mocking as he would racial injustice with an absurd joke and releasing one burst of laughter, often from us it was nervous laughter, one burst after a burst after another, creating a sort of rhythm that carried us all along together. It was the performance I felt of a maestro, and I've never witnessed one quite like it since. But it wasn't Malcolm's oratorical style that impressed me most or remained with me after. It was even more than that the content of his lecture, a lecture that began with the words, it is only being a Muslim, he said, which keeps me from seeing people by the color of their skin. I realized as I heard those words on that afternoon in February 1965, that I had been out of touch with the evolution of Malcolm X. The Malcolm that I had known in America two years earlier, before he had left the nation of Islam, had branded all whites as devils and demons. We were all cursed because of the color of our skin. Now in 65, Malcolm was still a Muslim, but he was claiming that it was precisely because of Islam that he could affirm the truth of human brotherhood. Now he was saying this, we don't judge a man because of the color of his skin. We don't judge you because you're white. We don't judge you because you're black. We don't judge you because you're brown. We judge you because of what you do, what you practice. So we're not against people because they're white, but we're against those who practice racism. Now, this was a Malcolm who now preached a message of separating the sin from the sinner in much the same way as Gandhi did. And he had come to a sense of religious unity, the spiritual unity of humanity, very much like Gandhi's. My discovery on that afternoon, then, was for me a revelation. But it wasn't until the publication of his autobiography a few months later that I came to understand the significance of what I had heard then in London. Because it was not just the point that Malcolm had reached by 1965 that counted. More than this, what mattered was the journey that had taken him there, a journey of personal transformation through relentless self-examination. This is what marks his profound similarity with Gandhi. Among American leaders, only Malcolm takes the meaning of Swaraj, of personal liberation, to its limit. The story of his life proclaims its significance with an unparalleled eloquence. In order to appreciate this, I think we need to review something of what was said last lecture about the stages of evolution of Gandhi's life. We saw then you recall that Gandhi, like Malcolm, was born into a deeply religious family and his childhood was shaped by the morality that was conveyed to him by his parents. Yet while his was an ostensibly stable childhood background, Gandhi says that he himself was filled with fears. Fears of ghosts, of the dark, of his place in a colonized India. All of this left him with torment, torment over his own weaknesses and inadequacies. And as he sought to strengthen himself, to gain self-respect, he chose to identify not with his own India, because India was a conquered culture, but with the British, because they were the lords of India, powerful, masculine, dynamic rulers, who happened also to be white and racist. The English rulers characterized their Indian subjects as immoral, irresponsible, immature, needing British control 
and domination. Gandhi swallowed this whole racist doctrine to the point of being driven to emulate the British in every way, to try, as he said, to become truly an English gentleman. Now, this important stage in Gandhi's journey of imitating the colonizer by adopting British modes of behavior lasted for decades of Gandhi's life, until his late 30s, and it didn't end until he learned a vital truth. This truth was that no matter how well he practiced British law, or how fashionably he dressed, or how mature and responsibly he behaved, or how eloquently he spoke English, he still could not change the color of his skin. The implications of this fact, that is the full extent of British racism, were somehow not clear to him until 1906 with the trauma of the Zulu Rebellion and his unexpected identification, not with the British, but with black Africans in the midst of that massacre. It was this brutal slaughter of blacks by whites that drove Gandhi away from his emulation of the British and into a virulent form of separatism. This was a separatism so sweeping that in fact it went far beyond what Malcolm had ever preached. Because Gandhi denounced all of modern Western civilization as evil and satanic. He wanted the destruction of everything that Western civilization had produced, produced and used as its agents of domination, from railroads and telegraph to law and medicine. Indian civilization he presented as infinitely superior because it had Hinduism, and Hinduism as he presented as an exclusive religious truth. We often think of Malcolm as an extremist, and somehow the term extremism doesn't seem to apply to Gandhi. But this is mistaken. In his early 30s, Gandhi was as an extreme and Anglophile as any Indian in the British Empire. And then after the Zulu massacre in 1906, he became an extreme Anglophobe, arguing that India's redemption could come only from driving out all remnants of Western civilization, because Western civilization was rotten to the core. As we saw in the last lecture, the meaning of Swaraj became clear to Gandhi only in April 1919, with the massacre of 400 innocent Indians by the British at Amritsar. This might have increased his separatism, convincing him that English racism was irremediable, but it didn't. Instead, the Amritsar massacre had the opposite effect on Gandhi. He suddenly understood, as a result of the slaughter, that the way out of this mutual dehumanization for both colonizer and colonized was not through greater polarization, but through transcendence of it. And with that realization, Gandhi traveled in his journey a giant step from exclusivity to inclusivity, a personal victory that ultimately became political when the British left India to the Indians in 1947 without firing a shot after centuries of British domination. Now, what has this got to do with Malcolm? I think that Malcolm's autobiography like Gandhi's autobiography, shows that these two leaders offer us models of how to deal with racism and racist domination, lessons that are relevant today in the midst of our urban nightmares of racial violence in America, as relevant as they were when they were assassinated. Now, these lessons, I think, are apparent in at least three striking parallels between Malcolm and Gandhi. First, their early childhood experiences were both influenced by parental religious training 
And yet for both of them, religion did not rescue them from personal insecurity and terrible childhood fears. In Malcolm's case, his anxieties and his insecurities were exacerbated by the violent racism that pursued him and his family wherever they went. Perhaps this was because his father was such a vocal and effective advocate of Marcus Garvey's black liberation movement at that time. But at any rate, Malcolm tells us in the opening chapter of his autobiography entitled Nightmare, how the Ku Klux Klan forced his family to move from Omaha, Nebraska, where Malcolm was born, to Lansing, Michigan, where his father was murdered when Malcolm was only six. And yet this trauma didn't turn Malcolm against whites. On the contrary, as his own mother's hold on his family became more and more shaky, Malcolm searched for security among white families and in white schools. Just as Gandhi, in fear, turned to the English for security, so Malcolm, for the same reason, began to emulate white standards and white models of behavior. In the chapter of his autobiography, appropriately titled Mascot, Malcolm relates how in his Lansing Elementary School, a school practically all white, he was treated like an exotic pet. He says a pink poodle. And he says more than that, that he liked it. He was proud of how he was treated because all he wanted was acceptance from the white kids and white teachers. And then... In eighth grade, where he was the only black child, there came a moment of truth that jarred him, aggravating his insecurities in the way that racism often does. Malcolm was smart enough to be among those at the top of his class, and he liked especially his English teacher, Mr. Ostrowski. But one afternoon, when Malcolm was alone with Ostrowski, the teacher asked Malcolm about his goals in life, and Malcolm replied that he would like to be a lawyer. The teacher, with a brutal directness, said that this wasn't a realistic goal for a, quote, nigger, unquote, and he should try carpentry instead. Malcolm says that that remark stayed with him for the rest of his life. He was hurt most by the sheer injustice of the comment. The injustice that white kids in that class, not as smart as he was, could nevertheless be encouraged to aim higher, as this teacher so often did. So he learned, like Gandhi, that whatever he did, he was still defined by the color of his skin. But the path of emulation was too tempting to be left so quickly, and Malcolm relates his varied but relentless efforts at denying his own color by trying to appear lighter. There's the graphic account of lightening and straightening his hair by burning his head with lye. Not until much later, he says, would he realize how his hair conking was an attempt to deny his own identity by denigrating his blackness. Now, if the first parallel between Gandhi and Malcolm X concerned their early struggles with childhood insecurities and consequent attempts to resolve them through emulation of white society, then the second parallel comes with their move to separatism. As soon as they both realize that the path of emulation won't take them any further in their quest, but will only further their own self-humiliation, they seek another route. Both go now for religious extremism. Gandhi for a form of Hindu nationalism, and Malcolm, of course, to the nation of Islam. The fact that Malcolm converted to Islam when in prison is significant because in prison he had reached the end of all hope of emulation. He had played out the role that was assigned to him and expected of him by white culture, that of ultimately pimp, hustler, and thief. 
At age 20, he was given a 10-year prison sentence for burglary. Later, he says, that prison was indispensable in his quest because without it, he may never have found Islam, the event that totally changed his whole course of direction. It was two years into his prison sentence, in late 1948, that Malcolm had a visit from his brother, Reginald. Reginald was a member of the Nation of Islam, and he described to Malcolm the doctrine of black separatism in such compelling terms that it left Malcolm fired with a kind of inspiration that he'd never felt before. He learned the history of the movement now, that the Nation of Islam had been founded in Detroit in 1931 by W.D. Fard, and then it was taken over by Elijah Muhammad in 1934, and now it was swelling in members with an exclusively black membership that rediscovered the ancient glory of its African heritage. The enemies Mike Malcolm learned from Reginald were whites. And uh, when he heard that, he says, he suddenly realized how true it was, because at every step of his life, he had been dehumanized by white culture. And indeed, enemy was the right word. Now, as we look at this moment of conversion, we realize that this kind of polarization of good guys versus bad guys occurs in every form of extremist doctrine, whether it's religious or political or cultural. After Malcolm escaped this way of thinking, he deplored it as oversimplified and dangerous. By the time I heard Malcolm talk in London, he was openly denouncing the nation of Islam for its straitjacketed thinking, saying that in those years as a follower of Elijah Muhammad, he had behaved like a zombie, a robot. And yet, bad as the doctrine seemed later on down the road to Malcolm, the inspiration that it initially gave him in prison in 1948 was profound. It gave him an intellectual curiosity that drove him to devour books on history and philosophy, literature and the social sciences with an uncanny zeal. His omnivorous appetite, when we look at the books that he records, having read at that time, makes his prison reading lists look like Columbia University's core curriculum. Considering the fact that he had left school early and spent so much of his adolescence on the streets, his achievement now was a phenomenon of learning. As he absorbed one volume after another, he realized what he had not appreciated before, that he loved what he was doing. He loved it because he had a remarkable memory exceeded only by his curiosity about all subjects. And most of all, he had a passion. He had now a purpose in life. He could not have accomplished such feats of learning as he did in prison if he hadn't been riding high on a new tide of identity. And as this ideological high surged through him, and as he stayed up night after night to conquer another philosophy, it recalls Gandhi who was so fired in 1909 by his passion of separatism that Gandhi recalls writing his first statement of it on a boat and his right hand becoming so paralyzed with fatigue that he had to switch to his left in order to continue writing. The original manuscript of Gandhi's book appears as though it was written by two different people, so different the handwriting. And this was Malcolm too. Malcolm working at a fever pitch, unable to stop. And in the months and years that now sped by in prison, he acquired his education. Before this, Malcolm had felt, we might say, every kind of high imaginable. But none sustained him as this one did. So when in 1952, he was released from prison after serving six years of his sentence. 
He was still on that high, and it took him straight to becoming Elijah Muhammad's leading minister in the nation of Islam. Now, Malcolm's separatist period lasted from 1952 until he left the nation of Islam on March 12, 1964. During these 12 years as a black Muslim, as members were called, especially by the press, Malcolm, during this time, consolidated an exclusivist ideology, and he preached it all over America with increasing effectiveness to ever-growing crowds. The main thrust of his separatism came with an emphatic rejection of integration, integration as advocated by white and black liberals alike, and its affirmation, of course, of black nationalism, which meant separate communities entirely controlled by black economic and political interests. Uh, this call for black autonomy compared to Gandhi's demand that Indians must control their own national destiny, though uh, while it was always plausible that the British could leave India to its hundreds of millions of native people, it was never feasible, of course, for American blacks to have their own nation. There were two aspects of Malcolm's separatism that held particular appeal because they were grounded in the real passions of that separatist doctrine. First, there was the denunciation of whites as demonic. And this came together with a glorification of African culture, the basic separatist dichotomy that appealed to Malcolm from the start and which he had preached so forcefully. And second, there was Malcolm's differentiation between two groups within the American black community, the black liberals whom he despised and the radicals or the radical beliefs that he felt represented most blacks in America. He ingeniously saw these two groups as analogous to the house Negro and the field Negro in the days of American slavery. In a speech that he called Message to the Grassroots, he develops this distinction between these two types of Negroes and his scorn for the house Negro or the moderate liberal black shows how emphatically he rejects emulation of whites now in this period. Once again, there is a direct parallel with Gandhi, who opposed the Indian liberal for identifying too closely with the British and believed that most Indians shared his radical aspirations of getting the British out of the country forever. When Malcolm says in this speech that the house Negro loved his master, enjoyed life in the big plantation house, and didn't have the sense to distinguish his own identity from the white slave owner's image of him, Malcolm is deriding Uncle Tom's just as Gandhi criticized Anglophiles in his nationalist movement. So this was the similarity of their separatism. And now the question is how they managed to transcend it, especially Malcolm. Because I did say that there are three fundamental points in common between Gandhi's and Malcolm's quests for Swaraj, or for personal and political liberation. The first, as we saw, concerned their early search for identity that led them to emulation of whites or to an acceptance of the inferior roles assigned to them by white culture. The second, when they both embraced separatism as they rejected both white culture and glorified their own people of color. And now third, they are similar in their final movement from separatism or exclusivity to inclusiveness. As I've said, Gandhi's realization of inclusiveness came with the Amritsar massacre and from 1919 until his death in 1948. 
During that time, Gandhi preached and practiced that inclusiveness until it became the hallmark of his philosophy, especially, of course, his idea of nonviolence. Whereas Gandhi had almost 30 years to demonstrate his inclusiveness and practiced it in the Great Salt March and in the Calcutta Fast that we've discussed, Malcolm was assassinated at age 39 and so was given less than a year to consolidate his last step to Swaraj. We need to emphasize that if Gandhi had been assassinated at age 39, we would not be studying Gandhi today or at all interested in him because he had achieved so little by that age. In fact, Malcolm and Martin Luther King Jr. were both assassinated at the same age, age 39. And it is extraordinary when we think of how much both of those two black American leaders managed to pack into such a short lifetime. Stages of development, progress towards Swaraj uh, that we can barely imagine if we apply that to Gandhi. It is the way in which then they live such accelerated lives in their path to Swaraj that is remarkable. Malcolm's journey in this final stage remained incomplete, and he never fulfilled its promise, the promise of full inclusivity in the way that Gandhi did. And yet the fact that he moved so fast in 1964 is remarkable. Now we want to look closely at the way in which that movement occurred. First of all, Malcolm, a moralist to the core, a person who was so strict in terms of his own character, insisting on fidelity, truth, honesty, and insisting, too, that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the leader of his movement, embodied these virtues. Malcolm, as he says in his autobiography, was not just amazed, he was traumatized when he found that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was not, in fact, so honorable, particularly in his marital vows. So from Malcolm's point of view, when the charge of hypocrisy became true, when he learned that his leader, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, had engaged in indecent conduct, uh, he felt uh, that, as he says in his autobiography, the whole universe stopped. The sun, the stars, and the moon stood still. So much of a trauma was that. It led Malcolm to a phase of terrific self-examination. And in that period of self-examination came not just his rejection of the leadership of the Nation of Islam, but even more than that, his rejection of the rigidity of separatism that was expressed by the Nation of Islam, especially in its blanket condemnation of whites. And so while Elijah Muhammad lost his credibility, the Nation of Islam's credibility went along too, and with it, the whole gospel of separatism, of exclusivity. And so Malcolm, in this moment of truth, casts off the essence of the nation and that is its demonology. He publicly resigns from the Nation of Islam, denouncing not only the infidelity of the leadership, but his, Malcolm's, own fanaticism during his long black Muslim period. And then, after having left the nation, he matched this tremendous inner journey that he had experienced with an outer journey. He left the country for a pilgrimage to Mecca. And it was on that pilgrimage, he says, that he discovered the truth, that the key category which we must think of is not race or even nation. It's rather humanity. He saw people in the Middle East, he says, who were kind and gentle and caring, who had white skins. 
And as he reflected on that, and that moment of truth sunk in, his humanism, his inclusivity was born. I think when we look at Malcolm's autobiography, we want to look then most carefully at the way in which the movement occurs from the time he loses faith in Elijah Muhammad to the trauma that then ensues and then Malcolm's rejection of one element after the other, especially, as I said, the demons preached by that movement. And then finally we look at Malcolm's search, a search which, interestingly enough, takes him uh, for religious reasons on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And as he goes to Mecca, he discovers, he says, for the first time, uh, that white faces didn't necessarily equal racism. And so two days before his assassination, Malcolm describes to a friend his years under Elijah Muhammad in these terms. He said, the sickness and madness of those days, I'm glad to be free of them. It is right that he should have used the word free, because this is indeed the point. He did free himself. If freedom means liberation from dogmatism, then Malcolm liberated himself from the nation of Islam, just as Gandhi did from the chauvinism of his own exclusivist period. But in this respect, we might say, if we compare Gandhi and Malcolm still again, Malcolm achieved even more than Gandhi, even though he had such a short time to do it in, because Malcolm did manage to come from so far in a remarkable eulogy for Malcolm written by his good friend Ossie Davis. The very essence of what I'm trying to say in this lecture is conveyed. Ossie Davis tried to convey the distance that Malcolm had traveled on his quest. And he said this, Malcolm had been a criminal, an addict, a pimp, and a prisoner. He was a racist, and he was a hater. He had really believed the white man was a devil. But all this changed, and Malcolm became free. No one who knew him, Ossie Davis says, before and after his trip to Mecca, could doubt that he had completely abandoned racism, separatism, and hatred. It can't possibly be said better than that. Now, this remark <coughs> captures all, all that Gandhi meant by Swaraj, by the quest for personal liberation. Although Gandhi could hardly have understood the many different paths that Malcolm took to get there as an addict, a pimp, a criminal. But I think that there was one thing that Gandhi would have understood about Malcolm at this final, in this final period especially. And that's the way in which Malcolm at the end spoke about truth. Whereas earlier in the nation of Islam, Malcolm seemed convinced that he possessed the truth because Elijah Muhammad and his doctrine were infallible, after he left the nation, Malcolm spoke of pursuing the truth rather than possessing it, trying to be open-minded in search of new ideas and interpretations of American society. And as we look through the texts, philosophies set forth by both Western and Eastern political and social theorists, we can perhaps group these theorists into two. One we might call truth pursued and the other truth possessed because those who are certain in an infallible sense that they possess the truth are those who see with Plato a set of ideal forms up there in the heavens which we must strive to know. And those who pursue the truth 
beginning perhaps with Aristotle, but certainly articulated in our era best by Gandhi. Those who pursue the truth see themselves as on a pilgrimage. Malcolm was on that pilgrimage. His view of truth was a Gandhian view of truth, and it's characteristic of the way one's thinking opens up as the journey assumes broader and deeper significance. Now, this lecture has stressed the similarities between Gandhi and Malcolm because I believe that together they represent for America, for India, for the world, remarkable examples of leaders who pursued freedom as more than just political or economic autonomy. That is, they saw freedom in personal terms as a Socratic quest to know thyself. Yet, there was a part of Malcolm's thought and leadership that remained until the end very different from Gandhi's. And this was Malcolm's refusal to adopt the idea of nonviolence. For most of his public life, Malcolm was opposed to Martin Luther King's theory and practice of nonviolence. Malcolm advocated violence as self defense, arguing that blacks must protect themselves and achieve their goals by any means necessary. This distanced him from both Gandhi and from King, of course, as we'll see in the next lecture, because Gandhi and King both adopted a belief in nonviolence as a personal creed as well as a political strategy. For this reason, we know how King would have deplored the violence that has engulfed America, especially urban America, taking such an unusually high toll among African-American youths today. We cannot know for sure how Malcolm would have responded to the problem of violence today. We do know that he, more than any national leader of this century, had been there, had not just seen but lived ghetto violence at its worst, and had he not died by violence, would be among us to offer his voice. And we know, too, how fervently we need his voice today in our quest for inclusivity. Because Malcolm knew hatred and anger so intimately. Because of that, he shows us how not to get hung up on them. Because in the end, he would say they inhibit self-discovery by making us blind to the openness of life. Malcolm then, at the end, challenges us with his capacity for change. And his example argues, his life argues, that in this capacity for change lies hope for a better future.
Lecture 8, Martin Luther King, Jr., Stride Toward Freedom. This is our eighth and last lecture in our series on the idea of freedom. And I've called this lecture Martin Luther King, Jr., Stride Toward Freedom. Martin Luther King Jr. is probably the person best known to Americans among those we've discussed in this series. Although he was assassinated at age 39, the same age that Malcolm X was assassinated, he made such a deep impression on our national consciousness that he's one of the very few public leaders for whom we've named a national holiday, an honor that could not be accorded to, say, Malcolm X, because he never, Malcolm never gained Martin Luther King's all-American stature. Because so much has been published about King, especially the huge scholarly biographies by Taylor Branch and David Garrow, it's probably hard to say anything new about him. But our specific purpose here is to place King into the context of our series on the idea of freedom. And so... As I said, I've taken for the title of this lecture, Stride Towards Freedom, the title of King's own autobiography, to the extent that he did write an autobiography, which he called Stride Towards Freedom. This book is mainly about King's leadership of the Montgomery bus boycott, and the ideas that inspired that experience are discussed there. So in a few minutes, I'll be turning to that, the Montgomery bus boycott, as a dramatic example of the African-American struggle for freedom. It's not only the title of King's book, Stride Toward Freedom, that emphasized his concern for freedom. His speeches also make that emphasis. For example, his best-known speech, I Have a Dream, is only about 10 to 12 minutes long. But it mentions, that single speech mentions the word freedom, or free, or liberty, 25 times. In that speech, no other idea, not even King's concepts of equality and justice, of which he's so fond, receives more mention than that of freedom. If we examine King's speeches, then, and his writings closely, we see that he uses the term freedom in several different ways, and often, and all of them we have discussed so far in the context of the philosophers of freedom dealt with. In this sense, King, I think, is a good person to use to recapitulate or to summarize what we've said so far about the different meanings of freedom, because as a person who's familiar to us, all, he helps us to understand these meanings in the context of our own American experience. So let's look at what he says about freedom and the ways in which he uses the word. King uses the term freedom and presents, presents the idea of freedom in three specific ways. First, King was, of course, a Christian. He was a Baptist minister. So he understands freedom in the way that Christ meant it, as spiritual freedom. When he concludes his I Have a Dream speech with the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last, he's referring here, obviously, to a religious meaning of freedom in the context of that spiritual that his people may be set free, not just by a law or by a statute, but by the truth. That, as he often said, the truth shall set you free. In the Christian sense, we're liberated then from the sin of separateness or from suffering and injustice by God's grace and by Christ's sacrifice. Other religious traditions, including Hinduism, espouse, as we've seen, the idea that the truth will set you free. And we've commented on that extensively. But King was a Christian, and he derived his idea from Christ's teachings, and he applied it to American race relations as no one else did. When he said that the truth shall set you free, as he often did, he meant free from the sin of separateness, 
from segregation that the truth of human unity of us all being children of God would ultimately prevail and save us black and white from the illusion of separateness, from the untruth of racial segregation. Now, I'll return to this point later when I discuss King's analysis of Paul Tillich's theory. Tillich, the American Protestant theologian, said that sin is separation. And, but Tillich didn't apply it to race relations in the way that King did. He had both come to the same conclusion that the truth may set us free. And this phrase that we've been using throughout since the first lecture, that the truth shall set you free, rings true and frequently true in King's writings. And I think of how often those of us who were involved in civil rights demonstrations sang the song, We Shall Overcome. And there is, as some of you know, the verse, the truth shall set us free. And how many times we sang that, I always off key, but my spouse who is here, I wish we could pause now and have us hear her rendition of We Shall Overcome uh, with her voice saying, the truth shall set us free. How many times we sang that in cities throughout the United States as we followed King's message of nonviolent protest. Well, think about this, about the truth setting us free. It was an abstraction, perhaps, when we quoted Christ's message, as we did earlier from St. John, the truth shall set you free, verily, verily, look unto me. That kind of message seemed, and then when we saw St. Augustine take up that same message, and then even Hegel. But now it becomes real, doesn't it? Or it should become real in terms of what it means to us as Americans. It's a kind of truth that liberates us from a sense of separateness, a truth that enables us to see the unity of the community here that we call the United States of America. We need desperately to view this country in terms of unity now, of a unity in our diversity. And from King's point of view, sin is separation, to be separated from one another as we are as I, as an inhabitant of that great city of New York City, so of New York, feel so often as I'm walking around that city, separated from so many strangers or enemies within that city. We need to get a truth here in terms of what we are, and that truth is that we are part of a common unity, and it's not necessary that we should live in constant fear in our major cities of one another. King said that truth should set us free, and that was his message. And we can sing it today as we sang it in the 60s. The second sense in which King used freedom was in the modern, secular, liberal, and democratic way that Locke and Mill used it. King led a civil rights movement, as we know, for the preservation of liberties, and he fought for the application of some of Locke's and Mill's liberal principles, especially for freedom of minorities in the face of political and social discrimination. From King's point of view, the phrase tyranny of the majority, Mill's immortal dictum, had real meaning. Neither Locke nor Mill was concerned about the liberties of blacks in America certainly not in England, but, but King still took their ideas of freedom and reinterpreted them to apply to his own struggle for freedom in America. Both Locke and Mill believed in freedom in the sense of being free from arbitrary authority, and that is exactly the principle that King wanted and that he fought hard for, perhaps harder than Locke or Mill might have imagined since it, since it involved King being thrown into prison. Neither Locke nor Mill would sanction civil disobedience. Remember, liberty, but liberty always under law. The liberal principle that King drew on, but went beyond, we might say, or departed from, that was a radical principle that King used. Not liberty under law, but civil disobedience and nonviolent protest against unjust law, a theory and a practice that liberals like Mill and Locke under no circumstance would countenance. 
King then seized on the connection between freedom and justice that others had seen, but he made that connection his own. It is unfair, he told us, to practice unjust laws when our American Constitution sets forth principles of justice and freedom. It is unfair to enforce segregation in social behavior when we preach justice and equality in the name of freedom. It is unfair to isolate a small minority of our people and persecute them when we welcome to our shores the huddled masses yearning to breathe free. King fixed on this principle of justice and insisted that that principle complement the principles of equality and freedom in our own tradition as part of our heritage. In other words, King's genius was to use incomparable rhetoric to call on us and our democratic system to practice the lock mill principles of freedom that we promise. How he did it will be evident in the examples of the protests uh, that he led, and we'll cite, discuss only one of them, the Montgomery bus boycott, in a moment. Now, I said that there were three senses in which King conceived of freedom. The first, remember, was the sense that we discussed in the very first lecture, the truth shall set us free, uh, the religious sense, the context of spiritual freedom that he held so dear. And that is a way of using that phrase and that concept of freedom that King brought to us as an American in this century. And uh, we, I think, should be grateful to him for having made that, made that message ring true. The second sense that I mentioned was the liberal sense of freedom, which is not related to the spiritual and the religious directly, and that is the liberal sense of freedom is a secular message, and that is the lock mill principle of uh, practicing a kind of freedom that would not uh, emancipate individuals in a spiritual sense, but in a social and a political sense. Now, the third sense in which King conceived of freedom and used the term was the Gandhian meaning of Swaraj to be pursued with nonviolence. That is, remember our ancient Indian concept of Swaraj, S-W-A-R-A-J. That is the first, seems to me, conceptualization of freedom that we have in the history of the world set forth in the early Upanishads. That concept of Swaraj is renewed by Gandhi in the 20th century and linked to the idea of nonviolence. That is, we pursue Swaraj, we pursue freedom through nonviolent action. That was Gandhi's argument. King seizes on this and develops it. We've developed this connection of Swaraj to nonviolence in the Gandhi lecture when we talked about how he applied nonviolence in specific contexts, the Calcutta fast being one of them. So we should now note how King understood and applied these ideas to America. First of all, King understood better than Malcolm X that the freedom that Gandhi spoke of, called Swaraj, could be attained only through nonviolence. And that was his basic argument, an argument, of course, that Malcolm never made. King adopted then this important conceptual correspondence between freedom and nonviolence and applied it. King discussed at length this understanding in the context of the influence that Gandhi had on him, and he wrote about it especially in the book Stride Toward Freedom that we're working with now. In the chapter in Stride Toward Freedom called Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, King relates his own intellectual development, how he discovered Gandhi's teachings and then how he applied them to the Montgomery bus boycott of 1955-56. I'd like to read several paragraphs from Stride Toward Freedom that highlight Gandhi's influence because they suggest the all-important connection that both Gandhi and King made between freedom and nonviolent power. King first relates in Stride Toward Freedom, in this chapter, Pilgrimage to Nonviolence, how when he was 21 years old, in the fall of 1950, as a theology student at Crozier Seminary, he heard a lecture on Gandhi. 
and he was so inspired that he plunged into a serious study of Gandhi's teachings. He describes the effect that this had on him and how it, how it led him to become involved in the bus boycott. And here's King's account of that moment when he is 21 years old in 1950. He says, I traveled to Philadelphia to hear a sermon by Dr. Mordecai Johnson, president of Howard University. He was there to preach for the Fellowship House of Philadelphia. Dr. Johnson had just returned from a trip to India, and to my great interest, he spoke of the life and teachings of Mahatma Gandhi. His message was so profound and electrifying that I left the meeting and I immediately bought a half dozen books on Gandhi's life and works. Like most people, I, have he I had heard of Gandhi, but I had never studied him seriously. As I read, I became deeply fascinated by his campaigns of nonviolent resistance. I was particularly moved by the salt march to the sea and his numerous fasts. The whole concept of satyagraha, satyagraha is the word that Gandhi uses to describe nonviolent power. It's two components. Satya means truth, and agra means holding on to. So one is holding on to the truth firmly in order to release the nonviolent power that ensues as a result. And King describes this here, the meaning of satyagraha. The whole concept of satyagraha, he says, was profoundly significant to me. As I delved deeper into the philosophy of Gandhi, my skepticism concerning the power of love gradually diminished, and I came to see for the first time its potency in the area of social reform. Prior to reading Gandhi, I had about concluded that the ethics of Jesus were only effective in individual relationships. The turn-the-other-cheek philosophy and the love-your-enemies philosophy were only valid, I felt, before, when individuals were in conflict with other individuals, when racial groups and nations were in conflict, a more realistic approach seemed necessary. But after reading Gandhi, I saw how utterly mistaken I was. Gandhi, I felt, was probably the first person in history to lift the love ethic of Jesus above mere interaction between individuals to a powerful and effective social force on a large scale. Love for Gandhi was a potent instrument for social and collective transformation. It was in this Gandhian emphasis on love and nonviolence that I discovered the method for social reform that I had been seeking for so many months. The intellectual and moral satisfaction that I failed to gain from the utilitarianism of Bentham or the revolutionary methods of Marx and Lenin or the social contract theory of Hobbes and Locke or the back-to-nature optimism of Rousseau, I found satisfaction finally in the nonviolent resistance philosophy of Gandhi. I came to feel that this was the only morally and practically sound method open to oppressed people in their struggle for freedom. In 1954, I ended my formal training with all of these relatively divergent intellectual forces converging into a positive social philosophy. One of the main tenets of this philosophy was the conviction that nonviolent resistance was one of our most potent weapons available to oppressed people in their search for social justice. At this time, however, I had merely an intellectual understanding and appreciation of the position with no firm determination to organize it in a socially effective situation. When I went to Montgomery as a pastor, I hadn't the slightest idea that I would later become involved in a crisis in which nonviolent resistance would be applicable. I neither started the protest in Montgomery nor suggested it. I simply responded to the call of the people for a spokesperson. When the protest began, my mind, consciously or unconsciously, was driven back to the Sermon on the Mount with its sublime teachings on love and to the Gandhian method of nonviolent resistance. As the days unfolded, I came to see the power of nonviolence more and more. Living through the actual experience of the protest, nonviolence became more than a method to which I gave intellectual assent. It became a commitment to a way of life. Many of the things that I had not cleared up intellectually concerning nonviolence were now solved in the sphere of practical action. The biggest job in getting any movement off the ground is to keep together the people who form it. This task requires more than a common aim. It demands a philosophy 
that wins and holds the people's allegiance, and it depends upon open channels of communication between the people and their leaders. All these elements were found in Montgomery. So from the beginning, a basic philosophy guided the movement. This guiding principle has since been referred to variously as nonviolent resistance, non-cooperation, or passive resistance. But in the first days of the protest, none of these expressions was mentioned. The phrase most often heard was simply Christian love. It was the Sermon on the Mount, rather than a doctrine of passive resistance, that initially inspired the Negroes of Montgomery to dignified social action. It was Jesus of Nazareth that stared the Negroes to protest with the creative weapon of love. As the days unfolded, however, the inspiration of Mahatma Gandhi began, began to exact its influence. I had come to see early that the Christian doctrine of love operating through the Gandhian method of nonviolence was one of the most potent weapons available to the Negro in his struggle for freedom. About a week after the protest started, a white woman who understood and sympathized with the Negro's efforts wrote a letter to the editor of the Montgomery Advertiser comparing the bus boat protest with the Gandhian movement in India. Miss Juliette Morgan, sensitive and frail, did not survive the rejection and condemnation of the white community. But long before she died in the summer of 57, the name of Mahatma Gandhi was well known in Montgomery. People who had never heard of the brown saint of India were now saying his name with an air of familiarity. Nonviolent resistance emerged as the technique of the movement, while love stood as the regulating ideal. In other words, Christ furnished the method and motivation, Gandhi furnished the method. Uh, Christ furnished the spirit and motivation, I should have said, and Gandhi furnished the method. Now that passage that I read, that long passage from Stride Towards Freedom, contains a number of points that are significant. When King says that he became committed to nonviolence, not simply as a tactic, but a way of life, it became a commitment to a way of life. He's making an important point that Gandhi made, and that is that tactical nonviolence, or what Gandhi derided as passive resistance, was inferior by far to creedal nonviolence. That is a nonviolence <coughs> that commanded one's creedal assent, where nonviolence becomes a way of life. From King's point of view, this important shift from tactical nonviolence to creedal nonviolence was what made the Montgomery bus boycott successful, because individuals there believed in nonviolence not just as a tactic, but rather as a way of life. Now, that meant addressing the key problem of anger, because the hallmark of creedal nonviolence is to be able to cope with one's anger, use it effectively up to a point, but never direct it towards an individual in a way that dehumanizes that person. Always to hold the sin and not the sinner responsible, to be angry at the system and not at the self in the way that we saw. Creedal nonviolence necessarily demands that. A king goes further than this, and he mentions so many elements in this passage from Stride Towards Freedom uh, that would merit comment. One is the reference to Juliet Morgan. Juliet Morgan uh, was a librarian in Montgomery, Alabama in 1955. A person from a well-to-do white family in Montgomery. She was, as King describes here, sensitive and frail, but she had an extraordinary mind. That is, she wrote to the local newspaper, the Montgomery Advertiser, once the bus boycott began, a remarkable set of letters comparing the bus boycott to Gandhi's movement in India. She had somehow acquired a real intimate understanding of Gandhi's movement in India. When I read, as I did, these letters published in the, Montgomery, in the Montgomery Advertiser, I was overwhelmed by her grasp of Gandhian principles. So Juliet Morgan writes these letters, and King, up until that time, he said, hadn't really got it together in terms of applying Gandhi to the Montgomery bus boycott. He reads these letters, and it is a white woman who signals to him the real significance of what he's doing. And King says this over and again. A biography should be written of Juliet Morgan. She was an inspiration to King at this time. 
And we need to know more about Juliet Morgan. Juliet Morgan, we're told, did not survive the probrium, the hatred of the white community of some whites in Montgomery that surrounded her. She could not take the ostracism, the humiliation that was directed at her by some whites. And uh, so she either committed suicide, we're not sure, or died of natural causes, but a young woman in her early 30s. Think of the sacrifice, but think of the inclusivity in that message. A white woman picking up on an Indian's exercise of nonviolent power, communicating it eloquently through the press in a series of letters to blacks in Montgomery. An extraordinary story. Now, he comes to the conclusion, then, that Christ furnished the spirit while Gandhi furnished the method. Without the method, from King's point of view, the power wouldn't have been there. And the Montgomery bus boycott is a way to link freedom and power. The story of the Montgomery bus boycott that King is telling here in the Stride Towards Freedom excerpts that I quoted began on December 1st. 1955, when, as you know, a person who has become immortal in American history, Rosa Parks, who uh, last week uh, commemorated King's I Have a Dream speech here in Washington, D.C., Rosa Parks boarded a bus in downtown Montgomery and said no to white authority by refusing to obey the segregation laws of Alabama on the city buses. A white passenger demanded her seat, and she said, my feet hurt. I'm not going to do it. And while others around her were giving up their seats, as the law insisted, to whites when they so demanded, she refused. And as King said, that no reverberated through the 50s and 60s now to fire a protest of non-violent, non-cooperation. I will not stand for this. This is unfair. And Rosa Parks didn't need to read Plato's Republic on justice or any other treatise in order to have that inspiration. She knew it was unfair, and she acted. 48 hours after they booked Rosa Parks, after having arrested her in Montgomery, King and the leaders of the black community sent a bulletin addressed to the 50,000 blacks of Montgomery calling for a boycott, a boycott on city buses, beginning Monday, December 5th, 1955. They also announced a mass meeting to decide how long the boycott should last. King phoned dozens of people that Sunday, but he awoke Monday morning not knowing how many blacks would join in the bus boycott because a boycott of this kind was unprecedented. He describes, again in Stride Towards Freedom, what happened that Monday morning. My wife and I awoke earlier than usual on Monday morning. We were up and fully dressed by 5.30. The day for the protest had arrived, and we were determined to see the first act of this unfolding drama. I was still saying that if we could get 60% cooperation, the venture would be a success. Fortunately, a bus stop was just five feet from our house. This meant that we could observe the opening stages from our front window. The first bus was to pass around six o'clock, and so we waited through an interminable half hour. I was in the kitchen drinking my coffee when I heard Coretta cry, Martin, Martin, come quickly. I put down my cup, ran towards the living room. As I approached the front window, Coretta pointed joyfully to a slowly moving bus. Darling, it's empty. I could hardly believe what I saw. I knew that the South Jackson line, which ran past our house, carried more Negro passengers than any other line in Montgomery, and that this first bus was usually filled with domestic workers going to their jobs. Would all of the other buses follow the same pattern that had been set by the first? Eagerly, we waited for the next bus. In 15 minutes, it rolled down the street, and like the first, it was empty. A third bus appeared. It, too, was empty of all but two white passengers. I jumped in my car for almost an hour. I cruised down every major street, examined every passing bus. During this hour at the peak of the morning traffic, I saw no more than eight Negro passengers riding the buses. By this time, I was jubilant. Instead of the 60% cooperation we had hoped for, it was becoming apparent that we had reached almost 100%. A miracle, it seemed, had taken place. The once dormant 
Negro community was now fully awake. Now, King knew from this moment, in December of 55, that a movement had been born. He plunged into organizing it. On that first day of the boycott, he and the other leaders formed the movement's organization, the movement, the Montgomery Improvement Association, as it was called. And King was named president of the Montgomery Improvement Association. By this time, Monday evening, the hour of the mass meeting had arrived, and King was called on to address the thousands that had crowded in and around the church. King normally took, he said, about 15 hours to prepare one of his Sunday sermons. Now, he says, he had only 15 minutes to think of what he would say. And yet the words poured out, and he later called it the most important speech of his life. This is what he said on December 7th, 1955, sorry, December 5th, 1955, to that throng of people who would make history, a crowd of scared, courageous blacks who for the first time in their lives found themselves caught up in a movement to defy white racist authority in Montgomery. King first reviewed what had happened to Rosa Parks and then placed her story in the context of the long history of persecution that blacks had endured in Montgomery. And then he called the community to action. There comes a time, he said, that people get tired. We are here this evening to say to those who have mistreated us so long that we are tired, tired of being segregated and humiliated, tired of being kicked about by the brutal feet of oppression. We have no alternative now but to protest. For many years we have shown amazing patience. We have sometimes given our white brothers the feeling that we liked the way we were being treated. But we come here tonight to be saved from that patience that makes us patient with anything less than freedom and justice. One of the great glories of democracy is the right to protest for right. The White Citizens Councils, the Ku Klux Klan, these organizations are protesting for the perpetuation of injustice in the community. We're protesting for the birth of justice in our community. Their methods lead to violence and lawlessness. In our protest, there will be no cross burnings. No white person will be taken from his home by a hooded Negro mob and brutally murdered. There will be no threats and intimidation. We'll be guided by the highest principles of law and order. Our method will be that of persuasion, not coercion. We will only say to the people, let your conscience be your guide. Our actions must be guided by the deepest principles of our Christian faith. Love must be our regulating ideal. Once again, we must hear the words of Jesus echoing across the centuries. Love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Pray for them that despitefully use you. If we fail to do this, our protest will end up as a meaningless drama on the stage of history, and its memory will be shrouded with the ugly garments of shame. In spite of the mistreatment that we've confronted, we must not become bitter. We must not end up by hating our white brothers. As Booker T. Washington told us, let no man pull you so low as to make you hate him. If you will protest courageously, and yet with dignity and Christian love, when the history books are written in future generations, the historians will have to pause and say, there lived a great people, a black people, who injected new meaning and dignity into the veins of civilization. This is our challenge and our overwhelming responsibility. The response to the speech has been well recorded because this speech is, is on tape available in the King Archives in Atlanta, and we know how people responded to it. There was a moment of absolute silence, and then the audience just went absolutely wild. They suddenly realized that they had a real prophet in their midst who could speak as they had never heard before. This was a speech that made King, and it was a speech that transformed that moment. I would have loved to have been there myself. Think of it. I think if I had been there, I might have thought of Juliet Morgan's letters in which she said in one of them, in the future, it might seem impossible now, but history will mark that this was Montgomery's finest hour. Think of a white woman saying that early on in the boycott. This will be regarded by history as Montgomery's finest hour. Well, King said that. This will be Montgomery's finest hour. And I'm not sure how people of Montgomery 
white and, white and black review this today, but in our American history books, this is the most perfect act of nonviolent protest that's ever been registered. So with this speech, with King's speech, the man in history met. All the hopes and expectations suggested in this speech were fulfilled, so much so that if the Montgomery bus boycott is compared with any other nonviolent action in the country, I think it emerges as the best, a pure example at that point of the dream realized. After that speech, 50,000 blacks in Montgomery steadfastly, courageously, effectively, successfully refused to ride the buses for almost a year well recorded in the series that I'm sure many of you have seen called Eyes and the Prize, the documentary that focuses on the Montgomery bus boycott in the first part of that series. Then on November 13th, 1956, after the protest was fully registered, the United States Supreme Court, moved by the protest, declared Alabama laws requiring bus segregation, segregation unconstitutional. And by December 1956, a year after Rosa Parks said no to white authorities, buses in Alabama were integrated. A King is one of the very few practitioners of nonviolent action in America to develop a theory that underpinned the practice. His theory of nonviolence is elaborated throughout his writings, but there is a particular passage in his famous letter from Birmingham jail, after I might make an assignment, after reading Stride Towards Freedom, which is, as we said, his closest thing to an autobiography, even though he published it early in life. Then read a letter from Birmingham Jail, if you haven't. That is a kind of quintessential expression of nonviolent theory. He wrote it from jail, uh, being imprisoned in Birmingham after a, an act of civil disobedience there. And uh, the letter from Birmingham Jail maybe again, once again, because he had the time to think it through, uh, it was a crystallization of his theory, a way that even better in a certain form than stride towards freedom. So if we look to the Berm letter from Birmingham jail, we can find several things there. It addresses the theme throughout of sin as separation. Remember that King had taken his Ph.D., at Boston, in the University of Boston, uh, at, uh, in uh, theology, and he had written his PhD dissertation uh, partly on Paul Tillich's theology, and so he's especially attuned to Tillich's work, and uh, he writes then a lot on the theme of sin as separation that I mentioned earlier. It shows how King, this theme shows how King adapted religious teachings to a justification of breaking the law and going to prison. The passage, I think, is also a fine example of how King extended Gandhi's theory of nonviolence by bringing, it in, by bringing in philosophers that Gandhi never knew, uh, such as St. Thomas Aquinas or Martin Buber or Paul Tillich. King writes this in a letter from Birmingham jail. Remember, he had argued in the earlier speech that I quoted uh, that the Negroes were not breaking the law. They were respecting the highest laws of the land. And that was his basic argument. The Negroes were respectful of the highest laws. It's just that they were, as the protest continued, they were evidently breaking the local laws, the state laws of Alabama. So he was, King was hard put to make the distinction between what laws he was obeying and what laws he was not. And the letter from Birmingham jail was a direct reply to liberals, we might say Lockean and Millian liberals who were saying, hey, this is a democracy. There's no need to break the law. You're going too fast. And these liberals, who were black clergymen, many of them, pressed their case to King. And King, writing this letter then, responds to them. And the charge against King is that he's a flaming radical. He's breaking the law. He's going to prison. He is not having, he does not have respect for the principles of this country. And King addresses this then. He says, one may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate 
obeying just laws, one has not only a legal, but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference, King asks, between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law, King argues, is a man-made code that squares with a moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with a moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Hence, segregation is not only politically, economically, and sociologically unsound, it is morally wrong. It is sinful. Paul Tillich has said that sin is separation. Is not segregation an existential expression of man's tragic separation, his awful estrangement, his terrible sinfulness? Thus it is that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, Brown versus Board of Education, for it is morally right, and I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances, for they are morally wrong. This is sophisticated theory. He has resurrected the natural law doctrine and applied it ingeniously, it seems to me, to race relations in the United States. Uh, not the natural law doctrine in terms of political theory is an elusive doctrine. And uh, the problem is that because we can't see it or define it or put it into statutes easily, uh, it can be used either way to justify from what would be from King's point of view unjust action as well as to condemn it. But natural law theory was used early on by our founding fathers, especially by Thomas Jefferson, to inspire this country in the Declaration of Independence. And whether we like natural law or not, when we look to the founding of this country, we can't do without it and we can't deny it. It's there. And natural law doctrine is, of course, that we're all created equal, that we have a right to pursue life, liberty, and happiness. Now, those ideas King takes, and after quoting Thomas Aquinas, that is to put it in the terms of Qu Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Yes, Aquinas did say that, but then notice how King makes the leap. Any law that uplifts human personality is just. Any law that degrades human personality is unjust. Aquinas didn't say that. He probably should have said it, and to be more clear, but King says it. And he's got then this theme of humanization, dehumanization, built into his theory and into his practice in a highly creative manner. Now, when King argues then, after that, that all segregation statutes, because they divide us, are by natural law illegal, and that we are being lawful when we obey natural law, he's turning the tables right around. He's arguing, as Antigone did, in uh, the great play by Sophocles, by that name, Antigone approaches, uh, approaches the Greek tyrant Creon and says, I am obeying a natural law, and that law is the eternal law, the law of the gods. King goes back to that message, that old natural law doctrine, that there is a moral law, a higher law, that if we will obey it, uplifts us and gives us sustenance in this time of terror and turmoil, that is the law that must be applied against the practice of segregation.
This is a really nice application, it seems to me, of Buber and Tillich to the problem. Neither Buber nor Tillich took on the cause of the African-American. They might have if it had been put to them, but they didn't. King interprets them in such a way that it becomes a part of his idea, sin is separation, segregation is sin. We need to look closely at King. He's a theorist, a theorist of the first order who manages to apply the theory to practice in the context of, of his own struggle. Later in the letter from Birmingham jail, King returns to his favorite theme of freedom. Oppressed people, he says, cannot remain oppressed forever. The yearning of freedom eventually manifests itself, and that is what has happened to the American Negro. Something within has reminded him of his birthright of freedom, and something without has reminded him that it can be gained. Now, Martin Luther King, it seems to me, is an excellent person to conclude this lecture series with for many reasons. He's significant, it seems to me, though, above all, because he not only tried to practice what he preached, but he called on us with incomparable eloquence to practice what we preach, the democratic ideal of freedom and justice for all. He saw that among the freedoms that we seek was one that we especially need, and that is freedom from fear, and he applied that to his situation. The path to liberation, he argued, lies in the practice of nonviolence. Violence ended King's life, but his increased stature in America since his death shows that his voice was not silenced. 75,000 people gathered last week in Washington, D.C., and that was thousands more than on any previous occasion to commemorate his I Have a Dream speech. It was said on this day that we need another king to bring this country together, but perhaps it's more accurate to say that we need together to take another stride towards freedom. I'm Tom Rollins, president of The Teaching Company. We hope you've enjoyed the lectures on these tapes. To order more courses or to receive a copy of our most recent catalog, call 1-800-TEACH-12. That's 1-800-TEACH-12. Or visit us on the Internet at www teachco.com. That's teachco.com. Thank you very much for listening.